Opened back in 1953 and based just 19 miles southwest of Norwich, the Snetterton circuit has been around for quite a long time. Originally RAF Snetterton Heath between 1943 and 1948 and also had the US Air Force occupying it at some point. This is the second longest circuit in the United Kingdom after Silverstone. It's an FIA Grade 2 listed circuit and it's hosted the likes of British GT, the British Touring Car Championship, British Formula 3 and British Superbikes. And it is the last of the Super Saturdays for a little bit of a while here on the Sim Grid. A warm welcome to you all. We have quite a lot of action as it's Alex Goldschmidt and... Uh, Last minute, uh, replacement for Luke Rogers, uh, Daniel Handover joins me for the first uh, three support races. Uh, Daniel, good to have you back with us here on the SimGrid. Um, Snetterton, a very, very interesting circuit. Plenty of twists and turns and plenty of over overtaking opportunities, uh, especially with the reprofiling of the circuit uh, up until around 2011 by current mo uh, owners Motorsport Vision. Absolutely. Uh, just firstly, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me back. It's a, a pleasure to be back and uh, really looking forward to it. But yeah, Snetterton, it's a very, very iconic circuit in the UK. And I said, it, it, that, as you say, Alex, that 300 layout that's just been done with the new, I say just been done with the new infield layout really has helped provide a little bit more action uh, and provide a bit more variability um, to what was already uh, a very, very good circuit. Yes. So here on uh, Super Saturday, uh, the 17th of April, we have three 30-minute support races, start the, starting first of all with the Bentley Challenge, so the Continental GT3 from 2018, around about 1,300 kilos in weight, will be the vehicle, the only vehicle that drivers will be able to use in the first race. Then we have the GT4 Cup before the Lamborghini Super Trofeo 30-minute uh, sprint race happens around here as well. Uh, and then to culminate things off on this Super Saturday for a little while, we'll have the fifth and final round of best of british so myself and dan will be here providing a commentary for the first three support races and then we hand it over to lewis mcglade and david christie it's the 2.4 hours of snetterton where the top six coming into this final round who all have a chance of winning it are covered by just 43 points but uh, Snetterton itself, it's a very, very fantastic circuit. I actually visited it quite a few years ago um, uh, for the British Touring Car Championship that particular year. But it is a staple on the British uh, GT calendar uh, from years past and also years in the future. 26 Bentleys uh, uh, are showing up on our live timing. And it is a fast 10 minute qualifying session. But also one of the good things is, is that we see quite a few Bentleys uh, going around here at this fantastic track, Dan. And the Bentley Continental GT3, and it's the 2018 model that we'll be using here today, is very much a stalwart within uh, GT3 folklore in its own right, isn't it? A hundred percent. I mean, to be fair, when it first uh, when it first came out, when it was first released, I remember looking at it, going, "That it almost looks it looks out of place, but it doesn't look out of place in a bad way." And since then, it's just grown and grown and developed so much. And uh, it's a fantastic car, absolutely great. I've, I've driven it quite a bit um, on the sim, and it's a great fun car to drive. It doesn't necessarily feel big. It looks absolutely huge, but it doesn't necessarily uh, give you that. Um, it doesn't give you that feeling when you're actually driving. It's a very, very stable car. It's a great car to drive, and I'm just excited to be able to see you know over 20 of them all racing uh, around someone like Snetterton. It's fantastic. And also with the 120 litre fuel tank, there will be plenty of opportunity 
uh, for these cars to go uh, full throttle. Looks like qualifying is getting underway. Let's head circuit side as there are there they all are all making their way out onto this fantastic circuit uh, very much sunshine with a little bit of cloud in the sky uh, the track is now at optimum so these uh, drivers will be going out at the right time in these cars air temperature 20 degrees celsius track 24 degrees celsius but no wind pickup which means pretty much dan that these are uh, these you know, for a, a lovely Saturday afternoon roar around Snetterton, it's the perfect conditions for setting a lap in qualifying. Exactly, absolutely. Very, very, uh, very optimal conditions, as you say. Also, as well, one thing, uh, you look at the Bentley straight, it's a very, very long straight. Everyone's going out all at once. I wonder if there's going to be a little bit of tactics there for slipstreaming as well, a bit of drafting. Because uh, it won't gain you necessarily a lot, uh, but it will gain you uh, potentially with how close this grid, I can imagine, is going to be. But that could actually make the difference between a, uh, a couple of positions. Yep, so we've got some familiars here, as as well as uh, the man that was uh, in monikered Mr. Super Saturday, Marcel Fuzzi, is running in all three support races, in split uh, in in the top tiers, no less, and he's also in contention for the best of British Championship uh, season finale this afternoon. But there's uh, Jason Nurse in the number 88 Bentley as we ride on board. And we're now going to uh, head through the far part of the circuit, through Nelson's, and then through into the bomb hole. Uh, so a lot of commitment going through this particular corner. So along with the uh, with uh, Corum, which we've now just exited, and through into Murray's, uh, these two last corners on the circuit, very much on the reprofiling to help assist on overtaking possibilities. Uh, Luke Whitehead, uh, currently with H3 Racing with Hamada Equizi. Uh, in Sprint Cup, which heads to its uh, fourth round next Thursday at the Hungara Ring. Uh, Jason Lurz is on a first flying lap. And, and this is where we're going to see these uh, these cars, as you say, Dan, clumping together. And you can see about three or four of them uh, going through into Corum before heading into the left-hander at Murray's. I mean, the slipstream is going to be rather crucial. It's going to give them, what, probably about two to maybe four tenths of a second down the Bentley Strait heading into, uh, into Brundle underneath the bridge. I mean, to be fair, it's probably going to give them uh, something, whether four tenths, I mean, if you get a very, very good run on the exit going out of Williams, then it probably will give you um, maybe a couple of tenths. Um, it, it depends though, there's, there's loads of different variables as well. Uh, but the main one, yeah, is making sure that you can carry as much speed as possible going through Williams, because, I mean, as well, you actually just touched on there, Alex, is the commitment I think that people need and that the drivers need for here. You've got, you know, Brundle, Corum, um, going through into turn one as well. There's so many places here where commitment gains you quite, you know, quite a considerable amount of time. So that's one thing that these drivers are going to have to take in qualifying. You know, just under seven minutes left, they're really going to have to go. It's 100%, 110%, and they cannot leave anything on the table. Looks like Jason Lewis in the number 88 is not leaving anything on the table as he's just gone through Nelson's. Now through into the bomb hole, the sweeping right-hander. Well, you put down the accelerator coming through into Corum. Fully committed from the number 88 is going to go through Murray's but it looks like the number 33 is going to come across the line first that's Pasquale De Luca um, so the number 33 will cross the line very shortly but Jason Lurz uh, looks to be on a pretty good lap here 1 minute 45.351 uh, there's Benjamin uh, Benjamin Letalek, uh in the number 10 you can see he's making his way through Corum so the laps will start to come in thick and fast and then it's the number 19 uh, that has just gone through into second position uh, so uh, uh, Julian Van Bruch, uh then Simon Ramsay also another rec Marcel Fusi already up into fourth as someone just uh, kisses the barrier on the left hand side after the finish line as uh, Benjamin Letelic from France uh, now goes up into P7 uh, then you've also got the likes of Kieran Prendergast. He's rounding out the top eight. Um, De Vecos rounds out the top 11. There's Morgan McColl in the 540. Not yet setting a lap time, but will go through uh, the timing being to complete sector two at this 2.969 mile, 4.779 mile circuit, uh, kilometre circuit. And uh, we're getting into the uh, business end, but Jason knows with that 1 minute 45.351 second lap time there, Dan, uh, really started to uh, give everyone something to think about. And also, 
somewhat some uh, a bit of a goal maybe for the likes of Marcel Fuzzi uh, Luke Whitehead who's yet to set a competitive lap time he was fourth in the economy challenge this past Thursday having started 16th and um, if you haven't watched it go and watch it it was a belter Morgan McColl goes seventh but uh, yeah, a lot of drivers really putting, uh, but Jason Lerner's lap time, that was an absolute doozy. I mean, he's a, he's a second ahead of Julian Van Bruch at the moment uh, for pole position for the Bentley Challenge. I know, that's a very, very quick lap indeed. Like I said, it, a second with a grid that this that is this close and this competitive um, is quite a statement, I think, to say the least. Uh, but yeah, so Jason Lerner, he, he's really, you could just see going through as we've got Whitehead's just gone in, into, what's that, second place, only three tenths behind. So that gap, Alex, that we just saw was about a second has just come crashing down. And now at the moment, uh, we've got the top two that have now uh, that, has, <coughs> that has decided that they want to now run away uh, at the moment in this qualifying session. We're just about to hit four minutes left to go, but I'm sure these times are going to be starting to come down even more and it is going to get closer. Uh, we're going to have to see how this pans out. Yeah, Andy Boardman in the number 69. Bentley goes up into seventh position, but that's quickly deposed by Marcus Hagel in the 117. Junior McColl about to cross the line. Marcel Fusi rounds out the top 10. And Junior McColl from South Africa goes up into P5. And that was on a 1 minute 46.566. But then I've just noticed, hang on a second. Yeah, Jason, uh, Jason is still on a 145.351. Luke Whitehead, those are the two sole drivers in this session, in this qualifying session thereof, that have gone sub 1 minute 45, uh, 1 minute 46. Marcel Fusi's got a bit of work to do, but of course he is Mr. Super Saturday, I think, in the Super Trofeos, which he's also competing in, as well as the GT4s. Um, the Super Trofeos, he's not finished any lower than second on a Super Saturday and that is consistency and again you know the, and the amount of times that we see it's not just him but Samuel Foch also uh, decides to uh, give it a go for Super Saturday but Samuel doesn't always go into the top split but there's Pasquale Di Luca and he goes uh, across the line and goes P3 so good lap from him a 1 minute 46.182 Jonathan Benson in the 310 the Ghostworks car running at the top 23 uh, but we've only had one of the drivers not yet set a competitive lap time. That is the number 23 of Francisco Mazzoni. As uh, Julian Van Bruch, um, goes to within just under six tenths and becomes the third driver to uh, get under the one minute 46 second barrier. Jonathan Bentz uh, rounding out the top 23 still. Looks like McColl and that is uh, the 540. That's Morgan McColl. He's uh, pulled in in the pits, uh, pits there as well. Uh, also, Glenn Guest, uh, he's running at the top 21. Jonathan Bentz improves, but only goes up a further position and drops Manouche down to 23rd. Andy Borman now running at the top nine. We've got just under two minutes of this qualifying session still remaining. But with that first initial barnstorming uh, banker lap, as here comes Marcel Fusi. He goes across the line. Does he improve? Goes P9, and that was with a 1 minute 46.890. But... Jason Lur's lap on that first uh, first flying lap there, you know, he had clean air, Dan. He didn't need to worry about any sort of uh, back marker traffic or any momentum carry or having to worry about slipstream. He was in the right place at the right time. A hundred percent. I think as well, to be fair, when you look at it, it was uh, to be able to switch it on that quickly straight out first lap off you go that's a very very good skill to have especially in in short qualifying scenarios um such as this obviously it's starting to get a little bit close now we've got the top four and now within a second um of jason lewis but at the same time though three tenths that's quite a, a that's a big margin that's a very big margin so i mean we've got a minute left to qualify are we going to see anyone go through but andy Baldwin just coming through quorum here is he going to be able to improve at the moment on his p10 position going to go through murray's he'll have one more lap after this um by the looks and then that will be it so he goes out a nice clean exit through quorum. you don't want to take too much curb otherwise it'll upset the balance of the car is he going to improve it goes across the line um and at the moment as it just updates he does he moves up a position so he is now into p9 and there's jason lurs in the number 88 and he's a couple of tenths up at the moment as he now makes his way through into Corum and now into the left-hander at Murray's. He'll also possibly get another opportunity, but you've got to watch out for that sausage curb on the inside of Murray's because that can put two, air, uh, two wheels up into the air. As Lurs now comes across the line, he's going to cross it. 
Does he go quicker? He does. 1 minute 45.210. That pushes the gap to just 0.465 between him and Luke Whitehead. Julian Van Brugge from Team uh, Shazoo in the number 19. Uh, Bentley, uh, Whitehead does not improve as the check. It is out for the session. So uh, Lurs in the 88 does a fantastic job there in order to uh, get his way up into pole position for the Bentley challenge. Uh, Di Luqua again uh, showing good credence up in fourth place as there Simon Ramseyer goes up into sixth position in the 99 but uh, number 19 Bentley is one that we need to watch as he goes through into Brundle now into the right hander at Nelson before the uh, sweeping duo as oh Ooh. that was a bit of a runoff wide that the number 19 did not want to have now through into the bomb hole now going through into quorum and then it's just Murray's to negotiate so we just go on board on the front splitter cam, just fully committed, just absolutely wrestling with that car into the left, down into uh, first or second gear, now pushing that car towards the line and aborts the lap. So that session over and done with for him, but Francisco Mazzoni as oh, now there's definitely one uh, Bentley in the dusty grass going off of, uh, going off of Nelson's there, but uh, Mazzoni down in 26th position. Uh, so let's see if he does improve and go up a maybe even a couple of positions that might help uh, the number 23 through into the left hander at Murray's taking as minimal curb as possible and uh, avoiding the sausage curbs uh, as if his uh, as if the rubber on his car depended on it and goes across the line goes P19 at the end of it but then quickly drops to 20th position so for your first of three uh, sprint races uh, here at uh, Snetterton for the final Super Saturday here on the Sim Grid in April. So we have our pole position setter. That's Jason Lurz in the number 88. Then it is Luke Whitehead who rounds out the top two. And, um, you know, quite competitive there, Dan, I, I must say. I mean, especially with the top 10 rounded out, out by... Uh, Marcel Fusi, Mr. Super Saturday, covered by one, just under 1.7 seconds. I know for a fact that that's not, not where Marcel Fusi is going to stay for very long because they'll have a 30-minute sprint race, no pit stop. It's like literally all firing on all cylinders, all turbochargers, and just pushing the limit of adhesion. I think that's what you have to do is that there's no way you can get around not doing that. I think, again, like I said, with the competitive grid that we do have um, this afternoon. Uh, yeah, I, I think as well, the gaps that we've seen there, we have seen, as you say, Marcel Fusi. I'm sure he's going to be um, moving forward. Uh, he knows that he's got pace in the car, I'm sure. As probably other couple of people as well, like it's not that, you know, it's not a particularly long qualifying session. So if you hit a bit of traffic consistently or a bit unlucky with the traffic or just unlucky in general, that, you know, you do have some scenarios where you just may not have a necessary a good qualifying so we're probably going to see some changes through the order um and like you said it is just going to be 110 percent they cannot leave anything on the table now for this race because especially they want to keep up with jason lurs i mean they're gonna to have to pull something um really sort of uh, uh, to keep up with that pace because that is monstrous pace there depends on the consistency one lap is all you know it, it is all well and good and we've seen him obviously with that lap time happen a couple of times but it's the consistency that's going to be key through the through here yeah, the Bentley Challenge, something new. Obviously, we introduced the BMW Challenge here on Super Saturday amongst uh, weeks past. Um, but yeah, we're just waiting for things to get underway here for the first of three support races here on Super Saturday at this fantastic circuit here at Snetterton. Don't forget, you can follow us on all the relevant social medias at The Sim Grid on Instagram, Sim underscore Grid on Twitter, and also uh, at the sim, the, the sim Grid on Facebook as well. So there is your grid. So let's run that through with you because we've got just under 60 seconds to go until the formation. Well, it looks like it's going to be a shorter formation because we're going to be going through uh, the bomb hole and then quorum. So it's Jason Lurz on pole position. Luke Whitehead will be on the front row in the number seven alongside. Then it's uh, Julian Van Bruch and then uh, Pasquale Di Luca. That's row two. Marcus Hagel and Simon Hamseyer. That's row three. So uh, Prendergast and uh, Mc Junior McColl, that's uh, row four, completing the top ten. Andy Boardman and Mr. Super Saturday himself, uh, Marcel Fusi. Then it's uh, Benjamin Letalek and then Philip Haas, that's row six. Miles Dixon and Phil René Oppermann, that's row seven. 
row eight, it's Morgan McColl and uh, I don't know how I'm going to pronounce this surname, but I'll give it my best shot, Alexander Weisk. Um, then we've got uh, Simone Fore and then Denis Suarez and then we've got Francisco Mazzoni, Jonathan Bentz, uh, Luke Dillon, Glenn Guest and we've got uh, Amiral uh, Manouche, uh, Denis Hall, uh, Zanfer Radu and then uh, Jimmy Devikos. So we're going to have quite a lot of action here but it is uh, Lurs and Whitehead that will bring them through Murray's Super Saturday here at Snetterden, about to get underway. The first of three support races before the 2.4 hour season finale of Best of British, which will be called by our very own Lewis McGlade and David Christie once all three support races are done and dusted. So the track temperature a little bit cooler than qualifying, two degrees south, uh, 22 degrees and all, but we are ready, steady, and we're green here at Snetterton for the Bentley Challenge as Jason Lurs and Luke Whitehead looking to get a good run. Whitehead looking rather, rather close to Lurs as they go through Riches for the first time. Now heading down to Wilson, formerly known as Montreal, uh, named in honour of the late Justin Wilson, who was uh, racing in IndyCar at the time of his tragic passing. But now they're going to go through. Looks like everyone's getting through cleanly, but there has been an incident a little bit further down going through the exit of Wilson. And it was, so uh, looks like um, Vizek might have gotten hit off there possibly, but uh, we will be keeping people. Uh, but the good thing is, is that everyone is still on the circuit, but that is the number 11 of Simone Fore as we've had another moment and that is going through Agostini. And that looks to be one of the, uh, that's Glenn Guest in the Pulse Sim Sport number one car, so he tumbles all the way down to 25th. But at the moment, Dan, Jason Lurs and Luke Whitehead and uh, Julian Van Perich are getting away early. And the gap's pretty much even, Stephen, between them, around about half a second between first and second, second and third, and third and fourth. Yeah, exactly. I was actually just looking, going through turns one and two, and it looked to be for a split second um, that Jason Lurs and uh, Luke Whitehead they both actually pulled away. Um, from uh, Julian Van Brew, but at the same time that gap is now closed up. I'm actually looking as well, the gap's really closed up between Van Brew and uh, Whitehead. So is this going to be a potential early move now for Julian? Is he going to want to get by him sooner rather than later? I mean, Jason Lewis, he's already pulled about six tenths of the gap now, as you can see in the timing tower on the left hand side of your screen. Um, but so yeah, this is the person thing to watch at the moment is um, Julian Van Brew, because if he's going to make the move, I think to be fair, to make sure that Jason Lewis doesn't run away too much. If he needs to get by, he needs to do it sooner rather than later. As we've got a potential move going through here, I thought there was going to be a move there going through um, whoever that was in front of uh, Andy Boardman. That's, Mar that was Mar uh, yeah, that's Marcel Fusi. He's already made up two places through the start phase. So I did say that Marcel Fusi would not be, would be moving forward. He's proved me right already and he's closing on Prendergast and that's for seventh position not too far up the road from them will be uh, Simon Rams there with Marcus Hagel rounding out the top five so at the moment no um, I'm just waiting to see if there are any incidents under investigation from race control but at the moment everyone's looking rather rather composed on the circuit a couple of contretemps in the first lap uh, or two but Jason Lurz's lead over Luke Whitehead now is just over three quarters of a second. And Whitehead has also started pulling away from Van Brugge de Luqua. Let's have a look at this replay here. Now, this is on the start. This will be heading down into Riches. So just keep your eyes on a little bit further down the order. So that is... Uh, that there is the number 11. As, oh, now gets a little bit of a touch. That's Simone Fore that tumbles towards the back part of the field. And then we've uh, got, uh, there, there was an incident as well. Uh, oh, and Fiori gets tagged again. Um, like So that was um, that was two different incidents involving Simone Fiori. Uh, and Fiori is now 21.1 seconds off of the current leader who continues to be Jason Lurs as we now go on to lap number three. And he's got a gap of nearly 1.6 seconds over Luke Whitehead as Julian Van Brugge is closing on the number seven for second position. Marcel Fusi looking to try and get past Kevin Prendergast, uh, Kieran Prendergast, but at the moment, Prendergast not letting Fusi pass at this particular moment. So 
so you're going to have to uh, just uh, with regards to this so there's car number nine and that's uh, Alexander Weisk he gets he gets a little bit of a tap and an assist onto the infield grass and that's through Wilson so uh, yeah that it's um, it hasn't been all clean and tidy there's no crossing the T's or, or dotting the I's in the first couple of laps here that's always the case in point here on the sim grid but that does happen it's part of racing isn't it Daniel I think as well, yeah. You, you've got to be uh, at the expectation that some things do happen. It's how you manage them. Or as we've got Marcel Fusi, that's going to potentially uh, give him an opportunity. I thought it was going to. He might get a cutback on the number 29. That is um, Kieran uh, Prendergast. He tries to go through turn seven. Williams nearly side by side for a second. He's just edging his nose. He can't quite make the move stick, though. So he has to pull back in, get the slipstream all the way down Bentley Straight, going through into Brundle be a little bit close is he going to try and go around the outside going as brundle it is going to put him on the inside going into turn nine of nelson's he tries to give it a go doesn't quite make the move but that is now allowed um that is boardman uh, that's just behind number nine uh, now currently on board uh looking back at boardman um now on marcel fusey uh fusey's car yeah i think this is the thing is you've got to make the move and it's got to be a decisive move obviously marcel fusey he tried to to do it couldn't quite get past brendergast and that's now allowed boardman and Junior McCulloch to both catch up. So this battle now for P7, it's very quickly becoming a four-way battle. Um, and if these guys battle any more, it's going to be even more because these guys are gonna, uh, going to hold each other up. Yeah, Marcel Fuzzi, I think he backed out of it going through into Brunnels because obviously when you go through Nelson's, you've got that massive sausage curve. But here is Fuzzi looking up the inside of Wilson as Boardman right on his back bumper. This is now bringing in Junior McCull into place so seventh eighth and ninth uh not very well there's not much separating it's just over it's around about 1.2 seconds between from prendergast to julian mccall from seventh to tenth place as we ride on board with marcel fuzzi now going through into the left at agostini before they put the power down and go up a couple of gears into the left hander at hamilton and you can just see the likes of fuzzi and borman they're using a little bit more of that runoff area coming out of agostini then through into the uh, right at Oggies. And oh, little bit of a slight error there, unforced for Prendergast. And that's allowing Fuzzi to close up. And as you said earlier, Dan, going through into Williams, if Fuzzi was about another car length closer uh, to, uh, to Prendergast, he'd have an opportunity. But uh, through into Brundle again, under the bridge, now into the left at Nelson, this time. Oh, as Boardman was rather close to the back wing of Fuzzy going through into Nelson's before the run down through into the bomb hole. But they're keeping it rather close as there's Dennis Suarez trying to go around the outside. Ooh. And that's on the 310. And that's of Jonathan Bentz. Um, that, was, uh, that was a send and a half. And it's, that's going to be very much a 50-50. A I would rather leave that one to race control. But you could see how quickly that car was coming in at a rapid rate of knots and thought so uh, yeah i'm gonna have a look through brundles might be able to make it through nelson's uh, on that particular occasion it didn't quite work out did it well i think to be fair the camera angle may have been a little bit um camera may have been uh, not not tricked ourselves a little bit but from different camera angles that will probably tell different stories um so you may get a replay of that uh, going forward but yeah i think just going back on this battle here, the gap's opened up a lot now between Prendergast, Fusi and Boardman. Uh, although, it seems that every time, Prendergast is very, very good at defending. He knows when he needs to defend. As we've got a replay here um, going through. So this could very well be the move going through. Um, so this uh, is going to be... Ah, so yeah, a little bit wide there going through, which then just allows, um, obviously, number 310 to then catch up. So just interesting to see what goes on through here. Obviously, a little bit, you know, you've got different... Um, positions now you've also got different closing speeds that's one thing you've really got to consider so as they go in i think oh actually the 310 almost ran a little bit wide on the exit going through Brian. Mm. i mean to be fair take a normal racing line but at the same time i think that was a, a unfortunate incident there but yeah. it's a tricky one to call isn't it i mean to be honest with you dennis suarez i have to give credit where credit is due having uh, you know keeping his foot fully planted on the throttle going through the grass running wide out of Williams and then going down the Bentley straight as Marcel Fusi still trying to get uh, his way past Prendergast and Kieran Prendergast not giving up without a fight but Fusi looking a bit faster 
uh, and looking a bit closer going through Coram and now through into Murray's as long as he gets right up into the slipstream which he has done he's uh, right literally bumper to bumper oh and I think and I think I've just hear just hearing that Luke Whitehead oh well Luke Whitehead has just lost second position as there, oh, now there goes another moment. That is Kieran Prendergast. That's allowed Andy Borman. And now Junior McColl will try to feed his way up the inside, going through into Wilson's. Nicely done by the number 44. So Prendergast was seventh, so he's had a bit of a textbook. But there's, uh, oh, that's looking rather close, going through uh, Palmer's. And that is side by side. That is for position. So Fuzzy. And Boardman now ahead of Prendergast is now battling away with Junior McColl and Junior McColl keeping it planted around the outside of Agostini. That's one hell of a move right there as we're fast approaching one third down in this Bentley challenge here at Snetterton. That was a great move. That was that was so, so committed. You just saw the position. He knew what he needed to do and that was that was a very, very, you know what your car can do. You've got confidence under the car. If you can do something like that, especially going through um, quite a sort of heavy, um, quite an aggressive throttle application zone out of Agostini, You've got to have some confidence in the car. So great move. And uh, Junior McCall, he's already pulled away a little bit. Um, but we've got another replay here. Not entirely sure whom this was. This, ah, this yeah. is. This is going to be Luke Whitehead. So this is going through into Riches. Okay, just keep your eyes on this. Fully Whoa. sends back end steps out, controls the slide. And then Van Bruch up the inside. Just saw it happening right in front. Just kept away. But good car control, as we expect from... Uh, Luke Whitehead not exactly the uh, he didn't uh, I, th I think in some respects you know he said a okay right penalties are coming through so incidents involving cars number 26 that's uh, Jimmy Devacos and the number 11 that's Simone Fori oh the 26 gets a drive through penalty for avoidable contact and then the other car that was involved Denis Suarez uh, gets a 10 second time penalty for also coming together with Simone Fori. So two penalties that have involved the driver that has been on the receiving end. The other car has got uh, the respective penalty. So now uh, this is again. Now this is Fuzzy on Prendergast, I believe, going up into Riches. Uh, yeah, and uh, Fuzzy had the, had the move done. And as a result of uh, that happening, Prendergast in the 29 ran wide. Borman went up the inside. And here comes... Uh, Junior McCull in the 44 and he got through at Wilson so and there's Marcus Hagel there's Simon Rams there right behind him so this is a battle now for fifth and sixth position but just keep your eyes behind by about two seconds Marcel Fuzzi is starting to close and I'm looking at the lap times uh, between Hagel, Hamse and Fuzzi Fuzzi was actually the slowest but when they start battling as we're now on board with Luke Whitehead He's closing in on uh, Julian Van Bruch, uh, in the number 19. 17 minutes and 51 seconds still to go. The battle for second and third heating up. Then you got fifth and sixth. And it seems like... Oh, now, I think that could... I think I've just heard that there has been a massive incident. And that includes Junior McCall and also Kieran Prendergast. So that has completely changed the complexity of the top 10. And there's another car off, actually. Uh, right over the far part, just off of Nelson's, as Whitehead now trying to go toe to toe with Julian Van Bruch, and Van Bruch runs a little bit wide, nearly a little bit of a touch between the pair. Whitehead trying to go up the inside through into Wilson's, can't get through on this particular occasion, but he might get the run coming out of the corner. The pair are side by side for second position, and whilst this is all happening, Jason Lurs is nearly five seconds up the road. Van Bruch keeps ahead of Whitehead going through into Palmer's. Now the run down to Agostini. Whitehead has definitely got the fire in his belly, but Van Bruch has also got an equally intense fire in the belly. Is now up the inside. Oh, they clash for second position. Oh, Whitehead was definitely, definitely trying to do his level best, but that's now going to allow Pasquale Di Luqua just behind. He was about 3.7 seconds adrift as we've got a yellow flag out for the 540. That's Morgan McColl. So both McColls involved in incidents within the last couple of minutes or so. That's a very busy five minutes, isn't it? But yeah, that was, I mean, to be fair as well, very, very late last minute lunge there going from, from Luke White. It looks like he almost tried to position the move and was potentially a little bit um, caught off by uh, how much he was closing in. So we've got a replay here um, going 
through. This is Prendergast here, so we're going to see the instant. Let's see what happens. Going through Brundle and then into Nelson. Is it potentially a bit too late on the brakes? It was indeed. I think he just wasn't expecting... Well, I think he may have just got a bit too late on the brakes. It looked like he was never going to make that corner either way. It just happened to be, unfortunately, um, that the uh, number 44, uh, Bentley, was actually in the way. So not ideal there from Prendergast. Um, but uh, hopefully he can uh, continue on. Oh, there was another yeah. car that, that was exit stage... I, I, I think that was... Uh... Isaac possibly or maybe Barzaghi that went off uh, and that was like literally completely missing the braking zone uh, going through from Brundle into Nelson's but Luke Whitehead again is closing in so uh, and also I've just seen a drive through penalty coming through for uh, Mazzoni uh, Francisco Mazzoni in the number 23 so it was the number nine so yep yeah, uh, that was uh, Alexander Weizsäck that uh, unfortunately went off literally straight line going through Nelson's and uh, nearly hit the barriers very lucky uh, so yeah uh, Francisco Mazzoni running at the top 15 at the moment has a drive-through penalty for an incident involving him and Alexander Weizsäck on lap one and um, and that's a drive-through for avoidable, avoidable contact and Suarez is now uh, in the pits and I understand that he's just had a moment and that Bentley is not exactly fresh as a daisy from what I understand right now as we've hit the we've hit over the halfway point so plenty of drama in this first race the Bentley challenge then we've got the GT4 Cup and then the Super Trofeos to round out the last Super Saturday here at Snetterton and also the last Super Saturday here in April for the Sim Grid. We'll be talking about a lot of things to come. Lots of exciting new seasons of uh, regular championships uh, that we'll be talking about. But Luke Whitehead at the moment uh, closing to within just under five and a half ten tenths of a second on Julian Van Brugge. But Jason Lurs is up the road by about 8.3 seconds. So, ah, that's, oh, that reminds me, oh, no. That reminds me of the Nurburgring faux pas done in the uh, the uh, Nurburgring of uh, the NLS, as it's now called, not the VLN. There was a BMW M4 GT4 that whacked the uh, did exactly the same thing, and uh, yeah, I think uh, someone's not going to be very happy with themselves by outbreaking themselves going into the pit lane there, Dan. No, you're absolutely right. It's an interesting. I mean, there's one way to exit, uh, to enter the pit lane, uh, but not the uh, not the safest way to enter the pit lane. Uh, yeah, it looked to be just a bit of a last minute, almost um, uh, forgot as they uh, went through, and obviously last minute. But the car, you know, as much as you can be violent on the steering, you're going so fast and putting so much load through the car. Obviously, nothing really happened. So a bit unfortunate there, um, but. Uh, Hoping that car could be in potentially some sort of repairable state, although that was a very, very hefty hit. So we'll see um, how that goes. Meanwhile, we've got Marcus Hale currently in P8. It's about three tenths. Great camera angle there. I love static camera angles. Really shows the speed of these cars um, and how much speed they can actually carry through these corners. Um, so yeah, Marcus Hagel in P8 at the moment. It's about six tenths now behind Boardman, uh, who is actually quite now uh, a little bit behind Fusey. So Fusey's really um, on the pace at the moment. He's really trying to pull away and catch up um, to Ramsayer. So we'll see how that develops in these final 13 minutes of this race. Look at Kieran Prendergast. He's trying to move back up uh, the field from his earlier incident a few laps ago. Just trying to get through. That is Jamie McColl. Uh, so this is actually a battle that's going to be uh, continuing on again. We saw this a bit of a battle earlier mm. on. So this is going to be raging on ever more. And I'm sure um, Kieran Prendergast is going to be wanting to make up every position that he can. And uh, it just happens to be that uh, Junior McColl is the next person currently in his path. Yeah, another drive through being issued by Race Control. And it's heading the way of the number 66 of Luke Dillon down in 18th. And that was for an incident involving him and Glenn Guess. So Luke Dillon gets a drive through penalty. So four penalties issued all on the very first lap with multiple incidents. And I don't think race control are probably done quite yet. There's Philip Haas uh, loving the team name, the Boatley boys. Well, in the, in the wet, the Bentley is affectionately known as the Boatley. Um, and he's closing in on uh, Benjamin Letelek in the number 10 car. So at the moment with 11 minutes and 50 seconds to go. Currently on lap number eight, uh, lap number eleven at the moment. So Jason Lurs leading the way by just on over nine point three seconds, and that's ahead of the number nineteen of Julian Van Brugge, who is in turn about just under six tenths of a second ahead of Luke Whitehead, who started on the front row. But it looks like Whitehead has actually gotten past. Uh, so Van Brugge, did he have a moment? As there is Jonathan Bents in the number three ten, the Ghostworks car. Running at the top 19, and 
He's ahead of uh, Manouche in the 120, Amaral Manouche. Um, Madsoni's already served his drive through penalty. And I think that damage for Suarez has been rather terminal. So there is Luke Whitehead. He is ahead of uh, Gideon Van Bruch in the uh, number 19. And there is. Uh, Oh, hang on a second now. Look at this. It's a three-way scrap for second position as they head through Brundle into the right-hander at Nelson because Pasquale Di Luqua has now closed in on them. And these this trio is covered after the second intermediate by just over a second. So we're going to have a replay here of what happened with... Um, with uh, Van Bruch as they go through into Riches. Oh, he lost it as well. He d Well, he didn't lose it as badly. He didn't go completely sideways, but that opened the window of opportunity for um, Luke Whitehead to go through up the inside. And Pasquale De Luqua, I, I mean, to be honest with you, over the last two or, you know, four or five laps, De Luqua has been closing in on these two. And the gap between him and Van Bruch at one point was nearly four seconds, Dan. So, De Luqua's been putting in the hot laps and um, he's been running in the 146.7s. Uh, to be fair, he's doing a very, very quick pace. He's not too far. Um, he's only, uh, you know, five or six tenths off of uh, Jason Luke, currently out in the head in terms of lap time. Uh, I don't know if you saw just there, but going through Rich's turn one, the amount of opposite lock that he had going through, it was almost completely 180 degrees. So he's really trying to make up um, as much time as he possibly can. Meanwhile, we've got, this is the battle um, here for uh, P... Well, this is actually the battle for P. Oh, the spin there. Who was that? Couldn't quite see who that was. And that oh, was an accident. That was oh, contact. Oh, my. Mazzoni, contact. Yeah. Not ideal through there. And Mazzoni's got a very crumpled front end. That bonnet has uh, definitely sprung off the catch. I think the catch has been broken. And Mazzoni is probably going to do more than likely a return to garage on that one, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, he's done a return to garage. So, Mazzoni's race is done and dusted. Not too sure who that... I'm wondering if that might have been the 310 of Bents that might have spun out in, uh, ahead, or maybe even the 109 of Dennis Hall. Um, but we've got nine minutes of this race still to go. Jason Lurs is well and truly away. I think he's ended up in Suffolk now, but we're going to go to a replay now. <laughs> uh, this is on board with the number 23 of uh, Francisco Mazzoni. So he's trying to go up the inside. That's the 120 of uh, Amiral Manouche. So we're going to watch for the spinning car that is ahead. So someone goes off going through Murray's. So here is the onboard. Oh, he's and blind. You just see. Ah, now that was probably Dario Barzaghi or Alexander Weissick, I think. Uh, and it looks like it might have been Weissick that actually spun out uh, coming out of Murray's. So took too much. Well, went way too wide coming out of Murray's. Uh, another drive through penalty now coming through. Uh, car number 910, uh, that is Zanferradu, gets a drive through penalty uh, with an incident involving Simone Fori, who's been. And yep, that was uh, that was Alexander Weissick. I thought it might have been. And just watch closely. And yeah, Mazzoni had nowhere to go. It was like literally watch in front, see what everyone else does. And then he had to instantly react. And yeah, there was no. There was no possibility for that. So Zanferradu in the 910, currently running in P21. Well, that's going to drop him to the tail end, Charlie, of the field as we concentrate our efforts once again on Luke Whitehead and Julian Van Bruch, both Brits, both competing uh, in this. And uh, they're also both gunning for second position because Jason Lewis has literally run away uh, in true customary fashion he's about 11 and a half seconds up the road De Luqua is just waiting and I think that's rather smart tactical driving up until was a certain point down because we're we're just over seven minutes to go and if anything happens between Whitehead and Van Bruch, De Luqua can pick up the pieces I think to be fair yeah this is probably what Van Bruch is thinking at the moment like you've probably got to try and see if they can pull away I mean the gap's extended a little bit it's about three tenths of a uh, sorry it's about a second now uh, from Van Bruch to uh, De Luqua so I think again yeah maybe some tactics there being played into it to a certain extent but at the same time though you have got to make a decision on when you make the move if you ever make the move at all you know you've got to work, look at the risk versus reward is it worth having a potential go to see if you can make another position or is it potentially going to be the case if you don't want to lose another position so a bit of back and forth there. i'm sure that's going to be um i'm sure there's going to be some um conversations going on uh, with himself about that and see what he wants to do but at the moment kieran prendergast he has made up a position on 
um, Junior McCall. So the next person is Opperman. That is the next person in his sights. It looks like he's got a very good run going out of Murray's. So if he can carry the speed going through turn one into Riches and then maybe going through Wilson, he's going to potentially make a move. He's very, very close. Is he going to be able to do it, though? Actually, I think he's dropped back potentially. So it's going to have to be a very, very last minute move. Just carries a bit of grass there. Let's try and using all of the track and a little bit more. But yeah, through Wilson doesn't make the move. Again, Prendergast, he's in a little bit of a predicament as well because, again, if he tries to battle Opperman too much, then again, Junior McCall, he's going to be straight back on his back bumper. So Prendergast is in a little bit of a um, tricky position here. So he's, if, he can, if he wants to make the move, it's going to have to be decisive and it's going to have to be done very, very quickly. As we've just actually seen, he's just come up on the timing tower. He's got a 10-second um, penalty actually going up as well. He's got a 15-second penalty. So uh, I wonder what that was um, for there, Alex. I think that's going to be for an incident that involved him and Junior McColl. That would have been the one a few laps ago, and that would have been going through into Brundle and Nelson. Uh, yep, so a 15-second time penalty for Kieran Prendergast for avoidable contact. That was on lap seven, going through uh, into Nelson's on Junior McColl. So uh, that's a real that's a, a shame for him, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, five minutes to go, and this battle still raging on, but this uh, effectively hands 13th position to Junior McColl, obviously through uh, the incident a bit earlier on in this race. So uh, as Prendergast all oh, goes a little bit wide, touches a wheel on the grass, and that was going through into the bomb hole. Uh, that's definitely not where you want to end up off the track because uh, both Prendergast and McColl were off the track um, going through Nelson's around about sort of, what was it, seven laps ago. So this battle is still getting rather frenzied here at Snetterton. I know it is indeed. Like I said, yeah, five minutes to go, and it's really starting to hot up. So Prendergast, he's dropped a little bit of time. So Junior McCall, is he going to try and make a move back going through potentially? Uh, again, it's a three-way battle here going for P12, and uh, none of these drivers want to give up this position. I've actually noticed as well, look at that, Junior McCall getting fed. These guys are really utilising more of the track than they probably should be. That's actually probably slowing them down a little bit. Um, but it almost seems as well like Prendergast seems to catch up to Offerman in the first half but then he drops a little bit of time in the second half and allows Julian McCall to catch up. So a bit of like accordion effect going through. But at the moment, look at Julian Van Bruyen. He's really trying to make the move. That was going out of Williams. Uh, not a position where you want to get any form um, of off track or anything because that really does upset the fans of the car. And potentially, um, you can have a, uh, a moment going through and the car will swap round at you. But he's very, very close to Whitehead's back bumper. So is he going to try? It's going to be have to be, uh, again, something that's going to be in these last three and a half minutes. This is where you now start to think. He's got 1.2 seconds now from DeLuca. So the gap is extending even more. So he's probably, I think, he's got a bit of leeway here. Bit of a, he's got a back marker, though. So that's got to be something that they've got to anticipate. He gets very, very close. He's got a really good run. So I think that was Whitehead getting caught up a little bit by the back marker. So I think, to be fair, Alex, this is going to really kick off with these last few laps remaining. Yep, as uh, that is getting rather up close and personal. Julian Van Bruch looking to go around the outside of Luke Whitehead, going through into Riches. Unfortunately, no dice there for the number 19 as they managed to get past uh, the back marker just behind them. Uh, and also Pasquale Di Luca has also managed to get past. So I think in the next minute or so, this is going to fast become a three-way scrap for the lead. Well, not, not for the lead, for second position, as our leader now, Jason, uh, Jason Lurs, making his way through into Hamilton's, as there's the move going through into Agostini. Julian Van Bruch doing a textbook of nigh on what uh, Whitehead did to him a little bit earlier on in the race to secure second position. But now the time is fast running out because the next time that Jason Lurs crosses the line, uh, that's probably going to be with, uh, that will be the penultimate lap of the race. So, if Luke Whitehead wants to get past, he's going to have to get past. And now is his next opportunity. He's got to carry all that momentum down the Bentley straight as uh, Van Bruch leads the pair of them down the down the straightaway, down towards the bridge. They'll head underneath it into the left at Brundles. Now into the right at Nelson's. And good uh, good movement by both of them. But De Luca was right in the braking zone. He outbraked himself going through into the approach into Brundles, which then caught him out going through into Nelson's. As uh, looks like Whitehead's car went a little bit bouncy going through the bomb hole. There is a bit of a uh, an unpronounced dip there, which can catch out the the damper travel and the suspension travel on these cars. As Kieran Prendergast still battling away with Phil René Oppermann and also. 
Ginia McColl and Ginia McColl looking rather racy but we've got just over a minute and 20, 20 seconds still to go our leader is 16.1 seconds up the road as there's Prendergast again running wide going through Nelson's and into the bomb hole as uh, Whitehead back up the inside this time through Wilson's cleanly done by the number seven to get past Julian Van Brug on that particular occasion so Luke Whitehead waited bided his time he knew that if he got a good run coming out of Murray's he could go down the main straightaway going down the center straight through into Riches and get the move done but I don't think that Julian Van Brug is quite finished yet with Luke Whitehead no he's not indeed but he's got one more opportunity though pretty much it's going to be going through Brundle uh, potentially into Murray's as well but that's going to be very very tricky uh, but look at that Jason Lurs he's just about to come through he's going to go down into Brundle so riding now on board with Van Brew. so what is he going to do going through he needs to get a good exit he loses a little bit of time though look at that Whitehead got the traction going out of Williams and he's just pulled that was at least a tenth of a second that he's pulled so that could be that could uh, very well be enough and correct me if I'm wrong it's going to be very very close here um, Alex but this could be potentially the final lap well, the thing is, is that the 540 of Morgan McColl has got a drive-through penalty for avoidable contact, but winning the first support race of the day, it has hit zero on the timer. Jason Lurz from Lights Out to Checkered Flag wins the Bentley Challenge here on the SimGrid Super Saturday here at Snetterton, and Luke Whitehead will finish exactly where he started, a little bit further down than probably where he would have liked to have been, but he's going to finish in second ahead of Gillian Van Brugge as one of the marker uh, posts just get, uh, get gets flown unceremoniously to the left-hand side of the centre straight. So Pasquale Di Luca will take fourth, but Kieran Prendergast is not factoring into this at all. And the reason being, he's got a 15-second post-race penalty for his incident with Junior McCall. Is again, Prendergast, it just seems to be his nemesis coming out of Nelson's and then going through into the bomb hole. He's running both left wheels onto the grass you can see the scuff marks on the left hand side of Junior McColl's car as they go through Murray's so De Luqua takes fourth Ramsey fifth Marcel Fusi finishes in sixth having started tenth uh, then we got Andy Board Boardman Marcus Hagel Philip Haas Miles Dixon Benjamin Letalek Philip Opperman uh, we will have Junior McColl in 13th place uh, Glenn Guest will be uh, well will be in 12th that will be for McColl uh, Guest will be in 13th uh, so that could drop Prendergast down into 14th position at the checkered flag there's Dennis Hall in the number 109 as he will finish behind um, Amiral Manouche in 16th and uh, Jonathan Bentz in 15th position so our first of three I didn't really, I, I was wondering how it was going to go. And to be honest with you, Jason Lurz, absolutely textbook, managed to get to the checkered flag first, put it on pole position by just over four and a half tenths, did absolutely the perfect job. And Luke Whitehead, that great battle between him and Julian Van Brug, really, really entertaining. Pasquale De Luca, De Luca, it, it was definitely one of those. Ah, well, it could have, would have, should have been it, had he not outbraked himself going through into Brundle and Nelson's for what was possibly the, the penultimate time on that race stand. But standout performance for Jason Lurz. Oh, exactly. I mean, you, you can't deny it, can you? I think, to be fair, you know, we didn't have much screen time and I don't think he's going to be complaining too much, you know, to take a win, uh, something like that, that is that dominant, I, I think cannot be, uh, can't be understated, especially again with the with the drivers that we've got in here, the level of drivers. So, no, great stuff as well. Uh, one thing I've noticed, Marcel Fusey up into P5, um, a good performance. Like, so he did move up some positions, whether he wanted to have moved up a little bit further, um, potentially, but at the same time, though, you know, as you said, rightly so, Alex, we saw we were going to see him move up and indeed we did. Um, so yeah, I mean, great racing. It was really, it was really quite nice to see, you know, that many Bentleys um, going around. It was a, a fantastic event, and I mean, I can't wait for the next one already. Yes, indeed. So we are not quite done yet with our support racing here at the SimGrid, um, and uh, we're hope. Well, I, I know for a fact that Marcel Fusi, we never get an interview with him uh, in in between the the uh, the support races because. You know, he's, he's always, always rather, rather focused. I mean, this is his chance now uh, to have a little bit of comfort break, you know, a comfort break. Um, well, actually, let's bring in one of our drivers, um, our runner up, started second, finished in second, but a regular on the Sprint Cup this season with Hamada Erquizi. Let's bring in 
uh, Luke Whitehead. Luke, good afternoon. Um, well, firstly, um, that was a, an interesting race from your perspective, uh, battling away with Julian Van Bruch uh, for the majority of it. Yeah, it was a really awesome battle, to be honest. Um, I overfueled massively um, because I've never driven this car on this track. Um, so I really didn't have the sort of know-how and the, the experience to kind of judge how much fuel I needed. Um, and that paid dividends, you know, I think the pace in quality, I didn't really show what I really had. Because um, actually, as the checkered flag waved, the lap after that, I was only a tenth off of what, what um, Black Gold saw did. Um, so I, you know, I, I had a bit more pace than what I showed, but then obviously in the race, I overfueled massively. And I've also got an injury on my hand, uh, courtesy of my dog which is great. Um, so that was really hurting, uh, rubbing on my glove, which isn't great. But, yeah. you know, that's not an excuse, obviously. Um, and I made a couple of mistakes. Um, I actually collided with Julian. But, you know, the, the battle was really good. Uh, we both re thoroughly enjoyed it, I think. And, you know, obviously I made a mistake, put my hands up and apologised to him. And I think we're all good on that side. But, mm -hmm. yeah, really brilliant, respectful racing. I'm excited for the next two races because I think I'm taking part in those as well. So has uh, your dog Sook's been told off for giving you that little bit of a war injury? Then has she? Yes, she has. She has, but she doesn't. She's she's pretty raucous at the moment. Uh, she's at that stage where she's you know playing and attacking everything. So yeah, but don't worry. She she's been put in her place. Um, but yeah, uh, it is what it is. You've got to drive with what you're dealt with, and um, I'm dealt with that. So just got to drive my way around it as I always do. Yeah, it seems like a few people want to send you some band-aids, I think, for that injury, mate. So, uh, But nevertheless, a fantastic drive. Um, but obviously, we're, we're, we're going to have you back on the grid again today. I think you're, you're, you're keeping yourself occupied, aren't you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've, got, I've had a very, very busy week. Um, I did, I've been doing the Endurance Cup qualifiers, and I've still got to do four more laps of that. Um, I did the Economy Challenge on Thursday. Yeah, uh, I believe it was Thursday, and obviously yes. getting fourth, which was really good. Um, I took part in Jardier's community race the other, the other. Um, I think it was on Tuesday, and had a really good battle with uh, Malinovsky or Tortellini, as a lot of you people might know him. Yep. Um, and that was really good. And then obviously we're doing all three races today, so keeping myself as occupied as possible. And then of course on Thursday, next Thursday, we've got the Sprint Cup round four. Round four I think. Yeah, round four at the Hungar Ring, obviously. Yeah. And Hamada, you know, you got some obviously very disappointing, you know, we're not going to talk about that much, but I know you guys are still smarting after, you know, the, the unfortunate DNF, but, you know, that's I, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys fighting back at the Hungaroring and that Ferrari and, and uh, giving the likes of uh, Niels Noyox and, uh, and and everyone else in front um, you know, a, a bit of a warning shot across the bow because there's still half of that season to go, but well done today on uh, your second place and we look forward to seeing how you get on in GT4s, Luke. All right, thank you very much, Alex. Cheers. So, big thank you there to uh, Luke Whitehead for, for joining us. Um, so, yeah, there's there's plenty, plenty of things to talk about here on the SimGrid. Of course, we have two more races to go for the support, so we've got GT4s up next. Um, we've also got the uh, Super Trofeos, so congratulations to the number 88 of Jason Lurz uh, in that car, winning by a considerable margin at the end of this race um but i did say about what we've got going on today so we've got the gt4 cup up next we've then got the super trofeos that's our third and final support race uh, here today at snetterton and then myself and daniel handover we will hand over uh, no pun intended there uh the commentary you, there, over to yeah <laughs> glad to hear that dan <laughs> <laughs> Uh, always a bit of banter here on the sim grid. Uh, we'll, ha we'll, hand we'll pass uh, the baton over to uh, Lewis McGlade and David Christie for the fifth and final round. Now also, interestingly enough, the top six in that championship, just to give you a teaser, they're covered by 43 points. One of those drivers is doing all four races as usual on Super Saturday. Of course, Marcel Fusi, who finished P6 uh, in that uh, Bentley Challenge. So he's got Chris... Uh, uh, John Zemis uh, on equal on points. Then you've got George Boothby, Lucas Kreuzer, Patrick Nagy, and current br best of British leader at the moment, Igor Ogorodnikov, uh, who's leading by uh, around about 16 points coming into the final round. There are interval points, but we'll leave all the details about best of British to go th be taken through with you all, courtesy of Lewis and David. So uh, actually, we'll go to a brief commercial break um, from our partners here at the SimGrid. We'll be back very shortly and then I'll 
give you the uh, the rundown on what is happening in the next few weeks, not just in April, but in May here on the Simgrid. Yep, so you just saw um, a, uh, an advert courtesy of our good friends and our partners over at Thrustmaster. If you want to be like David Christie and buy yourself a T300RS, head over to their official website also. Uh, we can't thank Coach Dave Academy enough, um, run by Dave Perel himself. Uh, you can also get your setups, you can get your track maps, you can also be uh, coached by Dave Perel himself and also the likes of Jordan Pepper and Nick Foster. Uh, and that's uh, professional, world-class training for those of you out there that want to learn the nuances about Assetto Corso Competizione. So you just saw the trailer for Sprint Cup. Round four takes place this coming Thursday. That's the 22nd of April. Round four out of six, it heads to the Hungara Ring. Also, we've got the meet and greet event for season three of More Female Racers by Thrustmaster Rockets. Um, that's taking place at Monza this coming Monday. And also the first round of season three will take place at Circuit Zolder in Belgium on the 26th of April. We'll also have the Battle of the Outcasts between the Jaguar G3 developed and produced by Emil Frey. Not ever a work century that particular car was. And also the car based on the Lamborghini Gallardo, the writer engineering rex gt3 they head to the cathedral of speed they head to monza on the 29th of april of course uh, luke whitehead mentioned about the endurance cup by thrustmaster season three uh, the qualifying stage is open but only until tomorrow evening at 2200 central european summertime that's nine o'clock british summertime here in the uk the car that is going to be used in, and the circuit used in the qualifying stages will be the lexus rcf gt3 and it will be at the nurberg ring and the first round will be uh, started by the three hours of hungar ring on the first of may but also, we can't forget about the SimGrid VCO World Cup. Round two, which will be the Thrustmaster 24 hours of a Spa Francorchamps. The qualifying will take place on the Thursday night, on the 13th of May. And then we go round the clock, starting at around about 1 o'clock Central European Summer Time on the 15th of May, right the way through to 24 hours later. Dan, plenty of action here on the sim grid and from what i hear there's plenty more still to come there is absolutely yeah it's just i can't wait and 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 yeah i just love love being a part of it even in these sort of you know being able to commentate on these sort of events as well is absolutely fantastic and it's just there's so the 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 level of competition i don't keep saying it but the level of competition is just so so high that you, you've always got racing to look at as we see the 
the official event calendar as we've got there. But yeah, there's just so much going on. And I think the good thing as well, you'll probably agree with, me, uh, agree with me on this as well, Alex, is there's something for literally everyone. Indeed, and as you can see, uh, there's been a lot of hard work behind the scenes here at the SimGrid, so all credit to Dave Perel and the team for getting this happening. Of course, daily races, you know, Open GT3, GT3 Challenge, Fixed Car GT3, racing at Spa and, you know, in the M6, and it's hot and dry. You, you can see, like, the schedule as well. You know, you can sign up. It's all free to enter. There's also European... Um, uh, US and also other servers across like Oceania so uh, and Asia as well so you can you can see obviously it takes into consideration the respective times time zones that you're in and that's one of the beauties about the sim grid as Dan said there is something for everyone and we still have plenty of action still to go can't believe we're one race down out of three for the support uh, the sports side of things but next up is G the GT4 Cup. We've got 27 drivers, uh, one of which uh, you can see all there. Now, Michael Hamlet has decided to throw his two cents into the ring, and he's now going to get behind the wheel uh, in the Audi R8 LMS GT4. And, oh, team name straight away, David Christie. You've got, you've got a retort <laughs> later. David Christie is my nemesis. Well... You know what? One thing that I would love to see at some particular point in a future Super Saturday, if they're both up for it, Michael, David, you've got to race in the same race as long in, on a Super Saturday. I think that would be absolutely brilliant to witness, wouldn't you say, Dan? I think it would. I think we'd all like to see that. So that uh, that definitely needs to happen at some point. Definitely needs to happen at some point because I'd like to see that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm not exactly, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm just uh, a bloke that commentates on racing. What do I know about sim racing? But those two, they've got probably a lot more experience uh, than me. You know, I do like getting behind the wheel of a sim um, for, for sort of like, you know, recreational activities, not for competitiveness like we see here on the sim grid. But we have 27 uh, cars. Um, on the grid and uh, also amongst uh, all of those we've got the Alpine we've got uh, the A110 um, we've also got the BMW M4 the Porsche 718 Cayman the McLaren 570 S GT4 which I know that Dan you have a certain penchant for of course uh, but obviously only two on the grid we've got the Chevy Camaro uh, GT4 actually uh, produced by Heiter Engineering um, as well so Reiter Engineering have uh, you know the KTM crossbow as we now uh, so we've also got the Aston Martin uh, Vantage GT4 quite a lot of variety on this grid um, but obviously with Snetterton if it was you getting behind the wheel right now for instance Dan apart from the McLaren what would you say is possibly the car that would suit your driving style and this circuit in one fell swoop so that's okay I, I, I'm glad you put that caveat in of not choosing the McLaren because that's what I would have gone with. Uh, outside of the McLaren, I probably, I'd probably go with something like possibly the Audi or maybe the Porsche. I, I think my driving style normally suits. I prefer the mid-engine sort of rear drive, you know, prefer the mid-engine cars. Uh, I always find that they're a little bit more on edge, but you can balance it just a little bit nicer on throttle. I prefer oversteer rather than understeer. Sometimes if I drive the Aston or something like the Mercedes, I just get a little bit of understeer that I can't quite seem to dial out. Or it takes me a little bit longer to dial that out. So yeah, for me, I think it would probably be out of the two. I, I think the Porsche. I think I'd be taking the Porsche. Interesting choice there. Uh, there's uh, Dennis Klebov in the uh, Lightbook Motorsport colours. He's uh, one of the, um, well, there's hardly any Mercedes on, on this grid anyway. We've got Felix F in the 243. Um, there's Rafael Alves uh, in one of the uh, Ginettas. Um, and also, Marcel Fusi has won in GT4s. He's won in Ginettas before on Super Saturday. He's running in the Alpine. Now, one of the other things about that car, it's the lowest displacement in terms of the engine capacity. Just, uh, just 1.8 litres, inline four, turbocharged. You know, produces well over 260 plus horsepower, but it's very, very good in the twisty stuff. And with the infield section here at Snetterton, I think that might be a good call here. I, I think, to be fair, there's definitely something that got to, we've got to take into account. Uh, absolutely. Similar with the Ginetta as well. I think the Ginetta, and here we go, we are actually already live for qualifiers. So these guys are uh, not holding 
back at all. That's Oscar uh, Sadisto that's currently um, we're just uh, on your screen now. But yeah, I think it's a good shout. It's We've got to see something like the Camaro uh, here or even something like the um, uh, the Porsche potentially. Um, it's got a very, very good BOP at the moment. Uh, yeah, these cars are going to be very, very quick on the straight line. They're just going to, you know, eat the Alpine um, up on the main straight. But yeah, something that we're going to have to have a look and see how that pans out. Interesting to see as well sector times, because that would be a good indication um, of what the car can do. But it's one of the cars I haven't driven, actually. I've not driven the Alpine. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how it, uh, how it behaves. But I'm sure, again, it's quite a light, nimble car. So, I mean, going through that, in, that midfield section, uh, we'll see how it pans out. It, uh, it depends, though, as well. If we get people, there's one of them uh, with Jan uh, that's uh, Erbrick that's currently um, in a very bright, he's wearing a high visibility jacket, isn't it? That's a very brightly colored outfit. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think I'm intrigued to see how it does. Cause I've not really actually seen a race um, or commentated on a race, I should say, um, with this in. So always we see someone have a small excursion, exit stage right. Um, I don't know who that was. That looks to be that was the number 61. Of, yeah, 69 BMW of Tom Ossie. Um, yeah, I think uh, Jan Niklas Ebre's car could glow in the dark, given the choice. <laughs> uh, it's, especially if that's a fluorescent wrap he's put on the Alpine. And oh, that's just as bright. Plenty of uh, plenty of tangerine orange there for Konrad Kula in the number two as he fires his way through into Corum. And that Alpine looking rather planted in the twisty stuff, especially the fast uh, and mid speed corners. There's Alex Leif um, in the number 302 from TPC Sim Racing. So TPC, part of uh, Trade Price Cars, run by Dan Kirby, who uh, also has a vested interest in the British Touring Car Championship, uh, considering uh, they've just uh, gone and joined forces with Accelerate for 2021. But so no one yet to have set a, uh, a lap time in, but the sectors coming in. Conrad Kohler was showing a 38.5 in Sector 2, uh, as was um, Dario Barzaghi, in the number three Aston Martin and there is Conrad Kula I mean obviously the the second sector is going to be rather paramount you know because they'll break the timing being being between Palmer and Agostini and then it's the run down before Brundles so the the timing line for the intermediate two um on this lap which is just being crossed by uh the 32 BMW uh that's uh, Juan Goiti um you know that, that's going to show the strength I think of the of the Camaro, but then we could see that the the balance switches, the pendulum swings in the favour of the cars that are a bit more, uh, let's say, adept in terms of their handling characteristics. You mentioned the Porsche. I mean, the McLaren has got some very good pedigree anyway. As oh, Conrad Cooler gets ve he gets a bit crossed up coming out of uh, Williams there. So that's definitely not what you want in in that particular vehicle. But the McLaren, in its own right, is a, is is pretty good in the straight line. As Juan Goiti. Uh, now comes across towards the uh, finish line and uh, that was an outlap so no bank is being set yet but I think like Conrad Kula and a few others like Barzaghi, Alex Leif and you've got the 25 of uh, John uh, Serrell there as well um, then we've got someone who's got four names and I'm gonna pronounce all of them thank you Michael Hamlet for mentioning this to us before we went on air Jose Manuel Cecilia Sanchez and that's the 67 well done uh, <laughs> Well, the thing is, is that with my my commentating overseas, um, I have to learn surnames pretty quickly. Konrad Kula goes uh, second as Jan Niklas Ebrich, uh, the German in the 299, goes top with a one minute 56.547. And actually, Ebrich was pretty rapid in sector two. Uh, but then um, the 67 of Cecilia Sanchez uh, puts in a one minute 56.668. Uh, and actually was nigh on, uh, just over a, a tenth and a half quicker. Because there's one of the Chevrolets uh, that's just had a bit of an exit stage left going through Nelson's. Uh, Felix F running in the uh, Team Parker Racing colours, uh, the uh, Mercedes-AMG GT4. And it looks like the number 27, that is of Denis Gribov, uh, is actually the quickest Mercedes out there. And there's only three of them on the grid. So, uh, coming towards the halfway point of the session, but Jan Niklas Ebrich, well, to be honest with you, uh, looking pretty good as Felix F puts in, uh, that's 12th position, but the Alpine, and, oh, now Marcel Fusi has just gone pole, 
1 minute 56.535 uh, and that means that all three Alpines are in the top five with the, it being an Alpine 1-2 with Fuzzy and Jan Niklas Ebrich being separated by 12 one thousandths of a second. I was waiting to see what Marcel Fuzzy was going to do and he stuck himself in an Alpine. He went, right, I didn't get pole in the Bentley. Let's get pole in the Alpine, shall we? I think, to be fair, that really puts into perspective the, the adaptability that Fusey had. Because you think you've gone from a Bentley GT3 car, which, let's be honest, is like driving the QE2 in terms of size. And then you're going to a very small, tight, um, nimble, sort of like Alpine GT4. I mean, that's a very, very big change. You know, you've got it, it's much more based on the road car. Everything happens a lot slower as that is... Uh, someone's just gone pole. That was uh, Conrad Kula, who's now just gone pole by four tenths of a second is now the gap. Well, just under nearest makes no difference. So at the moment, Alpines are currently locking out the top three. Not going to lie, Alex, I did not expect this. But yeah, Marcel Fusi, I mean, that's a very, very good adaptability there to jump from a GT3 car, have about 15 minutes of practice, and then to put it at the moment, P2, is a very, very impressive um, thing to do. And I'm sure he's going to be on, uh, potentially, I don't think that's the last uh, we've seen out of that car yet. As I say, that he does go a little bit wide going through into mm -hmm. Nelson. But he's, so he's still really trying, isn't he, these last final stages? Yeah, he's, uh, well, Luke Whitehead has just gone P2, uh, and that's with a 1 minute 56.160. So the Porsche, uh, so Visa's finest is, oh, there's a few people going wide coming out of Riches. It's not what you want to do there. There's Simon Hams there going through into Corum, now into the left-hander at Murray's. Uh, Gergely Kunsabo, if anyone might remember, pushed uh, Yaroslav Honzik across the line this past Thursday in the Economy Challenge and instantly tangled with the wall uh, shortly afterwards. I don't know how that all happened, but um, Simon Rams there crosses the line. P7 for the Porsche. Top seven covered by just over nine tenths of a second as is Jose Manuel Cecilia Sanchez. Running out, P, uh, running out P5 at the moment, just over half a second adrift, but the Porsche seeming to come a little bit better in this um, in this final few throws of qualifying just over two and a quarter minutes to go track temperature again has dropped by a further degree following the race from the Bentleys uh, so Cecilia Sanchez making his way through into the dip through the through the bomb hole now into the right hand sweeper at Corum and it's very very fully committed in fourth gear sometimes you have to accelerate but then you have to lift off and then re-accelerate re drop down into second gear and around about 80 kilometers an hour on the apex going through Murray's as 24 of the drivers have set a lap time at the moment uh, 20, the bottom three haven't yet well Michael Hamlet has yet to set a lap time um, as uh, Cecilia Sanchez goes fastest by 39, 39 thousandths on the clock so between Cecilia Sanchez, Kula and Whitehead, it is just over half a tenth of a second as Marcel Fusi. And Fusi is uh, looking rather racy here. He's looking quick as he exits the bomb hole. Now through into the right-hand sweeper at Corum. You can just see how well planted that Alpine. And he's a few tenths up as well into Murray's. Hard into the braking zone. And Fusi comes out of the final corner nice and tidy. So I'm not too sure if he might have lost a little bit of time. But uh, Fuzzy looking good. We're into the last 60 seconds of the session. Marcel Fuzzy does he loses all that time. He must have had four or five tenths in his back pocket. And he still gets another run. So the top four covered by just under a tenth and a half as Simon Hamzer rounds out the top six covered by 0.525 seconds with uh, Jan Niklas Ebrich who's following one of the Chevrolets down the Bentley Strait. So uh, Ebrich looks to be a couple of tenths up at this particular moment as he makes his way through into Nelson's. This will be the final opportunity that the German has. Now through into the bomb hole, and he's going for pole position. So Ebrich could be the one that puts the cat amongst the proverbial pigeons as we had a yellow flag uh, courtesy of Zamfir Radu in the 9-10. But this will be Ebrich's last attempt through out of the final corner he's seven tenths up that is going to put him into the 155s as the check it is out for qualifying what is Jan Niklas Ebrich going to bring, bring to the party it's a 155 926 oh my goodness that was an absolute howitzer of lap and here's Paolo Lima 
in the number 18 BMW M4 GT4. And he's coming through Coram. Now heads onto the brakes, down a couple of gears into the left here at Murray's. Will the BMW have anything to say? He's the highest place at a BMW out of this contingent and there are only four in here so where does lima end up he's currently p8 just over a second he goes p7 and here is simon ramsayer he's seven cents off a provisional pole and whitehead has beaten ebridge to pole position and it's 36 thousandths of a second let's keep our eyes on simon ramsayer there's about one minute 30 to go in this session marcel fuzzi his last attempt, what has happened for him? He goes P3. Whoa. Oh, nicely done. As Simon Ramsayer now comes across the line, goes P5, drops Konrad Kula down to sixth position. As uh, Alex Leif running in the uh, trade price cars, uh, Sim TPC Sim Racing Porsche, he's going to be the last car to qualify. He's currently P12. Does the number 302 have something in the gas tank? As they go across the line, P8. But Luke Whitehead, second in the Bentley Challenge on qualifying, Dan. Second in the race. And even with a hand injury, he's just put it on pole position. I mean, you can't really argue with that, can you? You absolutely you can't. can't argue with that. And again, another person. You look at that, the adaptability that we had. Like, you're going through, again, like GT3s to GT4s. There's so, there's so many different... Like, it, it's so much more of a road car. Everything happens is a lot slower. You have to wait for the guy to be a lot more patient. Um, so, yeah, and like I said, with that injury that he has got as well, I mean, yeah, very, very impressive indeed. It's not by much, though. Obviously, we did have... Um, obviously, the race uh, with uh, Jason Lurz taking the GT3, the Bentley win by a sizable margin. Uh, I somehow don't think that the drivers and Whitehead will be having it this easy uh, this time around. He's going to have to work for it, I think. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how it all develops. It's going to be interesting to see how it really um, moves forward. I'll tell you one thing, though, Alex. It's going to be close. I'm intrigued, like we spoke about earlier on. I'm intrigued to see how the Alpines do against the Porsche, though, especially in the early stages when they're all quite close together. Yeah, I think that makes two of us, really, to be completely honest with you, as, uh, you know, there, there, there's going to be so many talking points in this race. I, th I think we had we had quite a lot of them with the Bentleys. Now we've got plenty of them with the the variable smorgasbord. That's the term I haven't used here on the sim grid. Um, good use of the thesaurus there, Alex. Um, but just the amount of different cars that we've got um, in this race and you know 27 drivers michael hamlet saying that david christie is his nemesis uh, i wonder what the boot on the other foot will be after after when david comes on to commentary i'm sure there'll be a few nice little pleasantries a bit of banter exchange between the two because we all we all have fun here on the commentary team and the broadcast team here on simgrid but we are waiting for things to go green ready for the second of our three support races here at the SimGrid at the fantastic Snetterton 300 circuit. And uh, yeah, it was the season opener for Sprint Cup season three. We also had, uh, Brit we've had British classics here as well. Um, uh, but also the good thing is, is that this is a very, very tricky circuit. So there is the grid. So Luke Whitehead will start from Jan Niklas Ebrich. Then it is Mr. Super Saturday, starting in P3 this time, Marcel Fuzzi. He'll have Jose Manuel Cecilia Sanchez alongside. Then Simon Hamzea, Konrad Kula, Paulo Lima, Alex Leif. Uh, then we've got Kieran Prendergast back for more. Uh, and, oh, he's got Francisco Mazzoni alongside him. That's going to be an interesting row five. Oscar Saristo from Finland. He'll have uh, Felix Zeff in the Mercedes alongside him for row, row six. Denis Gribov and uh, Pasquale Di Luqua running in the K the highest placed uh, out of two KTMs. Uh, John Sorrell and then also Samuel Foch ran at the top eight rows. And then uh, Guillaume uh, Exposito, Dario Bar uh, Barzaghi, then uh, Benjamin Lutalek and Gergely Kunsabo. That rounds out the top 20, completing the 27 strong grid. It's the BMW of Tom Otti, the Ginetta of Rafael Alves, uh, Mike uh, Mouton, um, in uh, Mutu in the uh, BMW, well, in the Porsche. Then we've got uh, Juan Goiti, Reina Ressa, Michael Hamlet, and Zamfir Radu. 30 minutes set on the timer once again. And the first thing that springs volumes to me is that the Porsche will have the legs on the Alpine, but keep your eyes on Ebrich 
through the twisty stuff. They exit out of Murray's, the second support race here at Simgrid Super Saturday at Snetterton, about to get underway. Track temperature again has dropped by a further degree to 20 degrees Celsius. Track still optimum as now the mind games begin here in the GT4 Cup. Are we ready? Are we steady? Well, it looks like we are about to go green here. And it's a good start from Whitehead pulling away from Ebrich in the initial foray as Fuzzy looking to try and get towards the inside as that's Cecilia Sanchez uh, breathing all, well, swerving all over the back of Marcel Fuzzy as it's all rather straightforward two by two as there's been one car that's the Mercedes that's the Leipert car one of the McLarens off to the left hand side and that's coming through Riches so uh, and there's a Janetta a, 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 there's a lone and wild Janetta making its way through into Wilson's uh, but uh, good start by uh, the top five well looks like Alex Leif has had an absolutely dynamite start uh, he put it up to P8 he's now uh, well, he's in P8 at the moment. He's actually up into P5, as there's Guillaume uh, Exposito a bit further down uh, the order. He's uh, rounding out the top 13. He's closing on Samir Fosch, as there's uh, drivers trying to make moves up the inside through into Agostini. But now, Jan Niklas Ebrich is being closed in on by Marcel Fuzzi with uh, Jose Manuel Cecilia Sanchez rounding out the top four. But Luke Whitehead initially, Dan, has got a slight getaway. And the gap between him and Jan Niklas Ebrich is just over half a second. I say half a second. It's quite a lot. But at the same time, though, you still got to be careful. Like Whitehead, he cannot let off at this point, especially with how close it was in qualifying. Uh, yes, he does have an advantage, especially going down the straights now. But he's got to make sure it's actually extended now. So it's just under eight tenths of a second. So that was just all the way down that straight. Um, Everett and Fusey are just having, they've got their foot absolutely pinned to the floor, uh, but, but yet at the same time, it can't unfortunately um, really give more um, than it is. And the Porsche is very, very quick uh, compared to the Alpine. So I wonder if potentially if Fusey and Ebrick they're going to have a bit of a, uh, I don't think there's going to be bad. All we see an accident going through bottom right corner of your screen. Who was that? That was the number, Gurgle. uh, number yeah, 11. Gurgle. Yeah, Gurgley Consabo. Now, was the other car? I think it might have been an. I couldn't really make out whether it was an Aston or a BMW. So that would be uh, Benjamin Letalek uh, in 18th. So that was a clash over 18th position. Um, not how Benjamin Letalek wanted his second race to go, and that now drops him all the way down to stone dead last in the number 10 Porsche. So Benjamin Natalek uh, will definitely be um, not very, well, he'll be rather disgruntled about that one, uh, to say the very least. Maybe a few choice words. Oh, oh that was an accident going through. Oh, so uh, there's been more dramas. Oh, and um, yeah, I, I'm actually getting, uh, uh, I just heard that Michael Hamlet has just said that he's actually had a little bit of a, a hit as well in the 95 Audi going through Riches as more drivers are going a bit wide that is going through Palmer's and through into Agostini there's Samuel Fosch who's got uh, Pasquale De Luca uh, Exposito just behind him in the McLaren 570 GT4 Conrad Kula who started in sixth position now has tumbled all the way down to 14th uh, as you can now see that they're making their way through in what is Oggies and then through into the right hander through into Palmer's that will bring them on to the Bentley Straits and Luke Whitehead already getting an advantage over Jan Niklas Ebrich with Marcel Fusi rounding out the top three, Jose Man Manuel Cecilia Sanchez rounding out the top four, Alex Leif rounding out the top five, Simon Hamzir, Paolo Lima, Kieran Prendergast, Samir Fosh in the very, very bright year. Now that looks like a, a wrap as all. Well. Now there's been a moment, that is Jan Niklas Ebrich and Marcel Fusi. They've had a moment as that is De Luca trying to go around the outside. That's going through the bomb hole and into Coram or Marcel Fusi. Oh my goodness me. And now, that's a great switchback if De Luca gets that before Murray's. But uh, Marcel Fusi not allowing that to happen as Samir Foch closes in. And that means that Cecilia Sanchez and Alex Leif now round out the top three. Make that a top four for Porsche, courtesy of Simon Ramsey so dramas there i think it looked like there was a moment between jan niklas ebrich and marcel fuzzi because fuzzi was not that far behind no indeed we just saw obviously the tail end of that so 
as you might see a different camera angle of what actually happened but yeah not ideal look like coming out of that was coming out of nelson so again potentially might not have been any fault of any ones just to maybe one of them dipped a wood on the grass sent the other one round and they were collected i mean there, there could be several different things i'm um, going through but not ideal actually we're going to have a replay so let's see what happens oh i think we just got tapped well that but you know what that was a a, a, a lot of things happened actually a lot of things happened there to be fair oh this yeah. was actually going into turn one sorry this was at the start of the race yeah um, cold hard cooler got a turn around because uh, he's the one with the uh, the bright tangerine orange uh, on the uh, on the front and also on the door cards of that alpine 110 he's currently in 13th place as there is kieran prendergast he's closing on paulo lima so it's ktm versus uh, BMW, but KTM in some respects has an Audi power plant in the back end of that thing, so uh, it is a bit Audi esque, a 1.8 turbo to turbocharged engine, uh, push, pushing out more than what an Audi TT would have in there. But uh, they've also got Oscar Saristo uh, closing in. The Finn uh, started in what would have been 11th position, but now up into 7th as Alex Leif is trying to get a wriggle on and closing on to Jose Manuel Cecilia Sanchez. Uh, Yannick Lassebri still ahead of Marcel Fusi. That's the battle for 8th and 9th, respectively. And uh, Marcel Fusi, out of all the cars, Dan, has just gone purple in Sector 2. I mean, to be fair, uh, fair enough. I did not expect um, a car that's not necessarily used that much. I did not expect that, to be fair, um, with the KTM. So, brilliant. I mean, the top five. Oh, we've got a replay here. Is this going to be... Who is this? This is... Michael ah, Hamlet. This is Hamlet. So just going, oh, two cars to not fit into one gap, unfortunately. And um, that was, and yeah, that was a McLaren on the other side of him. So Michael Hamlet got a bit of a, a, a bit of a welcome to Snetterton moment right there, and then going through to. Um, but I think the thing is, the McLaren. I, I mean, Michael was trying to turn in there at the, and it was it was basically side by side. So I think Michael had the right of way going through into Riches, and the McLaren just unnecessarily hit him there, but probably turned in and didn't see him. Yeah, possibly. Again, it's one of those things where, you know, different camera angles to, to play different things. But yeah, it looked like Hamlet was up the inside going through or in a position um, to go through. So, yeah, just a bit of an unfortunate contact. Um, so not ideal, um, but uh, hopefully both drivers are still um, on their way. I believe both drivers are still going, So, which is the main thing. Uh, that's obviously um, what we want. Uh, so Jan Nicholas um, Ebrick, he's trying to make his move back up now. He's, got, he's currently in P8. He's got Ramsayer currently ahead. And he's going to try and want to dispatch of him nice and quickly. He's very nearly up the inside. I thought he was going to potentially have a move going through Williams. He still might have a move going through Williams. Do you know what? He's gone and done it. That's a very, very brave move, especially when you've got now all of the Bentley straight where you're going to get eaten up by... Actually, as I was saying that, look at that. That's uh, uh, Marcel Fusi that's going to have a go on Ramsey as well. So is Ramsey going to lose two positions in one? Do you know what? The Alpine's actually pulling away from the Porsche. He's got a very, very good run going through. But, oh, no. That was a bit of contact there between Fusi and Ramsey. So what happened there? Again, I think it was just a case of two cars who not fit into one position. Although Fusey has actually got ahead. He's going to have to give up one position um, and potentially uh, two. So actually, it doesn't look like he's actually he's giving it up. So they're going to go side by side, go into quorum. As I say that, Ramsayer has made his own excursion and he's making up his own track, uh, his own rallycross track at the moment, going through quorum. So I, I'm not really sure what to make of that. I don't think Fusey can do much else than that. He tried to, I think, was going to let him by. But uh, Ramsey had his uh, unfortunate excursion on his own accord. Yeah, I think both Fusi and Ramsey did a bit of uh, Bottas grass cutting special here at Snetterton. Uh, one going through. So we're going to have a look at a replay here. And this is from earlier. Now, this is when Ramsey was behind Alex Leif. And oh, now that's not where you want to do that, is it? So Simon Ramsey already had a moment. And that brought him into the path of the likes of uh, Jan Niklas Ebrich who managed to get through on the inside of Williams. So that would have been coming through Palmer's. So Ramsey has really been put under the kibosh as here is um, Guillem Exposito. He's battling away with quite a few drivers, one of which is Konrad Kula in the number two Alpine just up ahead. And then you've also got Barzaghi in the number three as they're now making their way through Agostini. Uh, but still plenty of this race still to go. And I don't think we're done yet. No, this is very, very true. We're definitely not done yet. So 21 minutes left to go. And then we're going to be... Uh, so there's going to be a lot more action. I am 100% sure. Uh, so Guillaume uh, Exposito, currently the one of the only two McLarens on the grid. I do have a soft spot for McLarens. I really enjoy driving. It's a very, very good car. Um, what on earth? That was something... Uh, looked like a barrier potential, something in the... Uh, 
uh, just going through on the exit of Williams. I'm not entirely sure what that was, but uh, you know, Max Bazzi, he's having to defend um, from that is uh, bizarre. Uh, that is Bazzaghi, I believe. He's having to defend from. But well, the gap's not too bad, though. It's been even Stevens now. He's actually trying to push. Um, that's Conrad Kula. So this battle is really starting to kick off. This is the battle, I believe, for P10. And it's quite a big train going through. So as soon as uh, the guys start batting, that's, um, I believe, the number 243 and the number 8 Mercedes and um, Chevrolet. As long as they start battling, it's going to put that grid back up. This is the incident between Fusey. Ah, I think Fusey just didn't expect the Porsche of Ramsey to actually be there. Um, so I don't think, to be fair, that was anything that Ramsey could have actually done at that moment in time. Uh, they were pretty much side by side going through into Brundles and then into Nelson. So Ramsey had effectively de facto uh, racing line priority going through into Brundles. But then if Fuzi had, you know, maybe braked a little bit later or maybe a bit earlier, he might have been able to keep that through as... Oh, that was uh, nearly a move there. Samir Fosh runs wide coming out. Oh, and he tanks with Exposito and Samir Fosh. Now, that was possibly because of Conrad Kula going up the inside as he was trying to battle away with Felix F. So, Samir Fosh has been uh, left out high and dry going through the exit of Wilson's as Exposito now trying to uh, fight his way back past Barzaghi in the number three. And then you've got Tom Otty. Now, Otty... Where did he start? 21st. So Tom Otty has made up nine places. So he's kept his cool. He's kept his head whilst others have lost theirs. But Felix F from Poland uh, doing a good job at the moment. He's 4.1 seconds behind Simon Ramsey, uh, who is now uh, six tenths behind Marcel Fusi. Oh, that's a run wide. And that was coming out of Oggies. And uh, Conrad Kula says, yep, thank you very much. Such a gentleman opening the door for me like that. Well, I think he needs no second invitation, does he, to be fair? And I don't think anyone would be in that position where they're going to need a second invitation. They're going to be wanting to make the position um, and use any opportunity that they are given. So Dario Bazaghi, he's going to try and now get back past Otti. It's very, very close again. I'm just looking up ahead. Um, it's it's opened up a little bit now. So Conrad Cooley, he's got a bit of a gap now. Um, to that is uh, 7243 Mercedes. Is it going to be to see Bazagi? Is he going to try and go around the outside? I thought he was going to try and go around the outside um, of Corum, which is a very, very brave move at the best of times. But he's now having to defend, possibly having to defend from Exposito and also Gribov as well. So this battle's really kicking off. Bazagi, I don't think, again, he's in a bit of an awkward position here as well. That was uh, Seth. He's going to go on the defensive. Is Otti going to try and go around the outside going into turn one? He's going to have a look. They're side by side. I don't really think he can actually do much rather than pin it on the outside. He's given it a go, though. And you know what? He might have actually done it. Oh, a bit of contact. Oh, no. Barzaghi got cut. He just got collected completely out of his own fault. Um, no fault at all from him. And he got collected up in that incident. That was a bit of a shame. I mean, that was that was unfortunate, I think, to say the least. That was really, really unfortunate for those two guys. Um, yeah. I, it, it's hard to really... It's hard to go through that, wasn't it? it? It's really hard to break that one down, especially lives. That's probably one that the stewards will look at, I'm sure. Yeah, I think it was also the fact that Felix F was going up the inside of Tom Otti. Otti's returned to garage, so his race is done and dusted. That BMW uh, has ended up being rather second-hand and uh, in, well, needing a virtual repair bill. So Tom Otti will get the virtual invoice from the suppliers a bit later on tonight. But that's allowed Sammy Fosch to have a bit more uh, opportunity of getting past drivers. But there is uh, Alves, Barazaghi, Multu also battling away. And this is for position. This is bringing... Uh, oh, my goodness me. They know Hessa. You brought the highlights of colours here to Snetterson today. And they're glowing in the, uh, the sunset as he looks up the inside of uh, Multu in the number 77. As again, Barazaghi runs wide. That was coming out of Williams. So now, indeed, this is going to be Bazzaghi. He's actually lost out now to that is. I'm trying to think who that is. The BMW. That's the number 19. Actually, that's not the number 19. Sorry, that's the uh, that's position, I believe. So that is Razar. Uh, we get the Brighton car. That was th well, I thought I was going to be three wide. Look, three wide from that camera. It's actually going to be three wide going through um, into uh, the bomb hole. And again, all the two cars don't go into one there, chaps. That was, I uh, can't quite think who that was behind. That was um, Gurgli uh, Kunzabo. So going too wide to the bottom. I mean, that's that's tricky at the best of times there. It's tricky going through on your own, uh, let alone when you've got another car on the inside of you. So uh, great racing from these guys, which is really good. But this is what we want to see, isn't it? This is the battles that we enjoy seeing. And this is the battles that we consistently see 
in uh, events with the sim grid and it's really really great to see look at that that's marcel fusi going to try and go up the inside alpine versus alpine now going through in to palmer who's more that comes out on top i think it's going to be everett because he's going to have the run he's going to probably push actually no they're giving each other both enough room they're still side by side going through into agostini so alpine versus alpine but look at behind you've got ramsay he's going to want to try and capitalize on these guys slowing themselves down which they are really slowing them down quite heavily and fusey has to now dart back in well as i said that he tries to now go back up the inside <laughs> alex oh my goodness yeah. he can't leave it alone well, I think at the end of the day, there's a bit of bad blood between Marcel Fusi and uh, Simon Ramsay because the red mist is down as we're approaching the halfway point. All oh, nearly three wide going through Agostini. And that was uh, Benjamin Letalek uh, going uh, exit stage right coming out of the corner. Uh, so that is Barzaghi ahead of Kunsabo. And that is the 77 of Mike Mutu. Uh, they're battling away over what is effectively 19th position as Mutu sends it up the inside of Gurgli Kunsabo. That was going through Oggies now into the right hander here at Palmer's. And Mutu could have a good run. He might have a double toe going down the Bentley Strait. Uh, it's a little bit further up the, the road. Um, we've also got uh, Francisco Mazzoni battling away with Gurgli Kunsabo. So that's McLaren versus BMW is now Oscar Saristo getting a wriggle on he's gotten up close and personal with um, Paulo Lima and not too far ahead is Kieran Prendergast so this is really getting interesting oh Paulo Lima runs wide coming out of Murray's and that could give the writer engineering developed uh, Chevy Camaro GT4 an opportunity to get past but it won't be through riches. I think wait until the Bentley straight next time around. If Salista gets a run on Lima, he's going to have a good opportunity. But look in his rearview mirror. Jan Niklas Ebrich and Marcel Fusi looking to get past as Jan Niklas Ebrich all oh, tangles with the outside of Oscar Saristo and that nearly gives an opportunity for Marcel Fusi to get through. But then Simon Ramsay will have the run going into Palmer's on the Alpine, the number 94. And that was rather, rather close between those three drivers. And still, it is waging on. It's like children battling over the last swing in the playground and expecting to be swung on it as well. I know, indeed. Look at that, Saristo. He's gone wide. That's allowed Everett to go through. That's definitely what Fusey, uh, not what Fusey wanted. Because he had that moment going through into turn two. Couldn't really do much about it, unfortunately. He just got left to almost hung out to dry. He had to break, had to back out of it. And he's lost the position to Ramsev. He's going to fly up the inside. I thought he was going to. As yet, he uh, has to take to the gravel on the inside there. As Ramsev was very, very heavily defending um, going through into Oggies. So, yeah, this is what um, Fusey didn't want. Because um, himself and Abrick, they both had some good momentum. They were pushing forward. That's now, uh, look at the gap now. You've got two cars uh, now in between um, Ramsev uh, and Abrick. So, who is uh, how quickly uh, is he going to be able to get um, past if he's going to be able to get past he's very very late on the brakes here but I think he's got a little bit too wide so he's gone even wide uh, he's gone very very wide going through into Nelson so he's dropped a little bit more time uh, I think this lap is uh, upset Fusey a little bit of, of sorts he's just got to try and gain his composure back now settle down allow the car to come back he could have also had maybe a bit um, he's maybe taken too much out of his tires as well the tires are a little bit too hot so he's got to try and sort of um, bring those down back to temperature there's a couple of things there but he's got a probably he's got 12 minutes left of the race i think alex so he's got a bit of time to compose himself let also as well ramsay and Ceristo. these guys are going to potentially have a battle going through so ramsay is going to have to go around the outside because Ceristo is not going to give him any move uh, any position at all he's going to give it a good old go but doesn't quite make it is he going to be on the inside going through into wilson no because Ceristo, look at fusi now he's going to just capitalize on this opportunity right up the inside of ramsay what a move that was there for fusi needed no second invitation and i think alex he actually caught him off guard a little bit he did but yann niklas every has also caught off uh, caught paulo lima off guard as well and that's the battle for fifth position on the road and also Mazzoni looks to have a 10 second time penalty i would say that's for avoidable contact as you can now see, there's Paolo Lima and Jan Niklas Ebrich. They're going through Agostini's and then the run down to Hamilton. And Jan Niklas Ebrich, very, very steely determined. I've uh, commentated on him on other leagues using a Seto Crosso Competizione. And he's using as much as the track as he dare. Oh, he tags the back right of Paolo Lima. And that nearly catches out Oscar Saristo, Marcel Fusi and Simon Ramsey. Well, Ramsey has been the one that's been most compromised, and that, that's going through Williams. Paulo Lima from Portugal manages to hang on to the car being all crossed up and going a bit tank slappery, uh, coming out of Williams, going onto the Bentley Straight. 
But, uh, well, that is definitely what you don't want as Fuzzy gets uh, one sent up the inside by Paolo Lima. This could be rather ugly very, very quickly, but Lima gives Fuzzy enough racing rooms. Ramsey again has uh, the door well and truly shut in the vicinity of the front bumper of that Porsche 718 came in 10 and a half minutes still to go and well when they say that when you say that you're not talking much about the leader Luke Whitehead has now got a 9.75 second lead ahead of Jose Manuel Cecilia Sanchez and we've still got 10 minutes to go Whitehead is running in the 157s as now we head back to the battle for P3 it's a three it's a top three lockout at the moment for Porsche but will Kieran Prendergast in the number 29 KTM crossbow GT4 have anything to say about it as now we hit the final third of the race it's still all to play for it is indeed so Prendergast what is he going to do this is where he's going to really excel going through into this second uh, into the uh, the second sector in the infield the 300 section the uh, the more recent um, section of Snetterton um, so to be fair, if it was the old SNES, if it was the old 200 layout, I think the KTM may struggle a little bit. But this infill section really does help the uh, more nimble cars. And he's actually, he has caught up a little bit. He has indeed caught up. It's not by much. It's only by about half a tenth, but he's caught up nevertheless. So he's not dropping back at all. Could be biding his time here, seeing as well. Um, overtakes don't necessarily, unless, you're, unless your name is Marcel Fusey, overtakes don't normally happen um, sort of uh, last minute. Uh, you normally have to prepare for them. You normally have to sort of see and work out where you're quicker, where you're slower, and then time um, your overtake uh, as best you can. It doesn't work all of the time, uh, but you've got to make sure that you uh, time it as best you can. Speaking of Marcel Fusi, is he going to be making a move on Solisto? It's going to be, if the move is going to be made, we know how late it is on the brakes. He goes for a look. He may be potentially alongside. Doesn't quite do it, though, this time around. This is when the Camaro, again, the Chevrolet, really utilizes the speed. Whoa, touring car style. Two was on the grass. Tries to shut the door on Fusey, but he can't quite do it because Fusey's already at the inside. They're going to go too wide through the bomb hole. Who's going to come out on top? It's still Saristo. So considering he got a corner beforehand, he was still two wheels up in the air. He's managed to maintain that. Uh, position. He's still managing oh. P6, but Fusey, though, has got a 15-second penalty, uh, and that's pretty much put him out of contention for almost, to be fair, I think, maybe the top 15. Yeah, very much the case. I mean, that was full-on Night Rider send going through Nelson's by Sarista. There, he kept it planted, did a did a proper good move move there and the power of the uh as again Fusey looking up the inside. Oh, he looks like he's oh, he, he's lost the back end of that. Oh my goodness. And Oscar Saristo again gets the opportunity to stay in front of the Hungarian as Paolo Lima gets turned around by Simon Ramsey on the middle of Wilson's. And here comes Konrad Kula. So Paolo Lima's work has just been undone, courtesy of Simon Ramsey, as Marcel Fuzzi again, this time going through. Uh, that is in through to Palm. Well, it's through into Palm as he's just gone. They're on the run down to Agostini. So Marcel Fuzzi has a 15 second time penalty. I would imagine that's possibly for an incident between him and Jan Niklas Ebrich. Uh, obviously when we saw the two having that moment earlier on in the race going through Brundles and Nelsons. Yeah, I think to be fair, I was actually just thinking there as well with the uh, with the amount of contact um, and the amount of sort of uh, door bashing that uh, Fuzzi and Cerise are going to, they're going to have different, they're going to have each other's liveries on their own car uh, by, the, uh, by the end of this race. Uh, but at the moment, yeah, Marcel Fusi, I, I mean now, he just needs to drive as quick as he can for the remaining seven minutes because, I mean, a 15-second gap, that is, I mean, yeah, that's the top 15. Uh, that's top 15 out of the question, potentially even more uh, than that. But at the moment, he's uh, broken the toe, I think, a little bit. He's, he's far enough ahead of Saristo now that he's not really going to be um, in any position to be challenged. So as we've got that instant on lap two involver cars, 94 and 299 a 15 second penalty for avoidable contact so there we are it's just on your screen now so yes Marcel Fusey p6 on track but it will not be like that at the end of the race um, and actually also Alex I'm gonna completely take back my comment that I said about um, Luke Whitehead uh, gonna have a, a bit more of a difficult time to maintain that p1 uh, because of the gap is about 10 seconds or mirrors makes no difference so I'm just gonna quickly forget about that comment um, and, uh, and move forward but yeah I mean Whitehead is just like yeah, we haven't seen him on screen at all but I said I'm sure he's not gonna be complaining he had plenty of screen time in the GT3s and uh, I'm sure he'd rather have the uh, I'd always rather have the uh, P1 currently um, at the moment yeah there's Felix Steph and he's being closed in on uh, that looks to be 
well, it looks like he's been passed by Benjamin Letelek. That's Pasquale Di Luqua, uh, also in for a second helping of Super Saturday action, this time in the KTM Crossbow GT4. As Felix F runs a little bit wide coming out of uh, Riches, that could have allowed Di Luqua to go up the inside through into Wilson, but on that particular occasion, as we've now got Denis Gribov has got a drive-through penalty, the number 27 Mercedes. Uh, so uh, not as many penalties as we had in the Bentley Challenge a little bit earlier on. But I would imagine that's possibly for avoidable contact or maybe track limits, one of the two. Hopefully have that confirmed very shortly. We're into the last five minutes and Luke Whitehead has now got a 10 second advantage over the number 67 of Jose Manuel Cecilia Sanchez. So it is. And also Alexander uh, Alex Leif in the TPC Sim Racing. Uh, Porsche, that's a top three K, uh, 718 Cayman lockout and Kieran Prendergast doing a really good job in fourth place but now Felix F really feeling the heat under the collar as they go through Williams as uh, Pasquale Di Luqua in the number 33 trying to close him down, the KTM pulls to the right hand side on the Bentley straight as there is a little bit of a Battle Royale, three abreast, so there's a Mercedes meet in the Porsche sandwich and in the middle of that was Gurgli Kunsavo, so you had um, Mike Mutu and uh, Benjamin Litalek, uh, one side, either side of the car, and Litalek now up into 17th position. Oh, now we've had a drama for Luke Whitehead. Luke Whitehead was leading, and the car's now in the pits. Now I'm wondering, it's one of two things. Has he had a disconnect, or has it been that hand injury that might have caused him a problem? Because that now means that Jose Manuel Cecilia Sanchez is in the lead with four minutes to go, and what's more, Alex Leif has been running quicker than them, so this has changed the dynamic of this race completely. The gap is now 1.9 seconds between first and second position. Alex Leif has now brought that down to 1.6. So Jose Manuel Cecilia Sanchez here, Dan, needs to get a rigel on, needs to get the lap times in. Uh, so that's the 33 of De Luca that's just uh, got around on the exit of Riches. But now Alex Leif has an opportunity to close in on Cecilia Sanchez for the GT4 Cup victory here at Snetterton. I know it's going to be, it's going to be close in that this is a replay here of the number seven car. So we think we just got the tail end uh, of that. Yes, so uh, number seven car um, of Luke Whitehead, who was unfortunately um, not uh, not ideal at all. We definitely didn't want that. But look at that. Benjamin uh, Letelet currently in P15. He's got six tenths of a gap uh, behind him um, from himself and Mutu. But he's also got... Uh, 4.6 second which may seem like quite a lot but if you look at that Mazzoni he's got a 10 second penalty so he won't actually uh, that will be a position promoted um, for the select if he can maintain this P15 so that will bring him up to P14 it will actually bring Mutu up as well because um, he is close enough also so that will bring him up um, as well so Prendergast now into P3 so Porsche 1-2 Prendergast in P3 with the KTM again a car that I did not expect to see on the podium but Prendergast is really um, utilizing uh, the uh, uh, well, he's actually he might even get potentially P2. It depends how uh, you know, last closing stage of this race we could see uh, anything happen. We already have, so there could be plenty more action going through. Uh, Fusey has increased his lead over Ceristo, but again, it's all in vain. But what's Ramsey going to do? He's going to try and go darts to the inside, can't quite make it, darts to the outside, but that is not ideal, not what he wants. That's going to be in a met with a wall, and that's a hefty hit. And he manages to keep it going with minimal. Oh, I suppose minimal time loss for what had happened takes out two boards um, on the way. So yeah, he's trying to off put, he's trying to put off other people by taking out the breaking boards. So a uh, tactical there, I think there from Ramsey. But yeah, not what he wanted to do. I think he just, I'm guessing he tried to put. We were steering probably as he was braking, so the tires just got overloaded. The tires were just overwhelmed and almost just couldn't. I think the car was a bit unbalanced there in the braking zone. So not ideal. Again, he's now dropped down to P8. So all that work that he's just done yet again has been undone. Yeah, it looked like quite a lot of front end understeer because when you try and turn and you're loading up the front, you're loading up the front and the rear at the same time, especially with trying to carry that momentum through. I think it was the front end understeer that just sort of went, "Yeah, you're just going straight on," and all of a sudden, bang, Ramsay hits the wall. And you know, it's not his first excursion off this track in this particular race. Obviously, we saw earlier on. Um, you know, the contact between him and Marcel Fusi, but Kieran Prendergast is fast running out of time. Now, is that the leader just up ahead of them? I think that is uh, Cecilia Sanchez. So 
The gap was around about two seconds between first and second position, but Kieran Prendergast at one point was just under two tenths behind Alex Leaf as they now go through into uh, Coram. Well, they're coming, exiting through Coram into the left at Murray's. So this is going to be the, fine, the, fifth, uh, the 16th and final lap of this uh, GT4 Cup race here at Snetterton. And the server time reflecting uh, local times in terms of, uh, well, it's 7.09, 7.10 uh, p.m. on the server. And you can see that Kieran Brendergast trying to do his level best as uh, Jose Manuel Cecilia Sanchez goes on to the final lap of the race. Uh, after disaster for Luke Whitehead. Um, Alex Leif is uh, 1.9 seconds behind. Oh, Conrad Kula whacks the curbs going through Riches. And it spins the Alpine out of uh, what would what was seventh position. He was looking to close up on Saristo on that particular moment in time. But the lead is now making their way through into Agostini. Um, but Alex Leif has closed in on Cecilia Sanchez. The gap now one and a half seconds. But the thing is, is that... At, as the time is now struck zero, it's going to be bet the battle between second and third that is really going to be wetting our appetites in the final few corners as they go through Oggies, then into the right hand up at uh, Williams to put them onto the Bentley straight for the final time. And uh, I think here, Dan, Alex Slaver has got, got to watch his six because here comes Kieran Prendergast. Well, if Brenda Garza is going to do it, he's going to have to be now. I doubt he's going to be able to make the move going through to Murray's, which is the next most logical overtaking position. He's not far. He's not close enough, though. The gap's half a second still. So the Porsche, again, utilizing the straight line speed that it's got. And the KTM, it's great through the corners. He's caught up all of that time, but I don't think it's going to be enough. As long as Leaf defends going through Murray's, I think he's going to be... Okay, big sideways moment there from Brenda Garza. So he is going to be... Um, his tyres are going to be very, very warm indeed. That's going to hurt. Again, four wheels sliding through there. But he can't do it, though. I don't think he's managed to do it. And he needs to get, as long as he negotiates it. But look at that. Jose uh, Manuel Cecilia Sanchez taking the GT4 victory. A great drive there. And it goes to show that as long as you keep hitting, keep hitting consistency, anything can happen. Yep, so the Spaniard takes the victory. Alex Leif runs out the top two with Kieran Prendergast in third place. Jan Niklas Ebrich in fourth marcel fuzzi on the road fifth however that will drop him quite a considerable way down the order oscar saristo so i'm just looking at it now saristo sixth lima seventh ramsayer has a 30 second time penalty post race oh uh, and Pitts. so uh, he's not going to be in the top 10 so i would reckon that marcel fuzzi just looking at that so so you're probably talking maybe just out, probably top 12 for Marcel Fuzzi. But uh, um, Jose Manuel Cecilia Sanchez, again, uh, you know, just showcasing that the consistency is is there. Um, and, and it's a real shame. What I want to do, and I know he's sitting in the waiting to interview area. Let, let, let's get him in. I've already spoken to him once today, but I want to find out from the man himself what happened. So... Uh, leading by over 10 seconds with a few laps to go and you know it was a real shame but let's bring in Luke Whitehead uh, Luke sorry to, I, I did see you in the waiting to interview bit but um, I just want to yeah. know what happened what happened mate you were you were leading you were on course for victory you know a second in the Bentleys and on course for victory what happened um, well I, midway through the race, I started having an issue with my wheel, where it was just randomly shifting down my gear, on my gears. Um, it's happened before, and it usually happens when it gets hot. Um, but that basically was happening, and it got to a stage where, I, one, I couldn't drive it, so I was losing about three, two seconds a lap. And then at the end, it blew my engine up. Oh. Um, so I, if that hadn't happened, I would have won that race. Um, I had that win, uh, which is very 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 frustrating um you know especially because i jumped in you know from the bentley and i'd had the issue and i thought i'd fixed it before the race um and obviously that wasn't the case so you know and, and also i've never driven the gt4 car around that track and i don't i've only driven it i think three or four times before um so i was very really inexperienced in gt4 and to, to be honest i was quite surprised at the pace i had but you know unfortunately that didn't seem to you know matter in the end uh, but you know it happens it's one of those things um but yeah, um, I don't know whether I'll be able to do the Super Trofeo when I was entered, but looking at this wheel issue, I can't. I haven't got it fixed yet. Um, 
I've plugged in a new lead and it's just not registering anything now. So, yeah, not looking great, but <laughs> it is what it is. So I enjoyed the race nonetheless. Well, if we don't see you for the Super Trophies in a few moments' time, buddy, we look forward to seeing you in Hamada back for round four at the Hungar Ring for, for Sprint Cup this coming Thursday. Yeah, well, I'm really excited for that one because I, I like the track. I know the Ferrari is very strong there, unless it's been nerfed and no updates have been released recently. Um, but then again, I don't know how it goes. Um, and, you know, hopefully my wheel will be fixed because obviously we'll have no ballast as well after the the race I'd rather not talk about. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah um, I'm yeah. excited nonetheless, but um, we'll see how it goes. Hopefully I can get this stuff fixed. Okay, Luke. Well, if we don't see you for the Super Trophies, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you for racing with us today. And we look forward, myself and David, look forward to seeing you on, uh, well, seeing you and Hamada in action on Thursday night. No worries. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everyone, for watching. So, a real shame there, Dan, for Luke Whitehead. Um, downshift issue caused by the steering wheel and then blows the engine. I, I, I mean, to be fair, I feel I feel the pain that Luke White is feeling now because I've been in exactly in that position before. And it's 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 almost easier when the incident is with yourself to blame. I think when it's something out of your control, it's even it's it's just that much more frustrating. Um, so I've definitely been there, and yeah, it is the most frustrating thing in the world. But I mean, to be fair, good uh, run, definitely some positive to take away from it. But yeah, look at that, as you might Cecilia Sanchez. A, a very last minute win, but like I said, consistency is key. You never know what can happen, whether it's at, whether it is in your control or not in your control. And uh, it's obviously, it's worked out. Indeed, indeed. Well, that is the second of three support races here on the SimGrid Super Saturday from the virtual recreation of the Snetterton 300 circuit. Myself, Alex Goldschmidt, and um, everyone's asking, is Jose going to be there for interview? Uh, well, we haven't heard from him, but we're going to go to a brief commercial break and we'll be back in just a couple of moments time as we prepare ourselves for the roar of Super Trofeos, Lamborghinis, of course, here on the SimGrid. Well, it's time for the third and final support race here on SimGrid Super Saturday here at Snetterton. Alex Goldschmidt and Daniel Hand over here with you once again. Daniel, now this time we get pure Italian thoroughbreds around this circuit. The Lamborghini Super Trofeo is all producing around about 620 brake horsepower from their 5.2 litre V10 naturally aspirated engine. And it looks like we've got a bumper grid as well. 
I mean, to be fair, as uh, as racing goes, as cars go, I think there aren't many. Uh, there's not many better grid sounds uh, than twenty odd screaming V10. So I'm very excited. I've actually commented. It's one of my first times I ever commentated um, with the sim grid. Was actually on one of the uh, Super Trofeo events. I believe it was for one of the very first Super Saturdays. So it's great to be back, and it's also great to be uh, commentating as well on, uh, like I said, my first ever opportunity with the sim grid in these Super Trofeos. Uh, fantastic car. Really, really good, uh, fun car to drive. And again, I think an one of the ones, an odd pairing, I think, for Sneston, um, but I think it's going to be a very, very good pairing. Yeah, I think so. Obviously, we've had um, two different pole sitters. We've had two different winners here today. Um, and to be completely honest with you, uh, at the moment, free practice is uh, currently underway for the Super Trofeos, and no surprise, Marcel Fusi is leading the way at the, this particular moment in time. Obviously, um, a very, very hard-fought race for the Hungarian, but he's currently, uh, well, he's over half a second up on the number 71 of uh, Christian Innocente. Uh, we've got uh, Pro and Am drivers in this field. Uh, so, um, and I'm just keeping an eye. Well, Luke Whitehead is showing his registered on the grid, so we'll see whether his uh, steering wheel issues uh, are more than just a, not more than just a mere trifle to deal with. Obviously, um, good to hear from him as such as we're on board now with Marcel Fusi. And one of the other things here is that the sun is beginning to set at 7.15 p.m. on the server, Dan. That's going to cause a little bit of a new dimension for these drivers, especially with those that have already been in the previous two races. Yeah, exactly. And there's lots of things that uh, there's lots of things that changes, lots of different variables as well. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, that's obviously uh, one of them. I think as well, it's for the people that okay, it's another adaptation of the people that are in the GT4s. They're now having to go back to GT3s, where a car you can be a little bit more aggressive on. You can be uh, everything's just turned up that little bit more. It's all turned up to 11. Uh, GT4s, they're quick cars, um, and they are quick cars. You know, but like I keep saying, they are very much based much more on the road going, uh, the road going versions. So. Yeah, everything's just dialed up um, a little bit more. But, I mean, these cars look absolutely fantastic. One of the best GT cars, personally, I think. Um, now, I'm a Porsche fan. I'm a Porsche fan through and through. I absolutely love uh, the 911 uh, GT3 car. But I have to admit, this is one of the best-looking GT cars I think I've ever seen. Personally, that's that's from my benefit. That's, that's from what I feel anyway. Yeah, one of the uh, premier um, one-make series when it comes to tin tops or sports cars. As there's, uh, oh, good to see Team Cake being represented in this one. Good old Sebastian Handler back with us once again. Um, amongst with a few uh, other drivers as well. So seven and a half minutes to go in this practice session. As we've now had the number 29. Uh, well, Kieran Prendergast, he's back again for a third helping. Uh, not just seconds, it's third, sir, uh, this evening. Conrad Kuhl has just gone second, three and a half tenths slower than Marcel Fusi. Cristiano Nocente uh, rounds out the top four ahead of uh, Benjamin Letalek from France. Mark Gibson, uh, Vesa Latinen, uh, we've got Luca Tor uh, Torosani and uh, Otto Kuhlberg as well. Uh, in this mix. Uh, then you've also got uh, Zamfir Radu, who we've actually seen for both previous races, but is actually, that's the quickest that I think that this driver I've seen in any sort of practice or qualifying session. Um, I think he's from Romania, to be completely honest with you, but uh, shows that, um, as we said earlier on, everything on SimGrid is here for everybody. Yeah, exactly. There is something for everyone. There's uh you know, whatever you want to drive, then there is <clears throat> there is something um, for you. But as you're saying, Alex, like the premier, like one of the very, very, one of the top, top um, types of GT racing, one of the most prestigious as well, is the Super Trofeo. And to be able to race it, actually, in the sim, um, with obviously, you know, you've got what, 20, 25 other um, GT, uh, the Lamborghini GT3 cars. I mean, to be fair, there's, oh, there's someone had a small excursion making up their own track at the moment. Can't quite see who that was. Um, but they uh, hopefully come back um, on track. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's the amount of variability that everyone's got, and I think that's a good thing as well. It's making sure that you can keep, you know, everyone has their own different um, likes, what they like to drive, and I think being able to provide something for everyone is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so we've got just over five minute, five and a half minutes to go in this uh, final free practice session. And Marcel Fusi, um, his first lap out in the Super Trofeo. Now, 
The statistic for Marcel Fusi is thus. In any Lamborghini Super Trofeo race that he has competed in on Super Saturday here on the SimGrid, he has placed no lower than second. Now, I'll be completely honest, he's he's had uh <laughs> what has he had today? He's had a sixth, he's probably had a twelfth place. Now He's got this and the best of British 2.4 hour season finale this evening. So when you look at it, that's 2 hours and 24 minutes. So that's, and he's also been racing before this as well. So he's raced for over, within the last sort of, um, when, you, when you get to the end of it all, he'll have raced for more than 8 hours. And he... He, he is like a complete glutton for punishment, but he is our Mr. Super Saturday after all. I mean, to be fair as well, it, it, again, it's a skill to have, isn't it? Being able to, to put yourself to, to so many different, uh, to so many different cards. Like, so you've gone from GT3 to GT4, back to GT3 again. I mean, that's a tall order to fill, especially with the uh, with the results that he has had in these past Super Trofeo events. And I mean, not too long before we find out if that uh, run can be maintained. But yeah, I, I think, it's, it goes to show. I know he's a glutton for punishment, but it's probably something that I think he enjoys. I don't think you would you wouldn't race in this many uh, this many different series uh, and this many different events if you didn't enjoy it, uh, which I'm sure uh, Marcel Vizi absolutely does, um, as well as everyone else uh, on the grid. So great to see the amount of people um, that are carrying over and doing everything today. It's, uh, it's also actually it's quite a good learning it's quite a good learning tool as well to be able to improve your adaptability. There's a, a bit of learning to be done here as well, I think. Yeah, well, um, today, okay, GT4s, he was classified 7th. He was 6th in the Bentley Challenge. He's currently 5th in the standings for Best of British. Now, I'm looking at a lot of his results previously, okay? Um, Ferrari Challenge, Super Saturday, 1st. ninth in the BMW Challenge um, a few weeks ago. Uh, he's also finished 4th previously in uh, Super Saturday. So, Super Trofeo. Uh, he's done. He's had a first, a second, a first. So that's two wins in a second, and he could be going for three victories here. Now, that just shows how consistent you can be in a Super Trofeo. Um, and Marcel Fusi. I mean, we've got 31 cars uh, showing up on the grid, but it looks like they're all in the pit lane at the moment. So I think. Um, you know, practice sessions, I mean, they've also got driver's briefing as well. So there are 36 drivers listening in to the Super Trofeo uh, support race briefing, uh, briefing on the official. Um, you know, I, I mean, one of the things that is really astounding is, is how big SimGrid has grown. Firstly, we have to congratulate Kelvin van der Linde. Um, he's become the first ever uh, SimGrid athlete. And also uh, the SimGrid actually got some... Uh, Rele uh, some very, very good promotion courtesy of the European Le Mans series this weekend, uh, which is taking place at Barcelona, I believe. And uh, yeah, uh, even David Perel got a name check. And there you can see now we're going to look at this now. So 39 race starts. Uh, and I like that. Earned the nickname Mr. Super Saturday. Uh, race wins 11, 20 podium finishes, 34 top 10s and 10 fastest laps. Um, that just... Uh, <laughs> And Dan, just just look at what he says about the last the last item on his hardware. I'm, I'm, I'm looking PC. at that. Yeah, <laughs> it, um, it, it, it just goes to show that you you don't. I mean, another case in point: Amir Hosseini, uh, our very very illustrious ir Iranian uh, sim racing driver, who's very very quick, used to also have uh, a desk um, and a very old TV, and then also uh, a Logitech G29. But things have changed for him. He's now got a sim rig of his own and, um, you know, him and Alaric Enslin are, are trying to compete with the very best. Obviously, Alaric Enslin, Sprint Cup uh, Season 2 champion um, with Coach Dave Academy, but now back with now with uh, Taro with Amir Hosseini. Um, you know, these drivers can just show that you don't necessarily need to have the most expensive equipment to go out and race on a on a competitive platform like ACC and here in such a competitive community as the SimGrid. No, you're absolutely right. I, I think it's it's whereas obviously there's a barrier in rural motorsport, again, obviously naturally as there is, the barrier is, is, is non existent. You know, it's absolutely non existent in sim racing. You can be incredibly successful in sim racing and you yeah, you don't necessarily um need the kit 
uh, behind you. Generally, if you're quick, you're quick. You know, it doesn't really matter. It takes a bit of time to adjust and adapt, obviously, but whatever you normally jump in, uh, you tend to be quick in. Um, and it, well, you know, going forward as, you know, I know people that, uh, I can't remember the name, the name actually escapes him now, but uh, I remember one of the um, uh, uh, championship uh, V8 Scops, one of the uh, multiple championship winners. Um, this was only about two or three years ago. He won on a G25 setup mounted to a desk. And you think how old the G25 wheel is. You know, it, it, it's a wheel that's you know probably 10 years old getting on for now. Um, and yeah, it really goes to show that um, the the equipment isn't necessarily um, the main thing that can gain you pace. It helps, don't get me wrong. I think that's the, that's the other confusion, is it does help with consistency more so rather than outright pace. Um, but you know, at the same time, um, it's, uh, it's each their own. But we are indeed live. Well, Comrade Kuda, there we go. One person that we saw in the GT4s straight back out, um, leaving uh, no time to lose. As uh, Again, 10-minute qualifying. It's not that long, is it? These guys have really got to switch on quickly, haven't they, I think, Alex? Yeah, they have to get the uh, the brakes, the tyres, the engine up to optimum temperature. Obviously, the track has been optimum all afternoon long here on the SimGrid Super Saturday here at Snetterton. If you do like what you're seeing and you're watching on the official YouTube feed, uh, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification bell, and also whilst you're at it, give this video uh, a, a thumbs up if you like what you're seeing at the moment. Uh, so for those wondering, the pros will be with the white boxes, the AMs will be with the red boxes, uh, where their race number is. And uh, there is uh, Conrad Kohler, he's gone with uh, a bit of a more discreet tangerine orange. Uh, so the, the, the front bonnet vents and also the ring mirrors, uh, whereas it's looking a bit like a, a, a sort of a very, very light sort of British racing green-esque colour there. Um, so this is where everyone's now starting to jockey for position. So we've got the likes of uh, Jusso Helvio from Finland, um, Marcel Fusi still in the pits, and then we've also got um, Kevin Barber, um, well, Kevin Barber looks like he's about to exit pit lane, so I think Marcel Fuzzi is probably just waiting until his opportune time to come out of the pits and uh, then decide to move forward. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, just in many respects, uh, these drivers have put themselves through the ring up, and here in these Super Trofeos, those loud, raucous V10 engines... Uh, will definitely provide a lot of howling around the circuit. Luke Whitehead has got that steering wheel issue fixed for the meantime, and he's just put a, a, an outlap in. Uh, so good to see. Now, can he make up amends for obviously with the steering wheel issue uh, last time out? Well, he's got a bit wide uh, in the Lamborghini going through into riches. So, you know, not everything's going to be up to temperature quite yet here, Dan. Uh, and, you know, okay, one one outlap yeah i can I, I think i've probably got enough uh temp in these tires to go and then they find out as luke whitehead just did you know maybe you need uh, a, a, a couple of outlaps to to get the car really really truly up to temperature firing on all v uh, on all 10 cylinders and making that 5.2 liter naturally aspirin uh, aspirated engine sing to its highest note possible i think to be fair absolutely you're absolutely right i mean i'd be uh to be fair as well like you can you can really let this car sort of sing it, it it's got you know you don't necessarily have to it doesn't lose much at the top end so you can just absolutely pin it let the revs run right out to the red line um which i think as an experience to drive there's probably not many better experiences one thing i love about acc as well um compared to other sims uh, at the moment is i think even when you're on a screen or something the, the immersion it's the sound I think that's the main thing. It's the sound that it gives you all the little small sounds that you wouldn't necessarily recognize, like gravel hitting the underside of a car or the brake squeal or even sort of what's going on, the electronics sort of wearing away. But even that, it's surprising how much that if that's not there, it can almost detach you a little bit from from what's going on. It can sort of bring out that immersion. It can uh, remove the immersion a little bit. So an ACC pretty much gets that absolutely spot on. I don't think there's another... I think this is the leading sim in terms of the, the sound design and what and how immersive it can make you feel. And especially when you've got a screaming uh, V10 behind you. 151.477 for Mr. Luke Whitehead. So at the moment, uh, touch wood, his uh, gearbox troubles are not playing at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I mean, who is going to be able to beat that? I said the first time on the board, we don't actually know. Uh, so Ams, he's just gone through. He's seven tenths behind number 24. 
So are we going to see people come down, or is that going to be a tarm? I don't actually know. This is one thing I'm at. I think, to be fair, we're both a little bit... Uh, actually, as I said, no, Prendergast has decided he's going to prove me wrong, and he now goes by seven-tenths of a second in pole position. As Christian Innocente from Balassi, sporting the number 71, goes uh, off track, exit stage left, uh, going through the exit of Corum. Uh, so there's Paul Fenwick in the number 23. He's making his way out of Murray's, and he's got one of the cars in front of them. And this is where you really see how close it can be in terms of super trofeo racing this is the first generation of the car um itself the newer version got released back in uh, a couple of years ago 2018 if memory uh, serves me correctly but time's fast coming in so it's kieran prendergast with a one minute 50.688 there's benjamin lutalek from france as one of the other cars goes a little bit wide that was going through agostini so lutalek uh, 1.7 seconds off of prendergast and that's a little bit of a run wide. They're going through Hamilton, but he puts on the brakes nice and early for Oggies. Turns the car in, rotates, and it's very different to a GT3, let's say the Lamborghini Huracan GT3 Evo. This is on a one-make series platform, uh, so there will be less aerodynamics uh, assisted. So there will be a bit more of an emphasis on slipstreaming, especially coming down here through uh, the Bentley Strait and into Brundles. Luke Whitehead goes P2. Um, uh, but he gets to within just under a tenth and a half. He lost a couple of tenths in the latter stages, but he clawed back the best part of six tenths off of Kieran Prendergast. So the battle with just over four minutes to go. Samir Fosch, uh, one of the regulars here on SimGrid as well. The Latvian does always stream to his uh, captive audience as Benjamin Litalek uh, avoids the sausage curve going through Murray's. French driver currently in P8 at the moment. 1.7 seconds down off of Prendergast. Does he improve? Well, we'll find out. Goes P3. 0. Wow. 0.876 off of Prendergast. So a good run from the Frenchman. Mike Moutou also was in the uh, Cayman in the GT4s. He's just gone P4. Mark Gibson from the Netherlands running in the 101. He's uh, currently 11th. 1.962 seconds off of Prendergast. So the time's rapidly changing. Goes P5. Less than a second off of Prendergast. So the top five covered by 0.984 seconds. As we've got uh, De Moink in the... Uh, that's Leonard De Moink in the number 483. He's dropping towards the bottom part of the top 20. And it looks like the number 21 of Jakub uh, Kukia actually uh, in the Am Cup. Am class lead as Whitehead now again uh, asserting himself going through into Brundles now into the right at Nelson and uh, he was close but not close enough he lost a little bit of time through the final couple of corners now he's gone through the bomb hole now into the right hand sweeper he carries the momentum to the left hand side little touch on the grass by the left rear but uh, very neat and tidy coming through Coram and uh, he's uh, I think he's he was rather close but he'll be uh, crossing the line imminently as the number 22. Uh, that looks to possibly be... Um, I think that's... Uh, that is uh, Amax Poulos uh, rounding out the 26, 26 uh, place as Mike Mutu, still P6. Konrad Kula from Poland across the line. Does he improve? P8. Uh, so it, the times are coming in thick and fast and then instantly gets dropped by Mark Gibson down back to ninth sebastian handler the austrian from team cake he's about to cross the line 1.4 seconds off of provisional pole goes across the line p3 and goes to within two tenths of kieran perendegast marcel fuzzi rounds out the top four now this is where things are going to get rather interesting because fuzzi has never finished lower than second position as all there's a rather second-hand looking super trofeo that's just whacked the barriers coming out of Williams. As here is Kieran Prendergast. I think he might be going a little bit quicker on this lap. His is the one to beat, a 1 minute 50.688. So we'll find out whether he's going to get the job done. He's come out of Murray's. He's put the accelerator through to the floor in the V10 naturally aspirated Super Trofeo. Will it be even a further extension? 1 minute 50.493 extends the gap to Whitehead to just over three tenths. Marcel Fuzzi coming towards the start finish line. Will he improve from P5? We're about to find out as the Hungarian crosses the line. That was a 155.7, but he's still got a lap in order to prove himself and get himself up towards the sharper end of the grid. Konrad Kula from Poland in the number two Lamborghini. 
He's currently 11th, 1.188 seconds. Oh, Whoa. bit of a moment there. And that was going through uh, towards the... That was coming out of the bomb hole. So the back end got stepped out well and truly, got well and truly crossed up, courtesy of that unwanted dip in the bomb hole. And I think that's lost uh, Conrad Cooler a bit of time there. Well, it didn't. I mean, uh, great save there from Conrad Cooler. But yeah, that's definitely where you're not, you do not want any movement going through there, especially with the rear end wants to rotate. But he manages to keep it all in check. Uh, but that was still a 51-6, though, so still a good lap time. So there's definitely some time left to be had um, for Kula. Marcel Fusi, though, in P5, he's half a second off. So bear in mind, we looked at the start of this qualifying session, and it was very, very close indeed. Uh, but looking at the times, or looking at who's in the pits as well, so Prendergast, um, Handler, and Fosch, they are all in the pits. So the only people that can actually challenge... Um, within the top 10, so we've got Kula, uh, so at, actually, on, the time's are about faster than I can actually speak. So Whitehead is in P2. I'm sure he's got some time left in there, but that is qualifying done and dusted. Fusey's also got coming through Nelson for the final time in qualifying. Gets a nice clean exit. Doesn't run too wide over the grass, which is exactly what you want. You don't want to be um, cause, uh, costing yourself too much time there. As you go to the mob hole, nice and controlled. Quorum, this is where, again, you're balancing. Someone's just gone off there, but he's trying to avoid that and ignore that as much as he possibly can. Balancing the throttle through Quorum on the brakes, nice and heavy, down into down uh, a couple of gears through the gearbox. Nice clean exit on Murray. I wonder, is this going to be a quick one? It looked very, very controlled. It looked very, very clean. Is it going to be any quicker? Whoa, look at that! <laughs> 1 minute 50.4 flat from Marcel Fusi. Luke Whitehead is making his way through the bomb hole. He's, well, he's uh, 0.417 off of Fousey. Fousey absolutely left that right up until the last gasp. He wants to keep that 100% success rate of being in the top two. So that was one hell of a lap from Marcel Fousey as Whitehead now comes out of Murray's. Puts the pedal down to the floor and aborts the lap. That's Conrad Cooler, I believe, coming through as well. Marcel Fousey, what a doozy. 1 minute 50.4 on his on his final attack here, uh, here comes jordan Sones, and he goes p3 top three covered by two tenths of a second but wow marcel fuzzi looking to keep that success race alive dan in super trofeos here on super saturday i mean to be fair he he likes his car doesn't he <laughs> that was a I, that lap looked quick like talking through that lap it looked quick Especially going through like Brundle and Nelson, it was so pinpoint, using just about as much of the track as you needed to without costing yourself too much time or any time at all. I mean, that was, if, if there's no such thing as a perfect lap, although that one was pretty damn close, I feel. That was pretty damn special, in my honest opinion. <laughs> I mean, uh, that was just epic. Uh, and that's the thing with Marcel Fusi. That's the reason why he's been given the nickname Super Saturday. Mr. Super Saturday, because he can pull results like that out of the bag. And you can see that the uh, the highest placed driver in terms of the AM is uh, Kukia in the number 21. Um, so we've got quite a lot of things happening. Marcel Fusi looking to continue that winning streak uh, or staying in the top two. But he's got some very stern competition behind him. Kieran Prendergast. Jordan Sones, Luke Whitehead. Uh, you've also got Sebastian Handler, who starts P5. And those drivers that I've just mentioned are going to be well-known and well-loved by many out there in the uh, sim grid, um, uh, in, in terms of the sim grid side of things. But, you know, to be honest with you, so far today here, we're a minute and a half away from the start. So let's give you your starting order. So, pole position, Mr. Super Saturday, Marcel Fusi, Kieran Prendergast in the 29 alongside, Jordan Sones and Luke Whitehead. That's row two. Row three, it's Sebastian Handler and Samuel Foch. Then we got Mark Gibson and Mike Mutu. That's row four with Konrad Kula and Luca Torosani rounding out the top ten. Benjamin Litalek and Vesel Attinen, row six. Zamfir Radu and uh, Otto Kulberg, that's row seven. Row eight, it's uh, Christian Innocente, uh, and then uh, Jakob Kukla, the highest of the AM drivers in this field. 16th, pretty impressive performance there. Uh, Francisco Mazzoni, uh, Harold Kloppelmann, we've got Alex Stefan, uh, Stefano uh, Galimi, 
uh, running out the top 20. Then it's uh, Julso Yuso Helvio. And then Rodrigo Ferreira running out the top 11 rows. Lennart de Moink and Le uh, Les Stevenson. Uh, Dominic Tuzo, uh, Kevin Barber, Paul Fenwick, Jamie Shaw. Then we've got uh, Bob Robson, uh, Dimitris uh, Maxopoulos, and uh, Christian Leanne rounding out the entire 31 strong grid. And uh, yeah, David Christie, yeah, Fousey just absolutely smashed that lap. And as I said, it actually does rhyme rather well. Marcel Fousey, what a doozy. Oh, crikey, I couldn't believe I, I've said that now. <laughs> um, but 30 minutes on the clock. Um, server time, 8.02. But the, the fact that the sun is now setting, the temperatures are getting that little bit colder here, Dan. It's going to make for some interesting racing because just like in the real world, if you're on a sim and the sun's starting to set, you're going to have some uh, definitive glare on that windscreen. You are indeed, isn't it? The, the glare is going to be... Uh especially going down through into turn one, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult. But, uh, I mean, to be fair, not too long before we uh, before we find out. So, I mean, Alex, I know we've seen some good racing, but it's anyone's game here, isn't it, to be fair, going through for this uh, Super Trofeo? Yep, the third and final support race here on the final Super Saturday on SimGrid here at Snetterton in April. Ladies and gentlemen, we're on board with Marcel Fusi, Mr. Super Saturday. As they inch towards the start-finish line, we are green. We are off and away for the Super Trofeo race. Great start by Fousey. As now Jordan Soane's looking up the inside of Kieran Prendergast for the first time, heading into Riches as they are literally tripping all over each other. It's nearly three arrests going through Riches for the first time. But uh, Prendergast holding on. Whitehead round the outside at Wilson's. Are you kidding me? That was absolutely... That's full filled with guts and gumption there. But at the moment, Prendergast keeping ahead of Soames, and that's going through into Palmer's. Whitehead looking up the inside, and Sebastian Handler and Samir Fosh are closing in. Handler sweeps to the left-hand side, and that's on the run down to Agostini, as we're on board with Whitehead. As now Prendergast gets ahead of Soames, Whitehead looking to get through too on the run down into the left-hander here at Hamilton. But Fusi has already run away, he's got 1.3 second advantage and we've not even gotten through the first completed lap as Whitehead again uh, goes heavy on the brakes. And Samir Fosh has to avoid the back bumper of uh, Sebastian Handler with Mark Gibson just behind them. And Gibson's already got up the inside of Fosh, I believe. No, he didn't on that particular occasion. But Conrad Cooler runs wide, and that was coming out of Williams. That's going to allow Mike uh, Mutu to get past him on the Bentley Straits, and then Benjamin Letalek running at the top ten. But Fusi once again in Super Trofeo land, away and ahead by 1.5 seconds with Kieran Prendergast rounding out the top two. I mean, to be fair, Alex, well done for keeping up with all that action because there was a lot of it. But at the moment, the battle for P3 is really still holding up. So Whitehead, he wants to get past the hands as sooner rather than later. Bottom right-hand corner off your screen as well. Uh, we've got the number 21. I'm just trying to see who that is. That is the... Uh, I can't quite actually see uh, what the time is, but that's Jacob um, Kukia, I think, so in the AM category. Um, and uh, yeah, but the battle for P3, uh, Soans and Whitehead, it's three tenths of a second, so I think Whitehead's going to try and have a look, maybe going through in to Wilson. Is he going to try and make it? They both go wide. Whoa, what a save from both of them there. Back end trying to come round on them, but both of them save it. Almost tandem drifting there, Tokyo Drift style. Uh, but uh, they now resume their positions and Whitehead still uh, resides back and looking at the back bumper of Sawans. But they've actually pulled away a little bit from Handler. Um, unfortunately, though, it means that Prendergast has actually now pulled away from them. So the gap between Sawans and uh, Prendergast is now 1.1 seconds. But yeah, Marcel Fusey, I mean, 1. Well, it's about two seconds, I think, is the gap already. So... Uh, he's not hanging about <laughs> we're not even the second lap into this race yet uh, but there's action going all about this is um this is uh That's latin bit, yeah yeah i love the team names again racecraft not found <laughs> um next one next one i'm waiting for is ran out of talent but yeah it was a uh, completely <laughs> santa Gata sideways for both uh Sones and, Whitehead. Oh, and that was Sones. he clipped the curb coming out of williams onto the bentley straight and uh, yeah, that was definitely, I think he took a bit too much curb and he was trying to defend from Whitehead as well. So that means Sebastian Handler from Team Cake now goes up into fourth. Samir Fosh, P5, Mark Gibson, Mike Mutu, Benjamin Letelek, 
Uh, then you've got uh, Torosani, uh, Luca Torosani in the number 58, and then Conrad Kula reigning out the top 10. Uh, so what that has meant is that uh, Jordan Soans has dropped all the way down to 18th. Well, he didn't have the best of luck in the Economy Challenge. Uh, got turned around uh, in the very early proceedings at the Economy Challenge that myself and Andy McEwen um, had the pleasure of commentating on, and it was very different. Oh, behind Sami Radu. Who on earth was that? That was probably Kulberg in the 92. Literally went off onto the grass. Well, no, that was Innocent. So Innocent uh, managed to take out one of the... Uh, one of the track posts and also went nigh on four wheels off the grass on the grass coming out of Murray's and uh, the Italian uh, definitely fired up with that um, with that Italian sort of uh, guts and gusto is behind uh, the likes of Ves uh, Veselatinen and uh, Francisco uh, Mazzoni who uh, has actually picked up penalties in both of these support races done so far and Marcel Fusi has a lead of nearly 2.7 seconds. He's just put in the fastest lap of the race. Okay, his lap in quali was a 1 minute 50.4. Dan, his lap just now on lap two, purple in sectors one and two, were 1 minute 50.781. Less than <laughs> four tenths off of his pole position lap time. I think Fusi's got an absolute belt of a car as there's Mark Gibson all oh, touches the outside curves coming out of Williams on the Bentley straight and again dramas not just for him but also Jordan Soans so running in the top six and then all of a sudden he biffs the barriers with the left rear of that Lamborghini trying to turn it around so this has given a real good opportunity for the likes of Samuel Foch uh, Mike Mutu Benjamin Litalek who we've got on our screen Luca Torosani uh, as well I mean Christian Innocent and Mark Gibson is having to wait he has waited until everyone has gone past him and we've already had the number 23 uh, that is of uh, Fenwick Paul Fenwick that has ended up uh, parking it in the pits uh, which is a real shame for him so uh, Litalik uh, having an opportunity as that is Innocent I think that might have just gotten past uh, uh, no, it's Luca Torosani, so uh, Innocent uh, a little bit further down, probably about 3.1, 3.2 seconds. Well, there's the gaggle behind. So you've got Radu, Innocent and Kulberg all battling away. Jamie Shaw battling away with Robson. Uh, so Shaw in, is the second highest placed AM driver in 20th position. And uh, the leader in that particular group is going to be um, Jakub Kukia, uh, who's running in 18th position as Luca Torosani. Coming under fire now, going into Agostini, courtesy of Conrad Kukla, uh, Kula, as there is a moment for Bob Robson. He's just had a very, very second-hand looking Lamborghini go past him. Uh, that was the number 40, and that was of Christi uh, Christian Leanne, who started at the back end of the field. As, oh, Conrad Kula nearly goes into the back of Luca Torosani. Uh, that was heading through into Oggies. Oh my goodness me, uh, as if we thought we hadn't seen enough action in Bentleys and GT4s, the Lamborghinis uh, are definitely screaming the house down at the moment here at Snap. They are indeed, I think, to be fair, that's the uh, that's the uh, definitely the least that we can say about them, some really, really good action here. Uh, Conor Cooley, he's dropped away a little bit now from uh, Torosani, uh, ever so slightly though, it's not too bad, maybe just again, just you know recognizing that he's got you know trying to sort of cool the tires down and everything and then he's going to try and uh, come back up but i'm sure he's got the pace um so that's a battle we're going to have to watch out for um going forward i'm looking up ahead though whitehead the gap is about four tenths of a second it's sort of yo-yoed it's been it's gone anywhere from about two tenths of a second all the way back to about seven tenths of a second so it's very very close um between those two it's actually just ticked down to two tenths of a second so whitehead is on a charge at the moment as is Conrad Kula. So is he going to try and make a move going through? The gap is yet again two tenths of a second, exactly the same as it is from Prendergast to Whitehead. Here is the battle though between Whitehead and Prendergast. Tries to go around the outside again. He's very, very brave going around the outside of Wilson because there's not really much opportunity <laughs> to overtake there, but he's given it a good go anyway, which is what we like to see. Um, this actually is the more the let me try that again. The more that these guys battle, the more it's actually going to play into the hands of Handler, who's about 1.8 seconds behind as Whitehead goes for another. Oh, I thought he was going to make a move then. That was very late in the breaks. But this is actually holding both of these guys up. Even though there's no actual battling, no side-by-side -side driving, as it were, they're still holding each other up to a certain degree. And this is now allowing Handler to try and catch, or to start catching back up. The gap was 1.8, it's now 1.7. So it's already coming down 
uh, but Whitehead is really, he's wanting this position. He doesn't want it in two laps time. He doesn't want it 10 minutes from now. He wants it now. Although he does go a little bit wide at Williams. Now he's going to have to make up another half a tenth all over, well, another half a second all over again. Well, I've got a bit of breaking news for you folks at home and also to you, Dan. Marcel Fusi for the last two laps has gone sub 1 minute 50. <laughs> <laughs> On lap three, he did oh. a long... Oh, no! Drama's there for Prendergast and Whitehead manages to avoid but gets a little bit of a tag and that gives third place to Team Cake's Sebastian Handler. So as I was rude... Before I was rudely interrupted there by <laughs> Kieran Prendergast going completely... Uh, sideways italian style going through nelson's there through no fault of his own but obviously these things do happen um yeah one minute 49.767 is the fastest lap on lap number three by marcel fuzzi and then the following lap he did a one minute 49.8 he's just done a 150.5 now he's got a gap of near well over six and a half seconds ahead of luke whitehead uh, as we're now with um christian innocent in the uh 71 Lamborghini he's trying to close in and that's on the 910 of uh, Zanferradu the uh, Romanian driver and they're currently just over six tenths of a second apart but Radu nearly touches the wheel on the grass coming through Riches now heavy on the brakes as they've got um, Vesolatinen, uh, Vesolatinen just behind them and then the number 92 that's of Artur Kulberg uh, with um, Francisco Mazzoni he's actually kept his nose clean in this race and he's got Jordan Soane's uh, closing in on him so that was that's very much a repeat of what we saw from Sones uh, on Thursday night at the economy challenge he's uh, he's very good at recovering as we've got a yellow flag that is the 27 that's on the Bentley straightaway that's about halfway down and that's Yusor Helvio uh, one of the Finnish drivers here could be a return to garage so yellow flags will be out so Marcel Fuzzi passes that car and then also here goes Innocent trying to look up the inside of Zamfir Radu that's going through Oggies not on that particular occasion as Radu runs wide going onto the grass two wheels on or both wheels on the left hand side but manages to keep it turned back in nice and tightly as Vesalatin and in the toe of Innocent going down the straightaway the Bentley straight heading down in towards Brundle and Nelson pulls the left hand side as Innocent tries to look on the inside of Radu gets up the inside the Italian makes the move and does he get it late on the brakes for Nelson's he does and here comes uh, there's who's that that's Kulberg just behind and whilst this quartet are battling uh, so Artur Kulberg trying to go up the inside of Latin and going through into the bomb hole now into Corum can't get through on that particular occasion but whilst this quartet are battling this is going to allow Francisco Mazzoni and also Jordan Stones to close up but that was a great move from Innocent that was nicely timed and sent it he saw that Latinum was pulling out and decided well if I'm going to get past Radu I need to do it now yeah exactly the thing is that you, you've got to so this is where it's it's opportunities sometimes just come up and you have to take them but at the same time though, there's probably something going on before that it was a couple of laps where again you're always observing seeing where you're faster seeing where you're slower and trying to make sure that not only can you make the position safely but you also can make sure that you're going to cover off um what's happening for the quarters after you know you don't necessarily make a move going into williams because if you compromise yourself on the entry you're going to have all of the bentley straight to to uh, be caught back up so there's always that element of you've got to predict and you've got to really plan out um your overtakes in most uh, most scenarios although sometimes when opportunities do come up you just have to take them mm -hmm. uh, but uh Kulberg and p13 yeah this battle this train is still sort of going up yeah but at the moment uh so that, that is um uh, innocente that's currently leading that train but if those if they if the guys start battling again that cap is going to really come down. Look how late Kulberg was on the brakes. And we actually saw a move, actually. I believe that was uh, Mazzoni and Soans uh, that had a that were having a bit of a battle, I believe, just going through. I can't yeah. quite see the blue car of that. Is that Mazzoni? That's to Mazzoni and Soans. So Soans was look, looking to fire it around the outside of Oggies. And if he could pull that move off, that would have been probably the move of the uh, the day so far here on Super Saturday. But he slots back in behind Mazzoni as Arto Kulberg trying to close in once again on... Uh, compatriot uh, Vesalatinen so two finished drivers battling away and there's Soans in the background he's looking through the inside of the bomb hole as uh, so there's a moment there for Artur Kulberg trying to go up the inside again of Vesalatinen but this particular occasion Jordan Soans does not get past Francisco Mazzoni but is closing going through Corum as we uh, concentrate this battle again uh, Latinen running a little bit wide coming out of Murray's which gives uh, Artur Kulberg the opportunity of the uh, slipstream effect coming down the centre straightaway and heading into Riches well Kulberg was not 
close enough, I think, as uh, Soans has powered around the outside of Mazzoni before they've even got to Riches. Uh, so that's a great move by Jordan Soans. Up now into 14th place, 16 minutes and 20 seconds. Still remaining on the clock here for the final support race of any Super Saturday here at uh, the SimGrid for the month of April. So uh, at the moment, uh, Marcel Fuzzi looking to keep his winning streak intact and also his success rates in Super Trofeos as Conrad Kula now closing in on Luca Dorazani and they've got Mike Mutu in the number 77 just up ahead whilst Benjamin Letalek is about uh, it's about 2.6 uh, seconds up the road and there is a uh, scrap well there it isn't really a fight it's not really a scrap as all oh, Kulberg nearly in the back bumper of Latin in there and that was going through Oggies uh, these Finns they definitely are using plenty of Sisu as someone set the tyre barriers flying going through Williams and who on earth was that someone pulled to the right hand side of the straightaway oh now who was that I'm not I didn't quite catch who it was but someone has just returned to garage and that was the 20 well, there was an incident involving the 25, so was that Jordan Soans? I just need to keep an eye. No, I think that is, um, well, Kuhlberg's there. Where on earth is Soans is my biggest question because, well, he's still making it through, so that's fine. That's not a problem, but there was definitely a dark Lamborghini with a little bit of a white and red accent there on the livery that has ended up returning to garage. Well, I mean, to be fair, it's it's... Not ideal, is it? Mm -hmm. It's not what you want. I mean, to be, it's a shame, isn't it? You know, you've, you've got... Was it the number... Sorry, we've just been told it was potentially the number 16, um, I believe. And that is, just to confirm, the number 16. Um, I can't quite see it currently in the... Uh, Rodrigo Ferreira. Uh, Rodrigo Ferreira. So, yeah, not that's... ideal. Especially not what you want. You know, halfway through, it's a bit of a shame, isn't it? You almost want it to happen right at the start if something like that happens you almost want to have it you want it to happen right at the start it's sort of the further the further you go through the race the worse it gets uh, yeah very i i completely i completely agree um it's just really really difficult i mean uh, now that Jord now you can see that jordan Soans has been uh, it's basically been uh, hammer time for him because at the moment he's running in the 151 nines so kulberg 153 0 153 0 for latinum uh, Zamfirado 152.8 Inochent 152.7 so Jordan Soans is gunning for being back in the top 10 imminently and to be completely honest with you I will not put that past him because when you've had Kulberg and Latin and battling away Radu's not that further up the road you can see oh now oh. there's another car off and that looked to be the 24 that was Jordan Soans oh so Soans has had a moment coming through Williams oh my goodness it it, it just it, it's williams just seems to be the corner that keeps on giving tonight i mean you know you, you've had you've had the likes of what was it mark wilson earlier on in the race jordan Soames. uh and yeah look at the team name socially distancing from everyone especially when you go through williams is what you need to add to that vernacular I, I mean, to be fair, just touch on that. I think one of the people that uh, is definitely uh, abided by that name is Marcel Fusey, because the gap is 7.7 .7 seconds. So definitely the social distancing uh, working there well for uh, for Fusey. But yeah, big, big shame there uh, for Soane. It, it, it's just, it's tricky, isn't it? Because doing it once is something that you will normally kick yourself about, but doing it a second time, oh, here we go, I'm going to interrupt myself. We've got Artel Kulber that's just gone up the inside, well, up the, the inside uh, through... Uh, uh, just keeping it on the track as well. But we've got a replay here. So again, it's it's a carbon copy, isn't it? It's exactly the same as what happened beforehand. A much more aggressive shunt, though. That's really hurt. You actually saw the front bumper of the car um, for the when it was live uh, on the um, uh, on the front of the car. It's definitely seen better days. So a carbon yeah. copy. I think doing it once is a bit frustrating. Doing it twice, I mean, he must be furious. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, that's a that's a real shame, a real shame for him. To be honest with you, you know, he's he was looking for a top ten, but yeah, Arto Kulberg and uh, Veselatin and managing to get past uh, Zamfir Radu, but it was all Radu's own doing because he went wide coming through riches, went two wheels on the grass on the left hand side, and then all of a sudden, there you go. But in the meantime, we now direct your attention, ladies and gentlemen, to the battle for second place, as Sebastian Handler. You started P5 and Luke Whitehead, who started P4, 
Um, they're battling over second position with 11 and a half minutes to go. And the sun is rather rapidly setting. So obviously best of British tonight will end up underneath the uh, floodlights, possibly more than likely on the start phase. As Sebastian Handler looking toward... He just showed his nose there to Luke Whitehead as if to say just to let you know that I'm there and I know that oh now Sebastian Handler nearly had a bit of a, uh, a whoopsie there probably nigh on sideways going through riches if he'd have taken any more curb on the inside on that right front tyre because that would have loaded up the car and sprung out the rear to the left hand side however he managed to keep that whereas uh, just in the background Samir Fosh and also Kieran Prendergast they're uh, just under 1.8 seconds of drift of each other in what is the battle for fourth position but uh, yeah, Fuzi has gotten away uh, with the tumbleweeds and he's uh, well over 8.1 seconds adrift and he's been consistently running now in the 151s, uh, 151.4 but to put two laps on the bounce and even set the fastest lap of the race, 1 minute 49.767, that was ridiculous, that meant he had more for qualifying, didn't he? Oh, 100%. I, I mean that was it was on the last lap as well so there's probably an element of conservation there as well um but uh yeah i mean there's definitely some pace in that look at that whitehead though he's defending really really aggressively from sebastian handler they're gonna go side by side going in to brundle then subsequently to nelson's decide against it though which is probably quite wise uh currently now looking on the rear of the h3 racing car of the number seven luke whitehead but at the moment he still provisionally stays in p2 with nine minutes and 46 seconds left to go. But you just see a little bit of push on understeer then from Handler's car. Manages to actually release the car a bit, get the car back round, and almost caught up a little bit going through the second half of Corn. So again, really sort of balancing it on the throttle then. It's one of the things I like about um, corners like Corn, that sort of really high speed that's just constantly, you're always balancing it on the throttle. If you can manage that, I mean, that will gain you an incredible amount of lap time. Although I'm noticing though, Handler is very, very good on the brakes. He's definitely catching up in the braking zone to Whitehead and he tried to have a look there though you just saw Whitehead just darting in the inside just trying to cut it off a little bit he almost actually looked like it was a bit of a 50-50 because he might have been expecting to be fair I don't know what you thought of it but it looked like he was actually expecting the move to be made which is why he didn't fully go to the right hand side to properly defend I think in some respects you, you, you've got to sort of look at where you, your strengths your weaknesses opportunities threats it's basically what they call it's SWOT analysis Sam from business studies when I used when I did A levels a long long time ago. But you know you you've got to look you you've got to play to your strengths. You know and if you know that you don't need to completely defend that corner and you know that they're not going to go for it, that's the opportunity that you have. As uh, Artur Kulberg now gets past Veselatinen uh, for what will be eleventh position as uh, Latinen runs wide. That was coming through Palmer's as they run down towards um, Agostini. Uh, and now this this glare, as the sun is starting to set, track temperature now 17 degrees Celsius. Again, we return to Whitehead, and Sebastian Handel looks a bit more planted. He nails it up the inside. Oh. Does he get it stopped? Oh, that was close, and then some. And he's got the job done. Sebastian Handler does one of the overtakes of the day so far on Luke Whitehead, of all people. Just absolutely got the run put it to the outside going through into Brundles and then nailed the apex and also the braking zone going into Nelson's. That was inspired. That was a great move. That was such a good move. It was calculated all the way going through, probably from Williams as well. Um, probably halfway down the Bentley straight, you probably, I imagine Hannah would thought, no, this is happening. Had the comps in the car. He tried it once. This is the good thing. A bit of, whoa, no, that was uh, Latinen, who's had it coming together. Can't quite see who that was. Was that Kuhlberg? That was um, Kuhlberg, yeah. And Zamfir Radu up the inside and Mazzoni right uh, up close and personal. So that battle for 11th position has completely been turned upside down on its head. Um, a real shame. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that's what uh, Artur Kuhlberg wanted at the end of this race because that was, you know, he'd done really, really he'd made good strides forward. As now we say, uh, Luca Torosani being challenged by Konrad Kula, who've got uh, Mike Mutu just up ahead of them. But yeah, all that hard work from Artur Kuhlberg was undone within a couple of tenths of a second of that. Um, you know, and I'm sure that that could very much be investigated. I mean, if Latinum was found at fault, then Latinum will get a penalty. 
hundred percent. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame. Conrad Kuhler oh. going for another spin. A pirouette manages to keep it on the track or get back on the track and then off he goes so this race has gone from bad to worse unfortunately uh, we've got a replay here though so let's see what happened going through here so it gets quite a slow exit to be fair going through um no, it actually doesn't look too bad to be fair oh i just loses the back end going through a uh, bomber i mean that was yes that was actually his own accord we obviously caught the tail end of that mm -hmm. but that was on his own accord i was uh intrigued was yeah like, I, yeah <laughs> You and me both. I mean, I, I thought was uh, Latin and close enough to be there or thereabouts. Well, in that particular occasion, no, he managed to get out of the way. But then you've got a swarm all behind. And Lennart de Moink, um, who started down in 23rd, is now 14th and is closing as Latin and trying to look to see if he can put um, Zanfiradu up under pressure. But the biggest thing is he's now got Francisco Mazzoni, Lennart de Moik, Christian Innocent as well. And then right behind is the AM class leader, Jakob Kukie in the number 21, who uh, is currently 15th. And Kukie started actually a position lower than that as well. We'll make that 14th because now Polish driver is closing on the pros. So it just goes to show that in the Super Trofeos, the AMs can mix it with the big hitters. Yeah, 100%. And it's great to see as well, isn't it? It gives, I, I suppose as well, it gives the person, it gives the AM drivers confidence, doesn't it? Um, that they can, you know, they're sort of improving, they're sticking with the pro guys. And and yeah, it's it's a really, I mean, to be fair as well, this battle actually might continue because, uh, and he might, uh, this is uh, Kukia, might really get stuck in because the battle up ahead is still really kicking off. This is um, Latin and Mazzoni um, and Randy as well. So it's really kicking off as well. That's, um, that is, who is in front? That's the Demonic that's currently in front of Kukia. Yeah, the soon these guys start battling, that's just going to allow... Uh, so even though that uh, Kukia is the leading AM car, he's got a bit of uh, opportunity to have a bit of a play with the pro guys. And he's got a bit of a ringside seat as well as they now go through Whoa, to Agustin. He's all so up the inside of Mazzoni. That was a great move by the 483, but Mazzoni just powers past. Then Kukia round the outside on the exit coming through Agostini's. Just nailed it. And there's Innocent trying to go around the outside as well. This time going through Hamilton's. Has he got it done? He has. And, oh, he nearly tangles with the back of Kukie there. And that was going through into Oggies. Oh, my goodness. Well, I think the two terms, considering we've got Italian cars down on track, mamma mia. Um, but Prendergast <laughs> now has uh, ended up behind. Well, Samir Fosh has actually closed up to Luke Whitehead. And with him has come Kieran Prendergast. So the final step on the rostrum with just under four minutes remaining as the darkness will start to set in rather rapidly here at Snetterton, is very much undecided because Samir Fosh last time around did a 1 minute 52.2. He was nearly four, uh, three tenths quicker than Luke Whitehead, but Kieran Prendergast has really got the bit between his teeth. He was the quickest out of this trio, 151.744 on the completion of lap number 14. So Prendergast wants to gun for a top three, and Luke Whitehead and Samir Fosh will do their level best to keep him at bay well, i think again this is you know it's the it's the what's the risk versus reward i think there luke why he's having to go defensive now so samir fosh he wants this position luke whitehead goes really quite early on the defensive so he knows uh, that the move is going to be done relatively soon i was actually going to say that it was wonder like what prendergast was going to do was he going to try and attack um fosh early on as soon as possible he goes a little bit wide though going through hamilton so that's cost him a little bit of time uh, yeah, it was almost like, does he go and try and make the move on Fosh and allow Whitehead to then pull away? Or is he going to try and do a two for one, coupon code style? Um, and uh, is he going to try and get both of them if they have a bit of a, if they have a bit of a battle, uh, which could actually very well be right here, right now, going through into Brundle and Nelson, turn eight and turn nine. They're going to go side by side. Look at that. You've got Prendergast on the inside. He's actually going to try and go up the inside of Brundle. Uh, up the inside at Brundle on Fosh. Doesn't quite make it, though. So this battle is still kicking off. He's got a good run, though. Decides against it. Pulls back in, going through Bonhole. Probably a wise decision, that one. And they're still all the three continuing their run in the same position. So, actually, this has allowed Whitehead to pull away a little bit here, which is exactly, well, ideally what he wants. Not necessarily what Fosh or Prendergast uh, would like. I think, actually, Prendergast is probably the person in the most precarious position. Although, look at Whitehead. He's had a bit of a moment now. He's gone very, very slow at the exit of Murray's. So that's potentially going to go side by side with himself and Fosh. 
So we've just been told he's got a very, he actually had a very good exit. You could just see that as well. Great camera angle here, debuting and showing what's going on here. Oh my goodness, that's going to be Prendergast. No second invitation needed. And he's now gone up to, well, it's not, the move hasn't been done yet. Fosh is keeping it around the outs. Oh my God, I, I can't keep up. <laughs> <laughs> well, Samir Fosh has got Kieran Prendergast. Well, they've just tangled door panels. Luca Torasani has got a stop go 10 for an unsafe rejoin. Um, on lap number 13 as Whitehead runs wide coming out of Palmer's. That's going to give Samuel Fosh and Kieran Prendergast the motivation that they need to try and get past. We've got a yellow flag out. But uh, you can just see as we go on board with Marcel, F uh, not with Marcel Fusi, Kieran Prendergast, who is in fifth position. He's got the ringside seat. Fusi at the moment is making his way down the Bentley straight for what will be possibly the pro the penultimate time because we've got just under 60 seconds to go but this battle for third fourth and fifth whitehead still hanging on you know, denied a victory due to a paddle issue and now Jakub Kukie has just got a drive through penalty for avoidable contact and that was with the number 25 of Francisco Mazzoni so Mazzoni involved in an incident but not of his making so that will oh, mean the look at that will get that. But what a switch back there by Kieran Prendergast through Brundles and then through the exit of Nelsons and into the bomb hole. He gets the move done on Samir Fosh. Great pickup by our uh, broadcast director, as always, Mike Yow, with these exemplary camera angles as we are now in the depths of sunset. And Marcel Fusi is uh, now going to be on his final lap. He's making his way through Wilson's yellow flags out. And that is uh, the 21 of Kukia that has brought out the yellow flag as now Prendergast comes under fire from Samir Fosh. Through into Riches they go for the final time. As Fosh runs wide, all gets a bit crossed up coming out of Riches, tags the left rear wheel onto the dusty grass. But um, now this means that uh, Harald uh, Kloppelmann uh, in the number 17 takes the am class lead with just a couple of laps to go the clock has struck zero so we're on the final lap of this race and marcel fusi is making his way through oggies before negotiating the right hander you can see it in the picture in picture through williams for the final time so the streak in super trofeo looks to be very much well and alive here for marcel fusi is again Luke Whitehead has bridged that gap to just over a second. Oh, Prendergast runs wide coming out of Hamilton and through into the right-hander at Oggies. Oh, that was ever so close, Dan, but hats off to Kieran Prendergast for actually uh, keeping that in front. 100% he kept his foot in absolutely keep it kept it pinned to the floor and it did help him but he's got a bit of a back marker there as well. So is he going to uh, he's got to try and actually make sure that he can um, sorry, that's not a back mark. That's Luke Whitehead. Sorry, that was me getting a bit confused then. But that's going to be bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Just switch to the bay. Well, look at that. Marcel Fusi takes the Super Trofeo win on this Super Saturday. A dominant performance. You cannot argue with that at all. But who is going to be um, the... Who is going to be... What is the battle for P3? That is Sebastian Handler that's in P2. Luke Whitehead um, is going to be uh, in P3. But all importantly, what's going to happen... Um, going through into P4. I think it's still going to be, look at that. So Luke Whitehead takes P3 with Prendergast and Fosh in, uh, in P4 and 5. What a race that was. That was so, so much action from start to finish. I mean, I, Alex, that was... One thing I was... I mean, Marcel Fusi, he loves these cars, doesn't he? You can see that. 16 seconds was the lead. I mean... You, you can't you can't argue with that you can't argue with that as well he's never been outside of the top two so congratulations to marcel fusi who heads into the best of british season finale in just a few moments time sixth in the standings and he's 43 points adrift uh, so sebastian handler from team cake 16.5 seconds behind in second position at the end of it luke whitehead takes a well-earned and well-needed podium place in third position there's also been a 15 second time penalty being given to Zanfirado, and that was involving the incident between him and uh, christian innocent as here comes uh, luca torosani who's going to complete uh, the top 20 he gets a stop go 30 post race um, but Benjamin Letalek rounds out the top seven. Uh, Conrad Kula, uh, Veselatinen, Christian Innocent, they ran out the top ten ahead of Lennart de Moink, who started 23rd and finished in 11th. 
Um, Zanfir Radu will end up well and truly outside of the top 20, I think, possibly more than likely. Uh, so, Arto Kulberg, uh, Francisco uh, Mazzoni, then you've got the number 59. That's of Stefano Galimi uh, with, um, of all people, Harold uh, Kloppelmann um, actually winning the AM class in that race. I know that Marcel, we won't get to speak to him uh, this <laughs> this very day. We always find that's going to be the case. But we have got an interviewee waiting in the waiting to interview room. So without further ado, uh, let's bring him in. Second position in this race. Having started down in fifth, let's bring in Team Cake's Sebastian Handler. So, Sebastian, firstly, congratulations. Um, second place after all of what was happening in front, you know, dramas for uh, the likes of Luke Whitehead and um, Kieran Prendergast and all. And uh, well done for Team Cake for getting a second place in the Super Trofeo. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I guess I got a bit lucky with the... Uh, the the wrangle in front, uh, <laughs> but nice way it was putting it there, Sebastian. Nice way of putting it there. <laughs> but it was far from easy from far from easy uh, taking like the actual position. Uh, it was a very very hard fight, and uh, big shout out to what's his name again, Muir, no Whitehead, um, for keeping that clean. It was a very very aggressive move into the uh, I don't know the the big sausage corner that could have could have gone wrong. Um, yeah. So big shout out to him for keeping it keeping it, keeping it clean with me. Uh, awesome racing, and I hope to do it again soon. Great yeah, fun. Well, you, yeah, you did a really good move on him actually. Yeah, but like you say, going into what was it? You went under the bridge, so Bentley straight into Brundle, then into Nelson, you had the run on him. I mean, for me and Dan, we were absolutely beside ourselves with joy when you pulled that that hell of an overtake on on Luke Whitehead to, to secure that place. I mean, absolutely epic stuff. But Sebastian, we're looking forward to seeing you back uh, with Team Cake very, very soon here on the Sim Grid. But well done today. Started fifth, finishing second. Not a bad run after uh, Marcel Fuzzi again keeps his uh, success ratio alive here in Super Trofeo on Super Saturday. Yep, thanks for having me, and I know that Marcel is going to be in the main race as well, so best of luck to him, he's my boy. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, great race, great fun as always. Thank you See very you guys much. next time. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Take care. Well, um, firstly, uh, before we go to a brief ad break, um, Dan, just your thoughts after three exciting races here at Super Saturday. Wow. Um, I can't wait to see what the best of British 2.4 hour finale brings for us because there's six drivers split by 43 points going into it. It's going to be a cracker, isn't it? I mean, that's absolutely to say the least. I think you described it perfectly as simply saying, wow. I mean, you, you can't really uh, you can't really describe it more, like, more than that, can you? Uh, yeah, it was fantastic. It was a great to be a part of. And I really appreciate, you know, SimGrid for, for having me back. It was an absolute pleasure. And I'm going to be watching uh, the 2.4 hour while I'm finishing up some work. Uh, I'm, uh, obviously, I'm not be, uh, you know, in the very capable hands of, obviously, uh, Lewis and David. So it's fa it was fantastic. Like, it was such a good race. And the competition was so, so close. And I can't wait to uh, I can't wait to watch some more racing. It's going to be fantastic. Brilliant, Dan. Thank you very much for jumping in last minute. Obviously, uh, we'll have Luke Rogers back at some point. So that's it from myself, Alex Goldschmidt, and Daniel Handover. We'll be back in just a couple of moments' time when we hand over for the best of British the season finale. Back in a couple of moments, folks.
Finale time. Just one final stop to go. We've had two dry rounds, two wet rounds that have left us with everything to play for in the tight tussle at the top of our title race. A technically mathematical sense, 15 drivers are still able to win a hard-fought title. In a realistic sense, though, there is no perfectly favoured candidate. To carry that theme, just one driver has been on the podium more than once this season, and so 11 drivers have visited the podium over an incredible four races in this short season. With 105 points up for grabs in the race today, it's time to settle some scores. Our venture across Great Britain then leads us to Snetterton. First opened in 1951, it followed the common trend of the time, using the perimeter road of a post-war airfield to create its layout. Through the time, though, of history, it has been forged as a different character in a much greater sense in the eyes of British motorsport. It's time to race it for 2.4 hours, though, as the finale in our tale of the best of British championship here at the SimGrid with Coach Dave Academy and Thrustmaster are guiding us through. Massive thanks, of course, through the support races to Alex Goldschmidt and Dan Handover, who's taken some excellent racing throughout the day. Back in the booth to wrap up the season, myself, Lewis McLeod, and the ever-present Mr. David Christie. A very good evening, Lewis. And I've got to say, I was loving that alliteration, all the T's in that introduction. But, I mean, what better place to settle some scores here tonight? Snetterton, uh, what a championship we've got to decide and some huge implications through the race. There's so much going on today and we've got Mr. Boothby back in the race, so we'll see how that one plays out. We were wondering if he was going to do the uh, the triple last time out. We didn't see him on the track though, so we'll see if he can take a third victory in the championship. It's going to be a tight one out there and things are looking pretty dry. They certainly are. Uh, let's hope that, uh, fingers crossed, the conditions stay that way. It's looking favourable as well, but I mean, you look at any one of those top five in the championship so far just now, and I've got to be honest, Lewis, I cannot have any idea how tonight is going to go anyway whatsoever. It's going to be tight. It's going to be tough, but you know the circuit. It is, in fact, Snetterton. We've raced here a little bit before, but let's take a look around it. The McLaren 720S GT3 producing 540 brake horsepower from its mid-engined 4.0-litre twin-turbo V8 piloted by Gregor Schill will take us on a hot lap here at Snetterton 302.969 miles. Down through into Rich's third gear at 175 on the apex, the car drifts off to the left-hand side before the short blast down to Wilson, all the way down from fourth to first gear and knocking the speed down by about 180 kilometers an hour through using the weight transfer and also the center of gravity on this car that is affectionately known in certain circles as the torque monster. We head through the left-hander at Palmer's and start accelerating our way through to Agostini. Down from fourth gear at nearly 220 kph through into first gear at around 85 on the apex. It starts to put the throttle down, going up the gears, nearly hitting the rev limiter, going through into Hamilton before lifting off the throttle. Avoid the tyre stack on the left-hand side before the right-hander at Oggies, where Gregor Schill seems to take uh, a bit more curb than you would might normally expect, but it helps to get a good lap time round here. A little bit of correction coming out of the right-hander at Williams before we head down to the Bentley Straight and towards the final few corners on this fantastic circuit which was first opened in 1953. Down into Brundle, third gear at 150, first gear through Nelson before you run towards the bomb hole. A little bit of a dip here that could unsettle the back end of the car, especially if it's mid-engined or rear-engined on this particular vehicle. Through into Corum, pushing fourth gear down to third now before you start braking heftily for the left-hander at Murray's. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you wrestle a McLaren 720S GT3, courtesy of Gregor Schill here at Snetterton.
Fantastic venue to go racing then. Snetterton, one of those staple circuits in Great Britain and a perfect track for us to finish our season on. A fantastic run through this five-round championship that we've had. We've ventured to circuits like Alton Park, Donington, Silverstone and Browns Hatch and all coming to this one finale. 2.4 hours of racing ahead of us though, uh, David. And the last 2.4 hour race when we were racing at Donington Park saw a, a trio battling for that race lead it was um george boothby and patrick nodge really quite close towards the end of the race a fantastic one out there i think we're going to see very very similar things today for sure absolutely and of course that was a race that would be uh better forgotten for our championship leader Yegor Ogorodnikov finishing 15th place it was actually uh Will Trigartha who's no longer in the championship who finished third in that one but yeah like I mean Snerton is an amazing amazing circuit what actually I never appreciated uh, when the pros do it is you know from Brundle out in Nelson that whole entire right hander section is just completely flat out you're just you didn't see any fluctuation in the throttle at all whatsoever um, I, I, and that is going to be an amazing feat given that we've seen time and time again through this championship cars doing exactly that driving to the absolute limit of adhesion and their grip and their ability but side by side with one another so when you add that into the fact that there's a championship that's going to be decided tonight how is this going to play out? Uh, the first 10 minutes, always an absolute shenanigans fest for uh, for some of the races. Do they want to try and back off a little bit and keep themselves out of trouble? Given that, as we said, 2.4 hours, they need to keep their noses clean tonight, Lewis. Yeah, a couple of different things at play, of course, naturally over a, uh, a race of this distance. The way it works in the Best of British Championship uh, sees that uh, pit stops are forced. We have three forced pit stops across the race. Normally over the 90 minute races, it's just two. When we come here though, same as it was at Donington Park, it is three forced pit stops. And also the big note with that is that there are some points dished out at the halfway point of the race. I said that there was 105 points up for grabs. Well, that's because as is standard across the championship, it is 70 points for a race victory which is the same today but if you are leading at the halfway point there is an extra 35 points for you for good measure now that kind of plays into things a little bit about making that first stint go as far as possible now whilst George Boothby did win at Donington Park whilst taking those 35 points we did have the conversation at the time and I'm still kind of maintaining in that sense that maybe just maybe that if you're trying to take those points at the halfway point of the race taking those 35 uh, at the interval, I wonder if that's not necessarily the best strategy to gain you a race victory, but might net you more points. That is absolutely spot on, and uh, I, I remember that conversation well because obviously it, it compromises your effort towards the end of the race itself. But ultimately, you're taking those points, you're getting them in the bag in the first place, and you're not really going to be, as long as you keep yourself out of trouble, you're not going to be getting too bad a finish. You're certainly almost guaranteed a top five finish for that case. Absolutely. Let's take a look at these championship standings. You said Yigor Ogorogonikov, our championship leader, who had a poor round at Donington Park, is leading a podium to his name at the first round of the season and fairly consistent the last couple of rounds to net him the championship lead. Keep your eye on Patrick Noj, though. Second, eighth and fourth had a retirement at Alton Park whilst having good pace. He could be one to watch. Lucas Kreutz has been flying under the radar all season. And Mr. Boothby is back. He is fourth in the championship at the moment after taking both race wins at Donington Park and Silverstone. Jan Zemisov taking that opening race win of the season. We were chatting about this uh, over the previous two rounds. Whilst at Donington Park, David, Jan Zemis had um, some issues. He was uh, knocked about a little bit and, and whatnot by Niels van der Kakel and got involved in his own instance. Last couple of rounds, though, let's be real. He's been, he's been super average. That's really harsh, and I'm sorry, but it's true, though. 10th and 10th, not what we'd expect. It has, uh, and it brings up another point. You look at all of those drivers in the top 10 there, Lewis, and the one thing that is just not making any sense is how wildly inconsistent those results are. There's not one driver in the top 10 who's had four top 10 finishes. It's all been, they've either had one absolute disastrous race where they finished in the uh, the 20s but there's there's not one of them that has been you know mr consistent through the uh, the championship and i think that if we did the championship would be a very very different story 
One thing we are having noted, though, is whilst they are in practice, we'll be heading into qualifying in just a moment. But we've got a couple of drivers missing on the grid, and we're not sure. They are on our entry list. They are expected to be here. But Jan Zemis, who is in fifth place, and Yigor Ogorognikov, our championship leader, are not presently on the server, which asks many questions as to where they are. Well, 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 well I guess we'll have to see on that one. I was going to ask you, though I kind of feel like this is a little bit harsh now, but um, still, we normally ask about who do you think is going to win the race, and you knew this one was coming at some point this evening, David. Who do you think is going to win the championship? Well, just before I answer that question, I'd like to point out to our viewers that the number 37 boss is just coming in and uh, I'm going to get thrown under it. Um, I, look, on that point about Ogorodnikov, that is a very, very strange issue. Let's let's address that first. Usually he's streaming uh, and he's not live on there as well, so I'm, I'm really wondering what on earth is uh, going on there. Um, I, I, if I'm honest... With the way that he's gone with the races that he has been here, George Boothway, I mean, he's been so commanding in those wins. Um, it all depends on that start. I, I think 100% is going to be George Boothway, but, you know, Herbinho's had some, some really good performances. I had a first and a fourth place. Uh, Marcel Fusi coming off of that uh, that Lamborghini Super Trofeo win that we just saw there, he'll be uh, feeling very, very confident. Uh, yeah, for me, Boothby. I agree with you entirely. Boothby is just so incredible. And yes, he has missed two of the races this season. He did do the 2.4 race, though, where he maximised, got 105 points. And at Silverstone in the wet, on maximum ballast as well, came through to take the win uh, on that day in a really, really fantastic drive. Um, a, a properly uh, a just calculated drive to to beat off the likes of Niels van der Kakel and Andre Mesa, who had the pole position that day. I, I think you'd be hard to look past him being here. He's not actually that far off the championship lead. Where Oga Rognikov is, well, 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 I'm sure we'll find out at some point. He's not far off. He's only like 25, 27 points off the, the championship lead anyway. So he's right up at the thick end of things. I think he's a hard person to look past. However, things can go wrong very, very quickly. And I wouldn't necessarily count out the likes of Patrick Nodge and of all drivers who I actually didn't realize until looking at the championship standings before today. Lucas Kreutzer, who is up in third place, who like didn't start out the season with particularly great pace and looked like he struggled in the early phases of Brands Hatch but really kind of came on strong towards the end, was setting some of the faster laps uh, over the entire race towards the end of that part and, and really looked quite impressive in that wet brand space race. For sure, and that's the other thing. With it being dry, we've seen so many variable conditions through the season in this Best of British, which really makes it such an authentic championship in my eyes. Um, it, it really throws so many variables uh, into the mix and when I look at that as well with if we are going to be potentially discounting Igor Ogorodnikov from tonight that makes it even more intriguing how tonight is going to play out because when you look at Patrick Naj, uh, Lucas Kreuzer, George Boothby the three of those are split by uh, 11, uh, yeah, 11 points and then you've got uh, Jean Zemis and Marcel Fusi who is another say uh, 15 points back behind that as well. Suddenly you go from maybe having five drivers in uh, potential with the championship to about maybe six or seven drivers so it, it's going to be a monumental night but Snetterton as well here it's such a narrow track in places there is very little room for error because if you go off you're having a big one and um, there's there's no doubt about it we saw that all through the uh, the, the fantastic support races early on tonight um, and you're you're going to be very very lucky if that doesn't cause you any sort of damage whatsoever so Again, so many different things in play tonight. I, there's so many also, uh, you know, dark horses that are uh, going to be looking to try and secure a, a decent championship position. And uh, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of bragging rights settled tonight for sure. That, and it is quite a difficult track to overtake at. You say it bites hard when it bites. And to be fair, over a 2.4 hour race, I'm only expecting it to bite. You can see now that we are in the qualifying session, the final one of the season, still 16 minutes to go. It is an incredibly long lap as well here at, uh, at Snetterton, the second longest lap in the country behind only Silverstone, which is a fact that Alex Goldsmith dropped earlier and actually didn't know that. I had thought about it before, but um, very good point from uh, from Alex earlier in the broadcast. So, uh, you know, 
It, it, maybe, maybe the whole Leicestershire Derbyshire thing was was a little bit off on the whole Donington thing. We'll carry that one back. It's fine. Uh, but but this spot on. That's a that's a very good bit of information. The thing is though, with that, with it being such a long circuit, when you counter that with somewhere like Alton Park and Brands uh, and even Donny, they're quite short laps in comparison. Which means that in a qualifying session, you get a lot of laps to throw at it with a circuit that's quite hard to pass at with a long lap as well you need to make these laps count to perfection in this session because otherwise you are in for a fairly long afternoon. You certainly are. It makes it massively, massively important because if you bodge one lap, you've then got... Uh, the, the good thing is, is if you bodge a lap, you've got obviously a lot of time to get up, back up and running. However, you've then got to, to manage that time and it then takes it down from, say, three or four laps that you can get in uh, at top speed then down to two or three and that adds that extra pressure and uh, not only are you qualifying you know it's not like you've got the track to yourself you've got all these other cars around you that are cooling down and trying to get uh, you know heat into the tires and things like that it makes it very very difficult indeed and it's, it will not be unusual as we see jordan stones oh that's uh that's such a shame to see uh, jordan I mean, he's had a really difficult evening uh, and afternoon. It's been a very, very difficult one. But there you go. I mean, look at how long it's taken him to get back onto the track because of traffic. That's the other thing you've got to think about as well, is the fact that if you do have an off, you've then got to consider everybody else, and that takes out extra time as well. Indeed, uh, a fairly typical sight over the season so far. Not to be too harsh, Jordan Sones, but he has struggled in the Best of British Championship. A little bit of an update towards the top as we see Marcel Fusi. A little bit of a burst in the previous race after winning that Super Trofeo one just before this. Might help him get up to speed a little bit quicker in this Mercedes. You know, that, that buzz of winning a race. But uh, Herbin out has topped the session as present ahead of George Boothby, who was on provisional pole position. Let's see what Sheldon Muscat can do, who's qualified, to be fair, in the last few races pretty well as he jumps up up into fourth place. Andre Mesa is on the pole position as things stand now, jumping up towards the top end. Still plenty of time left to go in the session. Reminder that Andre Mesa has had a pole position previously in the season. Reminder back to the Silverstone race in those tricky wet conditions. Very much a surprise pole position, but had the pace to match in the race. He certainly did, and it'll be interesting to see if he can repeat that performance here at uh, at Snetterton. But that is a, a decent marker to set down just now, 145.627. But again, there's that uh, that dark horse I was mentioned earlier of Herbino. We saw the pace that he had last time out at, uh, at Brands Hatch. That was a cracking job that he did taking that win. Uh, if it wasn't for Silverstone finishing 15th in his, uh, his non-finish at Ulton, he could have been in a very much stronger position, but that Merck of uh, Herbino definitely has a lot of pace. We spoke to him after um, the, the last round at Brands, where, I mean, naturally it was wet conditions. We were talking to him about it, where he said basically, after a race win, that the last time we raced in the wet at Silverstone, he didn't really, he'd never raced in the wet. So he did quite badly and he, he held his hands up and then focused on it really hard for Brands. And what did he do? Oh, he won. Uh, so, you know, coming into this, he's maybe got a little bit of pressure on his shoulders to sort of bounce uh, or hold that up, um, in a sense, you know, try and carry that speed through. But a reminder that he does have, after that race win, because of how the success ballast works here in the Best of British Championship, he does have maximum ballast of 35 kilos, does Herber now. So that lap is not only impressive considering how much he's making he, he's pulling on the rest of the mercedes but the fact that he's got 35 kilos in his car and he's still fighting at the moment for a potential pole position that's that's pretty healthy yeah the merc is an absolute tank when it comes to uh, to the weight just now but he's really going to have his work cut out uh, this this weekend with the dominance right now of the mclarens the mclarens doing very very well they do well at circuits like this where there's high speed corners and it's it's very flat they really enjoy that sort of layout um, So, but again to see him up there what's that third place that he's got at the moment a cracking cracking job but again, 11 minutes, this is still very early in the qualifying session. Um, I, I think it's going to be with about five, six minutes to go. We're going to see fireworks and we're going to see the, uh, the sandbags get cut away. Absolutely. It's about finding the, uh, I've, I've said this before, it's about finding the time at the right time, because as much as you can fire in a, 
you can fire in a great lap towards the start of the session. What you're doing there, and I know this is this is sound like obviously you want to just fire in a, a good lap whenever you can. Um, if you fire in a good lap at the start of the session, then people have you know 20 minutes to react to that. If you fire in a great lap towards the end of the session, uh, as we saw last round when uh, Paul Batty set that uh, lap very very late in the session to grab pole position at Brands Hatch, um, who's currently in 12th place by the way. Um, firing in that lap late you you don't give anyone time to react and what that does is that they carry that sort of pressure and that well how's that possible into the race and it just starts everyone else on the back foot and i kind of wonder if there's a little bit of that at play you know you start with a couple of bank laps and then fire in the good ones a little bit later we've got ilka rantanen currently on screen he's in 15th position had a personal best qualifying in the best of british championship last time out qualified up in fifth place which is a fantastic qualifying for them he wasn't too far off of uh, herbernell who qualified in second that day and then ended up taking the race victory so we'll keep our eyes focused on the fin and see if we can move further up the order in the final 10 minutes of the session just on that point about uh leaving the the qualifying times to the right time it's absolutely spot on point to make actually because you know if you're a racing driver there's nothing more disconcerting and disheartening than seeing you know your time at the top and you think oh that's an amazing lap and then suddenly bang 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 all these people start coming in with even faster lap times it almost paints a target on your back and gives them the uh, the impetus to go back out there and beat that time but if you leave it till the uh, the last minute if you've got the capability to to realistically improve on that lap time then absolutely leave it until say eight seven minutes to go get your warm-up lap in and just fire a couple of laps in because as i say it's such a, a, a disheartening thing as a racing driver to see you've put in the lap of your life and uh, quite a few drivers are able to beat it quite comfortably i've kind of said this before this is a sort of like a, a bit of a claim in a sense that you know some people obviously won't disagree with but sometimes in qualifying and now hear me out here leaving something you know on the table and leave, leaving something a little bit at the side you know off the table it can be a good thing right and and i say that in the sense of um if you maximise your lap, if you do that perfect lap, I'm talking, um, I think like Lewis Hamilton's was a 2018 lap at uh, Singapore, 2019, where it was, or um, a Senna lap at Monaco, etc. You know, that, that perfect lap where you've been on the limit, you cross the line, you think that is the best lap I've ever done in my sim racing career, and I'm eighth? What? No, that's not possible right? And uh, that is crushing to yourself. And I always think that kind of maybe if you've if, if I've ever done a qualifying session and I've missed an apex at a corner, I think, oh, there's like two tenths there, two tenths, and I'm qualified in fifth place and I'm nearly, I'm quite close. That then gives me the confidence in the race that actually I haven't shown my full deck yet. And there is a little bit of that at play. Obviously, everyone's just trying to maximise the laps. But sometimes if you don't hit every apex, if you don't do everything perfectly in a session, it may actually work out from a, a, a mental sense in the race in your favour. But that also brings on to an, a, another quite interesting point, actually, and it's it's a weird place to think that this is where we are with sim racing, where mental fitness and mental fatigue and mental training is such a key important part of this, just as much as your physical ability, your mental ability to last 2.4 hours, your mental ability to last for that last five minutes and really eke every tenth or, or two tenths out of a lap. It's it's just incredible to think that's that's where we are with sim racing. But you're absolutely spot on. It's it's so important to keep yourself in that frame of mind where you know you think you're you're not quite at that full potential just yet because you've always got that little extra that you can go. Um, on con on the flip side, conversely, if you've you know the best that you possibly can be, which let's face it, no sim racing driver is at their hundred percent level. They, there's there's no way they'd be able to do that for lap after lap after lap. They'd always be able to get extra time somewhere else. But if you are at that point where you can't gain anything else anyway. Uh, yeah, that that's spot on because you you would be so frustrated seeing maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten other drivers that are that are faster than you, and you, the temptation then is just to give up and think, well, I've got nothing more left to give. So what? A, what's the point? And B, what else can I do? Absolutely, uh, I, I, it can be crushing for a, a race, and so 
keeping that sort of, keeping a little bit in your pocket might be helpful. Lucas Kreuzer goes up into fifth place. You can see at the top of your session, George Boothby is back on pole. We're in the final six minutes of the session as we're focused on Sheldon Muscat, who, as a season, has actually qualified, as said before earlier in the session, has qualified a few times in, in some fairly decent stead. Uh, only finished once inside the top ten. A few mistakes across the season, it's almost you know, quite similar to that, um, that we saw there just at Nelson's. But uh, he qualified, he finished in seventh place uh, a couple of rounds ago back at Silverstone. Has had decent pace, but just hasn't nailed it. Has been fraught with a lot of mistakes. Has had two retirements, including last time out where there was a, a few issues um, for him. But uh, aiming to try and make something stick today. He qualified in a decent spot at present in sixth place. Comes into the pit lane ready for his final stop. Well, watch Patrick Nodge across the line who goes to fifth place to knock Lucas Kreutzer immediately out of it. We're now in that big improvement part of the session. George Boothby on the 145.516 at the moment heads the session, but will it stand? It's also nearly half a second up already. What uh, I mean, this is this, this is exactly what we've just been talking about for the past five minutes, right? Can you imagine being, say, Mesa, Van der Kelt or Herbenio and thinking, right, I've absolutely smashed that. I'm so happy with that lap. That is amazing. And Boothby just comes along, not only goes pole, and he looks like, uh, there you go, 145.1. I mean, come on. That is outrageous. That is pretty sensational oh busink as well up to third place we are getting some improvements at this point in the session once the tracks just got a little bit faster because uh, that best qualifying we've seen from busink all season up towards third still plenty of time left in the session but yeah they've left a little bit on the table to try and make something stick in the final moments you're wondering there who was in second position if you were sat at home thinking hang on there's a couple of names on here that i'm not too sure about 28th place and second place at the moment obviously we've had a few drivers who aren't taking part this evening because they've been uh, filled by a couple of spots. Uh, Seaman Damori is the driver who's currently up in second position. And then Zamfir Radu is the driver down in 28th, new to the Best of British Championship in the season finale. Good to have them along. Like seeing some drivers just joining us at the final moments of the session. You know, you, it, it's, it's always good to see them join a season, really try and uh, test themselves against drivers that have been firing it through for the last sort of four or five weeks. And we'll see what they can do over the final qualifying session of the season. Yannick Ruoff in the Lamborghini currently on the screen. He's down in 14th position to cross the line. Any positions gained? No, sorry, just stays in 14th. Andre Mesa down to fourth place there, but great to see uh, Simone de Mori in the 602 Audi up in second place there. As you said, look, it, it's a great chance for these the, these drivers to dip their toe in the water uh, at the end of the season and get a feel for what it's like right at the sharp end. Of course, uh, you know, Zamfir uh, Radu, no stranger to being in top split racing here at Simgrid. We've seen many championships and many of the support races with him in it as Andre Mesa exits stage right. That was uh, almost made to look on purpose. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, it's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see how it works out for him. Yeah, not not the <laughs> most ideal line through uh, Nelson. Although I can't really judge too hard because that's probably about where about where I would be. Um, certainly, if we were racing together, uh, we've not made that happen yet. It, it, it needs to happen, but the, I mean, it, it then goes loops back into that conversation about uh, motivation and things like that. I've obviously taken part in a couple of the Super Saturday support races, and I have absolutely no um, qualm about you know admitting that I am not as talented. I'm not anywhere near as talented as the the top 100, 150 drivers that take part in these races. But for me, I just take part because it's great fun, and I'm attention seeker, so I love seeing myself on the big screen. But the the ability to see your times so i'll go from maybe say three seconds off the pace to two seconds off the pace to a second and a half for me that's monumental and that's enough to keep me going so for a lot of these drivers who are maybe outside the top 20 being a second a second and a half off getting to under a second that will be like they've just won the championship for them Absolutely, uh, and that is kind of the, the small gains that some drivers will be looking for. Saw Morant as well on screen, another one of the uh, fairly newer drivers. Also, a bit of a note as well for those of you just joining us. We pointed out at the start of the session they were signed to be in this race. We are not sure where they are, but at present, Jan Zemis and Ogur Ognikov are not in the session. We are unaware as to where they are, um, but they are not here. Considering that's a championship leader and fifth place in the title race, 
I think there's going to be some questions asked. Mr. Super Saturday crosses the line and goes to fifth for Marcel Fusi. Final laps coming in. Andre Mesa and Morant are in the pit lane, which means they will not be setting a time over the final moments of this session as there is not enough time to get out onto the circuit. Can George Booth be hang on to pole position? Well, he's four tenths clear at the moment, which someone's got to put in an absolutely mega lap to go and beat him. And to be fair, I'm not sure anyone can. It's a massively tall order for uh, anybody to do that. And certainly you would have thought we'd, we'd get a little bit of a warning shot from a driver that was trying to, to do that. Um, yeah, I've got to be honest. I personally think it's a done deal, but with 38 seconds left to go, it's still an open book. Drivers get to, to start their last laps, but... Um, yeah, I, if I was uh, if I was Boothby, I'd be very very happy at that one tonight. Yeah, that's setting him in a good stead for potentially his third race victory of the season in only three races. Uh, Marcel Fusi currently on the screen. Final times coming in from some drivers. Jakob Ruoff, uh, 11th place. Jordan Soames, by the way, we were I, sorry, we were. I was criticising him a little bit earlier. Of course, we've seen some issues for him this season. Up in 10th place. Big, big shout. That is pretty impressive um, from him. So uh, hopefully he'll continue that form. Uh, a few drivers having good qualifying sessions. Olivier Kerton up in 14th position. We'll watch as Marcel Fusi comes around the final couple of corners to try and cross the line through Coram, through Murray's. That is a touch wide, and I don't think he'll be too impressed with it. And we'll bail to the pit lane as well. Why not get yourself some pit lane entry practice? Boothby on the pole position at the moment. Demori doing a great job up into second place i am just going to give another shout out though bussing up in third that is mega impressive yeah that's a, a fantastic fantastic uh, drive from Busink to get up into that third place i mean given how much he struggled through the season uh, that is just an absolute revelation turn of form so let's hope that translates into uh, a great lap there but i mean it's all about boothby on and that lap there christopher comes across the lines uh, and improves by three one hundredths of a second, not enough to improve his position, stays in 13th place. But Jordan Soans in that 23 Audi coming out of the corner. Eight tenths back uh, from your pole sitter, but he's looking like he's improving by about, what, two tenths of a second? This could be top six material. Uh, Niels van de Kekel starts, uh, needs to get in a little bit twitchy right now. Yeah, that's, uh, that's looking like a pretty decent lap thus far from Jordan Soames. Looked fairly decent from Coram. Uh, not so great through Murray's. There was a little bit slow and lethargic off. Let's see if he moves up a position. Currently qualified in 10th. Stays in 10th, but the top 10 will still be very much welcome. Saw Paul Batty just ahead of him come into the pit lane. Uh, so that was his session basically done. There is your qualifying order for the final round of the season. And it is another pole position for George Boothby. The last time he went to a 2.4 hour race at Donington, it was Boothby on pole. And where did he finish at the end of the race? You got damn right. It was up in P1. Simon de Mori will join him on the front row. Ilko Bussink, who's had a top 10, and that was at the final, at the previous 2.4 hour race back at Donington. And Andre Mesa, the pole sitter from Silverstone, will start from fourth. Herbenau van der out Patrick Nodge, Lucas Kreutzer, Sheldon Muscat and Jordan Soans will round out the top 10. Booth be in prime position then to potentially take the title this evening. We'll have to wait and see if he can do it, but there are people that will try and stop him. Look at the likes of Patrick Nodge, look at the likes of Lucas Kreutzer who are up there. Herbenau's not too far out, but realistically things are looking very, very strong for the triple six. Why are you seeing things, or did he sneak in an extra lap at the end there that just absolutely obliterated that? Even oh, he further? did actually. He, yeah, he was one. He was four tenths of a second up, and he's now went nearly six tenths of a second up on everyone. I, I, I just, I don't know what to even say about that. How, how can we sit here as commentators and and not look at him and just go, what in the air just happened there? I mean, if if he gets a clean start. There is absolutely nothing to stop him just tearing away with that if he can keep that pace up. And the fact that he just did two laps that were over half a second quicker than everybody else on this grid, that's scary stuff. I've been told it's quite good. Um, and <laughs> joking aside, he is 
very, very good. Top quality driver, of course, one that we've seen uh, time and time again across the sim grid and, of course, uh, in general in sim racing and a set of course of competizione. He's a very, very talented driver and is showing his abilities here, starting from the pole position. Damori is an unknown quantity in this championship. We'll be starting on the front row with Bussing, Mesa and Herben out behind. Plenty of drivers to keep their eye on. A reminder that it is a 2.4 hour race, three stops across this one. And I am going to put a bet now that George Boothby is going as far as is humanly possible to not only bag the interval points, but also try and get that race win. It was the same strategy it, he ran at Donington Park and he took all 105 points on that day. Things can fall apart fairly quickly though in sim racing as is the same as in motorsport. So don't count your chickens until the checkered flag comes out. Plenty of time until that one will be flown. Our season finale though in the best of British championship. Lovely weather though, unlike the last two rounds. Got a shout out to the to the the, the British weather. Now, we were warned about this last week. I, I called for rain, but uh, I'm happy with this. This is all right. Yeah, this is this is what you want. You want it being decided by the 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 raw talent of the drivers on the track, and uh, not by any varied conditions. So certainly for the next half hour, it's looking very very clear. Um, here's hoping that that goes on. But looking at the championship, I mean, at, at the moment as it stands, it's done. George Boothby currently um, eleven points behind, but given that Patrick Maj and Lucas Kreuzer, who are the championship contenders, who are second and third in the championship, but now with the uh, bombshell news that Igor Ogorondikov not taking part tonight, they are effectively P1 and P2 in the championship, George Boothby P3 in the championship, I mean all he has to do is score 11 points more than those two to, to take the title, I, I, this could be an absolute whitewash tonight. We did call it beforehand that we were, if there was one driver on the grid that we were expecting to try and, you know, be the, the, the driver with the highest potential to take this title, it would be George Boothby. I pulled that stat out before we went live as well, um, and just as we started, that uh, across the season, across the four races that we've had, 11 drivers have visited the podium, which means that only one driver has been on the podium twice. That is George Boothby. Now, to be fair, I wouldn't put it past us to see George Boothby on the podium and then see two new drivers on the podium as well to, to try and maximise our... Um, but to be fair, I actually wouldn't put it past us to, to see three new drivers on the podium, but you never know uh, with the way the Best of British Championship has gone. Obviously, Demori doesn't have a podium, being at his first round of the season. Uh, Bussink doesn't have a podium either. His highest finish has been 10th. The drivers behind, Mesa, Herbenau, uh, Van der Kakel, Noj, uh, they all have podiums. Lucas Kreutzer does not, though. Uh, considering he's third in the championship, I wouldn't I wouldn't say no. I think I think he can work his way up the order and potentially grab himself a podium. His race pace seems very, very good. And over a longer race, that's where things kind of add up. Certainly is. Just uh, looking at the, the race stats for uh, George Boothby here. 16 race starts with the, uh, the Sim Grids. Five race wins, six podium finishes and eight top 10 finishes. So what has happened to the other half of those races? That would uh, imply to me that George Boothby not only uh, picks and chooses, very selective about what uh, sim grid events that he takes part in, but that would mean that uh, in the other eight of those 16 races, he's finished outside the top 10. So uh, that's a little bit of an interesting statistic. From memory, they didn't have the best run um, in the SimGrid VCO World Cup a few weeks ago uh, when we did the 12 hours of Bathurst. More of that coming up this season. Of course, the Thrustmaster 24 hours of Spa will be up in a few weeks' time. We'll cover that off uh, in a little bit. But yeah, some, some races seem to go badly and you kind of wonder if that's going to play out as things uh, unfold today. It's not a stat I would want in the back of my mind. And to be fair, I don't think he'll be driving it with a stat in the back of his mind. He'll be focused on one thing today, and that is trying to take the race victory and trying to take the title. We spoke to him after uh, both Donington and Silverstone, and we asked about the title and that, that title chase. Is that really what he's aiming for? Knowing that he missed the first round, obviously he missed Brands as well, 100% he is focused on winning this championship because 
obviously you'd say, oh, why else would you be here? Oh, I just want to win a couple of races like Will Tregertha had at, um, at Donington. No, he is focused on the championship itself. He's focused on maximizing points. And so in that sense, you know he's put a little bit of work into this and you know that he is going to try and check out in the very early stages of the race. Yeah, that's certainly going to be the plan. And just while I was having a look through the statistics there, Marcel Fusi, I mean, that is an impressive record that he's got 40 race starts, obviously taking part in all of these support races as well. 12 race wins, 21 podium finishes, and 35 top 10 finishes. That is just I mean, I'd be I'd be want to print that out and frame that on my wall for that one. That is really, really something to to behold from Marcel Fusi. He's going to have his work cut out tonight down in fifteenth place. But again, is one of the outsiders with a mathem mathematical shot at the title tonight. Although I think that mathematical shot has been well and truly mortared into pieces by George Boothby. Yeah, the the thing with. Obviously, Mr. Super Saturday, Marcel Fusi. He's done every race on Super Saturday since its inception, uh, not just of the ones this season. has done the two previous to that as well, the two Super Saturdays we had before, and then this whole season uh, unfolding through the Super Saturdays that we've had has won, like you say, his, his, his fair share of races. But days like this are where things get quite difficult. Donington Park, we spoke about at the time, did the three support races, did the 2.4-hour race. With it being a 2.4-hour race, it's such a long effort across the day that you just don't really have time to breathe. And, and for him to do a 2.4-hour race to, to end the day, so he's got his work cut out for him to even stay focused over the 2.4 races. Uh, his last two finishes of the championship haven't been particularly good. 30th and 11th. The first two finishes, though, were 4th and 5th, including that 5th place finish at Donington Park. So I wouldn't count him out from working his way up the order. But like you say, he has got a lot of work to do. Yeah, he certainly does. And uh, I mean, let's not put anything past the uh, realms of possibility here. 2.4 uh, hour race to go three pit stops, points at the uh, the halfway mark. I mean, everything literally rests in the next two and a half hours. Plenty to play for then. It is season finale time in the best of British championship here at the Sim Grid. Coach Dave Academy and Thrustmaster guiding us through it. Lewis McLeay, David Christie in the comms booth as it's been all season. It is time to wrap this up with Booth being Demori on the front row, Bussing and Mesa behind. We'll be getting ready to go racing. Herbin now, our previous race winner with 35 kilos, will be starting from fifth. Then Noj, Van der Kelt, Kreuzer, Muscat, and Sones looking to sign off the season with the best results possible. Muscat and Sones will be definitely ones to keep an eye on. Hopefully, fingers crossed, they'll have themselves a nice, clean day. Boothby with two victories to his name then in the Best of British Championship is looking to make it a third. Let's see what he can do. Green flag is in the air and we are underway for the finale of the Best of British Championship and running into turn one at Rich's Zones. Oh, so Boothby was uh, under a lot of pressure there from Demori, but no way through. Bussick was looking to the inside as everyone's trying to fan their way out. That's Herbenau diving to the inside and nearly making contact. He does does make contact with Bussing. Herber now, that is going to be a slam dunk penalty. And Sheldon Muscat is spun for good measure. Cameron Bridport gets fired his way through. Novikov a part of that as well. Everyone was just in that calamitous affair. Started by Herber now's ambitious dive at Montreal. And that is near as makes no difference. A pretty easy decision for me. What I want to know is what, what heinous absolutely awful unspeakable crime has Sheldon Muscat done in a former no. life to deserve all this luck that he is or rather bad luck that he's had in this championship I mean that boy I, how he's not all f 4 and switched off his PC and just went outside I've got no idea but yeah like that was over egging it to the extreme on that and yeah slam dunk penalty let's uh, I, I hate to be sceptical but let's it is un uncharacteristic from Herber now, but I mean he's done it now. Just push on. Just you've got to undo the damage that you've done. He's already several cars ahead. Just get on with it. Did you say egging it to the extreme? I I, I did, but completely unintentionally. Okay, yeah, but no, no, that's in fine. hindsight, in hindsight, I am taking credit for that punt. No, no, that's 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 fine. You uh, you do you. Uh, Herber now, of course, did have a penalty in the first round at Alton Park. It was kind of off camera. 
uh, had great, great pace to keep up with Jan Zemis. And then after uh, a, an earlier pit stop, I think when he was coming back through the order, got himself a penalty. I think it might have even been a stop and go 30, which, to be fair, for that kind of instant and that kind of crash towards the start on the first lap for, for a, basically kind of a, a lack of care and pushing it a little bit too far, I wouldn't be too surprised if the same sort of penalty is dished its way. Hearts go out to, obviously, Sheldon Muscat and Novikov and everyone else involved in all of that. Of course, to Busink as well, who is still going, who is in 16th place, who clearly had good pace after qualifying in third. See him in the background. Um, hopefully, he'll be able to, to pull his way through to a decent result. Chris Sever and Phillips going side by side as we run through Palmer. They've been going side by side for a couple the corners we are told and they are continuing to do so Phillips in the Bentley's got to go around the outside of Agostini though and that's not normally one that favors well because the run through Hamilton just always goes the way of the inside and Phillips not able to uh, to hold that position or grab that position whatever way it was going and Sever is in 12th yeah, a lot of pressure, and that Bentley's looking very, very angry to try and get past. But have a look who's hiding in the background as well. Marcel Fusi tucked onto the back of that group. Here's the replay then. You see Herbino in the blue Mercedes on the middle of your picture, just behind the McLaren there. He's going to make a dive out to the right-hand side, tries to outbreak himself. And to be fair, to be fair to Herbino... He gets it. I, yeah, I thought he got it, yeah, and uh, but he didn't have any time to react to that car turning in. Uh, the thing is, is where he's committed. Now, he, he, he missed the apex by a little bit, right? It wasn't actually that much, but he did miss the apex and he was coming in on a way, way too tight line into um, the Montreal Wilson hairpin. Uh, and so from that, like, it, like, I'm still standing by it. That's a pretty slam dunk, uh, like Herman Owls sorted. Um, but it's just, it's a massive... I mean, I'm not going to, like... It was maybe worth it to try and dive it on the, the first lap there, but that was just a little, little bit too much. Just too aggressive in the early stages of the race. And unfortunately, that is day done for quite a few competitors, and that will probably include, uh, depending on when race control get on it, Herbin out as well. We're focused on the battle then for the lead. Simone de Mori, who's right on the back of George Boothby. Boothby trying to settle things and sort himself out. A third victory in the Best of British Championship. De Mori thinks, well, I've come along for this day's race and this day's race only, and there is only one thing I am playing for, and that is top honours today. And he is very, very fast at the moment. Fastest lap of the race, though, uh, on the previous one, of course, uh, came the way of Andre Mesa. Yeah, great lap from Andre Mesa. Uh, very intrigued to see Simone de Mori, though. Uh, just six tenths of a second. Uh, but it uh, looks like Olivier Curtin has crashed out of P7, oh. gets recovered, and that's Van de Kekel. Oh, you can see how frustrated Van de Kekel is. A little nudge on the back of the Porsche there. I think I think Van de, I think Van de Kekel... OK, right, this is a, like a little bit much maybe but it, it seemed like he was pushing him to get going is what i i kind of saw and what we're, we're being told it kind of looked like in a sense that what i'm going to assume there is that van der Kael potentially made a move into oggies that didn't work out and van der Kael has now gone um so that's always good jakob ruoff as well running off at nelson's for for good measure but yeah I, i'm gonna probably suggest in that sense that van der Kael had an issue with olivia Curtin uh going into oggies which is very easy to do to launch one down the inside and then cause an incident was pushing him to try and get going and now has bailed from the race seen quite a few in, uh, issues from van der Kael over the um, the, the, the few races that we've had. Remember back to Donington Park was right in the thick end of things uh, on that day and seems to have continued that today. A few drivers coming into the pit lane, Paul Batty being one of them to take off his first one. A few other drivers have also been into the pit lane, including uh, the driver that qualified in third place, Bussink as well. Yeah, great to see Niels van der Kekel taking advantage of that brand new Invisibility Cloak DLC that was released the other week there, just uh, in the middle of a straight and just absolutely vanishes. That's a, a very strange one, because you think if he was going to quit the race, he would have just pulled off the track and then out all F forward, but it did look like uh, a, a technical problem. And this is the run yep. into, oh, yeah, yeah, as you said earlier, that's a slam dunk case right there as well. Niels van der Kekel, absolutely no right to be up the inside there. Uh, tries to keep him going as well. I, I don't like that because that's adding insult to injury, adding a little bit more damage to that Porsche. I know obviously he's trying to get him back up to speed, but yeah, I, I, I don't like that at all. 
It did look like Olivia Curtin was a starting in about eighth gear for a good measure as well, because it was a very slow pull away from the uh, the Porsche. But it's, it, that is something that I think we will see uh, once again a bit later on today uh, at Oggies, because it's such an it's an inviting corner. You kind of want to dive down the inside, but that's always where incidents happen. And I do not think it will be the last time we see of it today. Andre Meister on the back of Herbenau uh, did see that Demori had closed up to Boothby, set the fastest lap of the race on the previous rotation circuit. This lap, though seems to have had a little bit of a mistake in it from Demori because uh, Boothby's been able to pull away a little bit. Andre Mesa, in this sense, as much as you'd say, he doesn't need to pass Herbert now because we're expecting a penalty to head the way of, uh, of, of Alexander Herbert now. At the same time, though, that penalty's not come through yet, so every kind of lap you're sat behind is wasted time, it's wasted potential. I want to get through ASAP so that I can start attacking those two leaders. Absolutely, but it's again you've you've got to have your three thousand IQ hat on um, to to think that well Herbino the pace that he's got is actually not that bad one forty six seven that last lap round he's still doing a one forty six six if it starts to the point where Herbino starts slowing Mesa down into the one forty sevens absolutely then you're going to try and force the matter but for just now I'd be very content to sit behind Herbino take a little sip of that toe and uh, just keep the pace going through potentially even save a little bit of fuel whilst you're at it for good measure. I uh, won't be able to save too much fuel around here, but nevertheless, I'd still save a, a little bit whilst I could. Uh, again, I uh, spoke on the last round uh, at Brands, that if you're running in second, if you're running in third, if you're running in fourth, as long as you can see the leader, especially at this early stage, I'm not worried. As long as I'm keeping control of things, as long as I'm part of this train, I am not panicking right now. That gap, though, between Herbenau and Demori, that might begin to concern. I uh, did get the note from race control last time out when everyone drove, uh, say it again, really, really well in the tricky conditions of Brands. Um, the race control said that... Uh, We've almost got nothing to do. Everyone was so well behaved. They had like a few incidents to look at, but for the most part, was all very, very well behaved. Today, we've seen those cracks. We've seen that all coming through once again. Uh, and hopefully things will continue uh, in the way that we saw at Brands and, and we'll return to some fairly clean racing. We're looking at a trio of Ferraris that are fairly close. Moretti, Wolf Gruber and Schwab are directly behind. They're also caught up to the back of the Lamborghini of Jakob Ruoff. We've got Novikov in the background as well, who got a lot of it, uh, damage from the incident with the Montreal hairpin on lap one. We'll see if he can get himself involved in this as well in the Bentley. Had a podium to his name at the first round of the season and sort of flown a bit under the radar ever since. Yeah, just back to that point about uh, race control complaining they had nothing to do, Lewis. It's uh, almost like the drivers have heard that comment and thought, no, nah, we're, go we're going to make you sing for your supper tonight. You guys are going to be working uh, overtime. And uh, to be fair, though, I mean, it's it's not actually been that bad. As we go back to the leaders, Simone de Mori having a proper little go here. And, uh, well, this is starting to get a little bit exciting. I don't think either of us saw uh, this one unfolding. Yeah, I wonder if this is Boothby controlling his pace. Saw this at Dollington Park. He controlled his pace really, really well in the early stages. It allowed Will Tregertha and um, Patrick Notch to be a part of this battle. I don't necessarily think this is too much in the form book in that sense. But Boothby's um, uh, longevity in a race is well known that he's always playing the long game, flew under the radar for the entirety of Silverstone and ended up winning the race anyway. Um, he, he is sort of playing that sort of book. So maybe that's kind of where we're at, at the moment but either way he is putting himself on a bit of risk because Simone de Mori is right over the back of him looked like there was a very much a potential move at Agostini but no way through at present now we're focused on uh, the battle for seventh almost tripped over myself there thinking that it was like Jordan Soans in P7 go on give it some that is pretty impressive yeah, that's a, a great first uh, 15 minutes for Jordan to get himself up into into P7. Uh, to, to go back to the, the leaders as well, you know, with that thing about Boothby, um, it, he, we know the pace he's got. He's got scandalous, scandalous pace. And uh, he could be uh, trying to do some, uh, some extreme fuel saving here. But the point being, would you want to put yourself in that much risk, in that much danger, with given that he's uh, in third place in the championship I don't know if I'd be 
That's a solid no out of 10 uh, in all senses to the point and also to the internet connection of David Christie. We're now on the battle with Boothby, Demori, Herbenau and Mesa as they're all very, very close together. I would not want to be putting myself at the risk. Especially, in a sense, I, I don't know how much these two have raced with each other outside of this, but especially in a sense with an unknown quantity uh, in the Best of British Championship of Demori, because uh, Demori is a driver that he's not raced against in this championship, David. And uh, again, I, I am with you. I think he, if, if it is fuel saving, if it is playing the long game in the race, maybe he's just applying a little bit too much risk. That said, we've seen a couple of mistakes a little bit out of Boothby. He is pushing the car hard. Yeah, these are uh, some fast lap times, but not as fast as he can do. I mean, look at that, 147 for that last lap round, and Simone de Mori really pushing it um, to the extreme here. Herbino getting brought into this battle as well, as is Andre Mesa. And and we've seen Herbino make one wild lunge up the inside. Oh, I, I just don't know what's going to gonna happen here. Uh, Ruoff is off at the, uh, the bomb hole, it looks like. Uh, yeah, that's uh, not gone well, but... Demori, what a performance. What a breakthrough entry for him. Yeah, there is uh, Yannick Ruoff, who was fairly impressive pace-wise when we did the last 2.4 hour race at Donington Park, was involved in that incident um, with... Uh, that was how Jan Zemis got his penalty for a poor rejoin on the front of Yannick Ruoff coming out of the old hairpin when uh, Jan Zemis got punted off from Niels van der Kerk, from memory, so don't quote me on that. Uh, was running quite well, but I'm going to assume there might have been an incident between uh, Ruoff and Moretti because Moretti was directly behind him, was a part of that Ferrari train with Wolf Ruber and Schwabe uh, that was directly behind for 16th place. And I'm wondering if something has happened and they've all kind of come a cropper to that. For, for Boothby though, we're, as we're focused from Herbenau's car to the top two in the race, he's 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 playing it, he's playing it long. This is a, if you've ever watched MotoGP, uh, and making his returns again anyway, we were completely off topic. Uh, Mark Marquez always races like this in a sense. Uh, it's like he knows he's the fastest and basically just plays the long game and waits for everyone else to wrap themselves around him. And then at the final moment of the race, he clears off. That's what happened. Uh, um, so was that a really big dive from Moretti? Or was that Jakob Ruoff going too slow into Nelson, if you get what I mean? Maybe he was going unpredictably slow, I don't know, but it seemed like a pretty big send. Yeah, it looked like straight up murder to me. It did, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, RIP to that one. That's uh, that's a shame. That would be so frustrating. And there's quite possibly uh, some heavy, heavy damage. But uh, Simone de Mori now from going to challenging George Boothby for the lead uh, is under intense pressure now from Herbino in that third place there. Herbino, again, I'd be very, very wary. We've seen him make that lunge up the inside, maybe unintentionally. But uh, yeah, two hours, 10 minutes left to go. And uh, these two, these three would be well thought to just tuck in and uh, calm things down a little bit. Kelly ahead of Sohn. Sohn's making a bit of a mistake through Riches and maybe he's going to be dived by the Ferrari of Morand. Gets it to the apex at the Montreal hairpin and kicks it off. And it's not going to be hard fought from Jordan Sohn. So I think he might leave it down the inside though as we run towards Palmer. And he'll hook up that apex and keep ahead of the Ferrari. So it is fairly hard fought. But he's going to go for the cutback and the dive down the inside of Agostini. The blue Ferrari just trying to make his way up the order. Dropping down a couple of positions at this stage of the race is Jordan Sohn's. There's the position done from Morant and there was almost going to be a cutback from Jordan Soames but alas it was not the case. These three seem to be splitting apart and then coming back together again and splitting apart and then coming back together again and as we say I think Boothby is trying to control things from here. Herbenau though just to that point when it comes to uh, his race remember back to that incident that he had at Alton Park. Again we didn't see it but we can still talk about it because he was incredibly apologetic about it in um, in the, the, the YouTube chat after the, or even during the race because he did retire from that one. And I kind of get the feeling that he seems, at least from this sense, that is the kind of role that he knows exactly what happened down at turn two. And he knows what went wrong. And so he's probably feeling a, a, as guilty about it as you would kind of expect as Simone de Mori did not fancy any part of the apex at Murray's and now might open himself up for a move from Herbenau. But yeah, Herbenau will probably be driving with his conscience right now and thinking, look, I'm not going to risk anything right now. I already know that I'm under fire at the moment.
it's a difficult one though isn't it because i mean uh, being honest it's it's a racing mistake it's and, and that's what it is it wasn't intentional there wasn't any deliberate malice he just put it put it up the inside the car wouldn't break as much as he wanted it to and he made contact it will almost certainly be a penalty from race control that's fine that that's what's going to happen anyway what he needs to do now is almost put that out of his head and just push as hard as he can he knows Oof. he's very likely going to get that penalty anyway so his best bet is just to keep pushing keep pushing and see what happens here Simone de Mori wide at Palmer out over the grass and just allowing George Boothby to pull away as things stand and Boothby will be liking that whether he's controlling things or not we're looking backwards from Simone de Mori to Herber now to Mesa as well who once again is closing back in there's been a lot of mistakes from drivers today nothing too major uh, in a sense at least not from this top four but Let's be real, there's been quite a few apexes in this, particularly um, that one down at uh, through, you know, once you come through Corum, once you try and hit that apex at Murray's. I've seen drivers miss that one time and time again. Andre Mesa, I'm pretty sure, is looking at a 50% apex ratio at the moment as he misses another one running through Brundle. There, it, obviously, it is a hard circuit, naturally. It's a, a high commitment circuit, and some of the apexes are fairly blind by the time you get through to the corner. But there is a lot of mistakes coming in as Sheldon Muscat has got ahead of your favourite car, Cameron Bridport. Yeah, we're not really seeing as much of that car of Cameron Bridport that I'd like to see, but it uh, looks like that he is uh, potentially DNF'd. Uh, oh no, sorry, in fact, he's, he's just fine, I'm sorry. Um, but the, the whole point of that is, with the times dropping down, look, we were doing 146s, we're now into the heavy 147s here so something's changed I, I mean the track temperature 30 degrees and uh, the air temperature quite warm as well 22 degrees it's uh, I, I think the tires starting to drop off through that first phase uh, obviously we've got three pit stops left to go um I'd be, be very, very interested to see how it pans out. Uh, Sones and uh, the number 81 behind him of Sever doing personal best, but in relative terms, that's still just uh, in the low 147. So we'll maybe see things pick up pace again in about 20 minutes' time. Potentially, if we focus on, or, you know, focus on the time that Boothby's done, his last time, 47-1, over the last couple of laps, he did end up doing a couple of uh, mid-47s whilst he had Demori on him. Once Demori dropped back, that was his time to open up the uh, the pace. Uh, Andre Mesa, as part of that group, he's done a 47.2, so there is still pace in that group, but they are pulling away from the rest of the field fairly rapidly. Jakob Ruoff, who's come out of the pit lane, who is a lap down uh, on Lucas Kreutzer, who's come out of the pit lane, ahead of them and is keeping pace comfortably uh, with the, 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 the chasing pack behind. Uh, Kreutzer, Patrick Noz, Christian Kelly, Morant, Sone, Sever, uh, Sever's a little bit far from back, but they're all still a part of this train for fifth place and they're all sort of struggling to try and keep up with this top lot. There we are then, it is dished out to Alexander Herber now and it is a drive-through penalty that has gone his way. We knew it was coming, he probably knew it was coming, and that is it sorted. The one, two, three has had his justice delivered. Right side of things, could have been worse. Could have had a stop go Green. penalty, uh, could have had a, uh, a, a, you know, a time penalty added on. You know, I, I think that's actually doable. It's, uh, it's maybe going to take him out of contention for the win, but again, maybe still in with a shout of top five maybe even still a podium uh it's very very early still two hours to go uh, he's got a lot of pace in that car well consider their pace to the the, the pack behind um a drive through i would wait to take it as late as possible in that window obviously it's a few laps um yeah, try and take it a little bit later just in a sense of they they seem to have better pace than everyone else and whilst he might be being held up by simone de mori which is frustrating as it, the, the cars that are further back that he'll probably come out in once he's served that drive through are probably going to be slower than Demori, so you might as well just try and gain as much as you possibly can and then serve that drive through come out and then see where things stand. That penalty could have been worse um, considering uh, everything that happened and I think he might well be a lucky boy to uh, get away with only a drive through but um, I, like I said, I don't think anyone is shocked. I don't even think he is and so in that sense, I almost think that he's probably been waiting for 
the best part of 20 minutes just basically yelling come on just give me the penalty already so that i already know because like you when you when you know it's coming you're just like just 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 give it to me and let's just get on with this yeah i and that's oh, it it's that whole... what's happened to simone de mori sorry to cut you off simone de mori uh, out of bomb hole going into quorum oh and that is not an ideal rejoin straight nearly into the side of Jakob Ruoff what has happened to Simone de Mori was it her now was it himself oh I've got a feeling that might be either going way way too wide into a corner or possibly even a, a hardware failure he just almost straight lined that corner and uh, yeah, we'll, I'm sure we'll get a replay from uh, Mike Yow, our, uh, our broadcast director. But Andre Mason now, he smells blood. Uh, this is one thing that you always point out. Uh, the, the smart move is like, he's obviously got to take his drive through, so why would you push? But the thing is, is that you see the car in front of you, you still want to get your way past it as soon as possible. Mason now unwittingly being thrown into second place after all of this, but Boothby now, that's his chance to go hold shot. That's three oh. seconds up. Oh, dive up the inside there from Moran. That was almost not intended, but he made it stick. Thomas Moran uh, up his way into seventh place through on Christian Kelly as they run through Hamilton. I, I, he didn't intend to make that one, but he certainly did and dived it down there. Got it stuck. There's a little bit of contact with the apex, but for me, that is all on it. Lost it on the curb at Bombhole. Oh, no, 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 no. And Demori then cut across the entire circuit. I'm not going to lie, that rejoin needs a, a good looking at, um, either to himself or from race control. Like, this is this trajectory here is just, what are you doing, mate? But. I mean, he's lucky to get away with just that. Heard of keeping yourself off the racing line, but I think that is starting to stretch the ends of it just very, very slightly. Um, uh, yeah, I, the, the thing is, there's two separate things. Cutting across all that grass, I mean, I, I don't know why he just didn't just jump back into the uh, to, to the, the, the track, but decided to straight line it, go straight for that. And then that rejoined itself. Yeah, that was uh, quite amusing. However, I can imagine it wasn't amusing for the uh, for the the car that was just entering the corner there. Oh, Herbenau's not on the server anymore. Interesting. I was going to say he's gone to serve his drive through penalty, but unless his drive through penalty has taken the entirety of my life, he is not inside the top twenty three. Which, considering there's pit stops and stuff involved towards the bottom end, I think Herbenau is out of the race. I'm just uh, having a look on that one. He's in uh, in pit lane at the moment, but yeah, he's been disqualified. He did oh, serve it, he did serve it. That's why. So he's he's been uh, DQ'd. So goodbye, Herbinal. Goodbye, uh, Championship Popes. Yeah, I mean, I, when I said you know, maybe take it as late as possible, I did mean take it. Yeah, the, uh, the, the operative word there being take it as late as possible. You did still say take it. It's, um, uh, I think, I'm just trying to think of, it just happened in motorsport a few times. There was one um, that I distinctly remember from DTM at Austria. I think it was Wickens, uh, if I remember correctly. And he got given a drive to penalty for something, which was pretty rough. Um, and whilst the entire t the, the team was arguing the, the penalty for, uh, you know, laps and laps, and for some reason, unknown to literally everyone, they told him to stay out because they're going to argue the penalty. Now, I'm. Uh, Whilst a penalty, you know, if it gets served and you come in and serve it, then you know, I get it, it's too late and whatever. But let's be honest, race control don't tend to overturn penalties. They're never going to overturn a DQ. And in this sense, they certainly aren't, because they can't uh, for realistically in that scenario. Um, why would they? Uh, it, yeah, a little bit, maybe a little bit short-sighted. I don't know quite how he's made that mistake, but um, just either way, just completely forgot to come into pit lane and day done I am afraid nevertheless we've still got plenty of battles on circuit Morant is one of them who's been working his way forward and is now on the back of Patrick Nash brilliant little effort there I, what I'm also surprised is Simone de Mori only he's only down to third place now with the fact that Herbino uh, has uh, DQ'd from the uh, the race itself that is uh, impressive 
Yeah, he, as I say, Demori will just start his march back up and try and close down on Andre Mesa. I think George Boothby is well and truly gone at this stage. Um, just done a 47.3 on the previous lap. Mesa's done a 47.3 as well. Demori's done a 47.4. But Demori is quite considerably faster than the chasing pack behind. Uh, another penalty coming through. You can see it on your screen there. Moretti uh, getting on in the 992. That was on Jakob Ruoff, drive through penalty. That would have been coming down through Brundle and Nelson. That massive dive uh, to the inside that just absolutely sent the Lamborghini off the road. Never the nicest to see, is it? But uh, I've got the no one's no doubt whatsoever that that's not going to be the uh, the last time we see that in the next two hours. I can't believe we're already into uh, two hours left to go. We're surely going to start seeing pit stops soon. Uh, drew off into the pits, but again, all of those top 20 need to start coming in for the pit stops. Would you pit though? Um, it depends where I was. If I was outside the top 20, absolutely I'd get them out of the way ASAP. Just get them done, try and move myself up through the positions. As soon as you're into the top 20, then you start reacting to the cars around you, um, potentially trying to get an undercut where possible, but uh, just eking out as much as you can. Uh, as you said, by this point, if you're not in the championship hunt, then the points almost certainly don't matter. It's a case of just getting yourself up for the uh, as good a position as you can. So um, with Morant, with um, Demori, uh, and that lot of these drivers that are fairly new and into this, um, you know, they're, they're, they're joining just for the round. They, they can take their pistols whenever they want. They don't care about the halfway points. And there is Alexander Herbie now. So we take that point that I made about race control won't uh, overturn a disqualification threat straight in the bin, uh, because they did. However, they're not going to give him his laps back. Why would they, again, in that sense? It does mean, though, that he has served more than his fair share of penalties, so he doesn't have to, to serve a drive-through. But the DQ in two laps will do it justice, I guess. Uh, Herbin and will just continue. We'll see if he gets to the checkered flag. Um, but, yeah, fair enough. Uh, respect to him if he does keep going, goes all the way to the checkered flag. Uh, but it is a long trek to it. Two hours to go in this race. Morant is the driver who we're focused on at the moment as he is marching forward. But don't count out Christian Kelly behind him because Kelly had moved up the order FDE positions, got by Jordan Soans a few laps prior, was not happy at the move that Thomas Morant put on Agostini, saw him flashing all the way through Corum. Uh, on the back of the Ferrari, that 137 is pushing really, really hard at the moment to try and make up those positions. And my question to that, you reckon he's overdoing his tyres a little bit? I think he's uh, just answered that question for us right now as uh, Marant comes into the uh, the pits. Kelly, uh, I've had uh, experience of, of watching Kelly race in, in other platforms and other championships and he is a, a very very competition competitive and competition minded driver he takes his, his etiquette very very seriously and if you do him wrong um, yeah, you better be watching your rear view mirrors for a couple of laps because he will not be letting you forget about that. Very fast driver. Um, it was, let's face it, it was a very, very cheeky move up the inside by Moran, but like, the gap was there. He forced the issue. It's up to race control if they thought it was too much, but personally, I think it was absolutely fair. So do I. I think it was. I think it was aggressive. It was, you know, very elbows out, but. I think it was it was fair. I wouldn't I, if it was the other way around. If I was in Christian Kelly's position, I would not be happy at someone diving me in that situation. But it is what it is. Uh, Marcel Fusi, by the way, uh, who's now in eleventh position, don't know what happened to him at, uh, at Riches, but I did see a car going fairly slow. Not too sure what was going on, and he did relinquish a position to Olivia Kerton. So not sure what's happened to the Mercedes, to Mr. Super Saturday, but alas, a position has been dropped anyway, as we're focused on uh, Wolf Gruber, who is on the back of Daniel Kiefer, who, let, I, I've got them the wrong way around the entirety of the season between Daniel and David Kiefer. Daniel is the one that's in the Porsche, and David is the one that's in the uh, Aston, and they make things really easy by never being on track near each other at all. Ha 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 ha. They're running 12th and 14th and quite close, let's be honest. So this is going to be interesting. 
It certainly is, and I'll mix them up at least several times between David and uh, and Daniel Kiefer. But uh, Daniel getting the upper hand as it is at the moment in the porch in 12th place. Did a fairly decent job of uh, keeping himself ahead of that Ferrari, the, uh, the number 15 of Christopher Wolfgruber. As uh, confirmation just comes round there, Christopher uh, and Harry Phillips absolutely juking it out right now as well. Jordan Sones, though, up into that seventh place. We mentioned him a couple of times already. I mean, that is a performance right now. To get that 23 Audi up into seventh place, it was, a, it was a decent start, but this has been a very, very spirited attempt from him. And at least for his sense, you know, for more so for pride than anything else, to move himself further up in the championship um, from his current position will be very helpful indeed because let's be honest for, for him in this sense it's not had the greatest season um, and realistically could be getting himself some decent points at the end of the race of course but also some decent interval points as well which will be coming up in uh, just over around about 40 minutes time um, when we get to those interval points of course halfway through the race half points are dished out so it'll be 35 points to the race leader at that point uh, of the race so we'll keep our eye and see where people are running because those points could be uh, could be beneficial especially to those that are sort of somewhere down in the championship that are putting on some decent drives today the likes of Jordan Sainz I'm pretty sure that Sheldon Muscat would have wanted to have uh, been a part of that currently running a 22nd position after that second corner incident still making some decent recovery up the order yeah, it, it could have been so much different for him. We've mentioned how terrible his luck has been down in 22nd place. He's had just no luck whatsoever. Um, I don't know if we mentioned it, I maybe missed it, but um, we did get a drive-through penalty for the uh, the number 992 of Demiano Moretti for that straight-up homicide on the uh, the 297 of Janek Ruoff on uh, lap seven. I mean, that was a that was a, just a straight up killing, uh, a punt to pass if ever I've seen one. But um, it, it's great to see that race control being very very consistent on the punishment of these uh, of these incidents. I do really like how you don't beat around the bush and you just tell it how it is. Straight up. I, I think. Well, the thing is, is that normally you'd be like, "Oh, that's unfortunate." Or you're like, but when you see a car getting absolutely smashed off into the uh, the uh, the countryside here, there's very little left to to comment on other than you know, pass on my condolences. Uh, again, I, I've been told time and time again that that um, using the, the phrase slam dunk in a sense uh, on a broadcast is is apparently decent. I'm I'm, I'm a sort of gear or down. I'm not really that bothered uh, take it or leave it but in that sense there is no doubt it is a slam dunk penalty because it was um, a spirited attempt into Nelson not one that worked out uh, and yes a drive through penalty seemed fair because there was quite a lot of damage on Jakob Ruoff's car we're now focused on the three way fight at present for fourth place Lucas Kreuzer who was struggling in the early phases of Brand Tatch seems to be struggling in the early phases here currently running in the 48 which is a solid second slower than our race leader and fellow McLaren driver George Boothby uh, Lucas Kreuzer I say he's worked his way up the order in the championship has finished sixth fifth and sixth in the last few races and now holds himself up in that position as Christian Kelly comes into the pit lane for his first stop yeah we're starting to see these strategies starting to play out again none of the uh, the, the I, I, I say top 10 but obviously Christian was in the top 10 but I mean it drops him down there's still a significant number in that top 20 who have not taken that pit stop yet and I think that's a great move from Kelly because he was in, in the middle of a, a decent battle there but he could make up some places as he heads into the uh, into the pits just now. Keep an eye for him when he comes out. But another man who has made huge progress right now, Alexander Novikov up at the P16. I mean, he was what at the back of the field after that incident with uh, that, that involved Muscat as well. And uh, he's just making huge strides to come through the field. You really had to talk about him, didn't you, right at this moment? He's just been off. Oh, right. oh well. <laughs> he, he just went off. Never the mind, then. The yellow flag that came out. Sorry, I didn't mean to just throw you under there. I've done that a few times this season. Sorry, mate. Elko Busink, who is currently on screen, uh, has been off the road uh, down at the uh, Montreal hairpin. 
uh, yeah, just been been sent packing himself. So for the second time coming a cropper at that corner, whether it's by himself or courtesy of someone else's misfortunes, uh, it is another one for the Audi man who started out today in such a good sense. Brilliant qualifying up in third place. The race is not going his way as he is down in 20th. Has taken a pit stop though. The first of three across the final race of the season. Battle continues here as uh, Lucas Kreutzer, Patrick Nodge uh, closing in or still very close. A reminder, obviously, that Christian Kelly came into the pit lane, but they are being closed down on by Jordan Soans behind. Let's see what happened to the 43. And I'm pretty sure, considering how everyone is, it's by himself. Yeah, looks to me, just gets two wheels onto the grass there, tries to keep control of it, brings the car on the edge of the circuit there. No harm, no foul. He'll get the car back on. Yeah, I'm not Ooh. a fan of that. That's He got away with it because that is a deceptive camera angle, but that's still a little bit too close for comfort because if that all it takes is that car behind to miss its breaking point and uh, you've, you've got some tears before bedtime. Uh, yeah, it was Morant that was coming through and whilst Bussing is behind Morant, I'm pretty sure that Morant had to lift a little bit there, just being a little bit cautious. I'm sure there was room, but yeah, I'm, I'm sort of with you that potentially playing it a little bit more patient would have been better as Wolf Gruber has gotten by on Daniel Kiefer as the position switches around we saw that battle a little bit earlier the Ferrari man and now up into 11th position Marcel Fusi the next driver for him who's just inside the top 10 Mr Super Saturday and Olivier Kerton who was involved in that incident with uh, Niels van der Kelt uh, coming through Oggies, uh, obviously in the early stages of the race, is the next car down the road as he is setting his sights on Harry Phillips and is very, very close indeed. Certainly is. And what a race we've already had. We're barely even, you know, half an hour into, into the race here. It has just been so much action, but it's nowhere near what I thought it was. I thought George Boothby was going to absolutely sail off into the sunset for uh, all of this race, and that's not happened. I'm really, really glad for that. Fair enough, Andrew Mesa really struggling to, to keep up with him just now. But for that first 15 minutes... Yeah, I was starting to get a little bit curious as to what Simone de More had in the tank for that one. Lucas Kreuzer, uh, one of the, uh, the the championship challengers ahead of Naj right now. A again, two hours left to go. This is, uh, this is all going to unfold in front of our very eyes. Let's talk championship then, because this is where things get important. As much as George Boothby's leading the way, we're not too far away from points being dished out in the race at the first point because obviously we've got interval points at the halfway points about half an hour away before we get to it and the man directly behind this driver that we're focused on fair, both of them in a sense uh need to march their way forward uh, off the road there is that moretti i think it is um certainly is uh, who's just off the road now the way going another lap down it is fine uh kreutzer Nage, they need to march forward points at the halfway uh stage of the race they are still at the moment at this point um, all things considered, ahead of George Boothby in the championship. Patrick Nagy is second in the championship, 186 points. Lucas Kreutzer is third in the championship on 178 points as we focus on Olivier Kerton to see if he'll make a move on Harry Phillips on that run on the Bentley straight into Brundle and through Nelson. I'm not 100% sure he's going to outgrunt the Bentley. I don't think he will. Back to the point then. Uh, Boothby is in fourth place in the championship, 175 points. The points that will be dished out at the halfway point in the race uh, at the moment, it'll be 35 points to Boothby. But realistically, the likes of Kreutzer and Nodge, they're not too far away from scoring some decent points themselves. Fourth and fifth uh, at present will score them 26 and 25 points. So they will uh, obviously drop basically 9 and 10 to the, uh, the race leader. But if anything happens, oh, you, you need to be scoring as good a points as possible through that mid-stage of the race. Andre Mesa, who's currently in second, will be scoring 30. So if you can get to, to roughly that position, get yourself onto the podium in that sense, it's going to help is to a certain extent uh, the the whole thing about if anything happens with George Boothby it's it's a difficult one because obviously the way it's gone this season is that if he's here he wins that's just it's as straightforward as that he's uh, been here for two out of the four races he's won the two of them and this one he's looking very very good for right now uh, it's going to feel for the the other two for uh, Lucas Kreuzer and for uh, Naj almost like one of those uh, you tried medals you know you, you turned up you gave it your best shot 
on here's a pat on the back. It's a uh, it's a bit of a slap in the face when they've they've been here for for. Uh, in the case of uh, Kreuzer, he's been here for all four rounds. Nash has only been here for three of the four rounds. But, you know, George Boothby, I mean, it, it just shows and it just exemplifies the, the performances that he's been able to pull in. Three wins and he takes the championship, potentially. I, and just a reminder again, no drop scores. Like, that's just the, that's the big thing for me. All the points count, and that's where this becomes such a surprise and why it's been such an impressive few races that Boothby's done, really showing on what is a fairly, uh, fairly, in air quotes, um, competitive field, because it is very competitive out there. Um, he's he's come along and, and looked strong every single time he's done it. I'm curious to see what would have happened in the early stage of the races had there not been the penalty for Herbenau, had there not been the issues for Damori, but... Uh, alas, he is going from strength to strength. Running out of the final corner through Murray's as we complete another lap on the racetrack. Lucas Kreutzer once again defending from Patrick Nodge. The Aston Martin just not able to do anything. But of course, as you can see behind, Soans and Severe have very much closed in on this. Olivier Kerton comes into the pit lane to serve his first of three stops. And this battle continues. Uh, but Sever is right a part of it. The bit of a mistake there from Lucas Kreutzer, but still, still, still no way through for Patrick Noz. And do you know what this is doing? It's just making things get more and more frustrating, and the Hungarian will be becoming more and more desperate. I thought, I thought for a minute there you were going to say the Hungarian is going to get even more hungry. It's uh, left, left waiting on that one. But uh, yeah, Noz. <laughs> Oh, I just did it for you, you know. Um, yeah, look, Naj is, is really damned if he does and damned if he doesn't right now because he needs to try and fire past Kreuzer if he can. But, I mean, Jordan Soans, what an effort. We've said this time and time again through the past 40 minutes here. Uh, just a, a stunning, stunning drive. Still got, like everybody else around him, still got the three pit stops to do. But back up into sixth place, I mean, that is scary pace that he's got right now. And that's the thing. I mean, it's it's not like time, uh, timing screen. Place. Oh, there's contact. Oh, Noj. That was Noj just taking way too much curve. But Nelson nearly opened the door for Sones to come through. It's nearly closing in as well with Severe behind. Tight, tight stuff. Sones is looking very good at the moment. Do you believe in the commentator's curse, David? It's question right now well it doesn't matter if i believe it or not I've, I've executed it several times in the season already so yes it, it's real and uh, i uh, i enjoy taking payments for it oh, i see see i uh, andre mace is coming to the pit lane riding aboard with wolf gruber in the ferrari he's going to try and pass mr super saturday you can see that mercedes is plenty fast enough in a straight line left out from wolf gruber he doesn't fancy trying to make anything stick around the outside riches i for one don't believe in the commentator's curse i only believe in driver error so um yeah that's, that's how i banish myself from that one and just uh hope <laughs> I, I have received a little bit of criticism from some guys it's like oh you said that i was driving really well and then i crashed i was like oh, that's your fault wasn't it? um but that's that's apparently quite harsh it's a little bit harsh, but also, um, coincidentally, I mean, how many drivers have you seen that actually drive along and listen to the commentary at the same time, or, or get updates from their uh, from their their chat as well? Uh, a chat will be like, "Oh, you're you're on TV just now," and I wonder if that kind of triggers something in the back of their mind that puts a little bit of uh, of extra pressure on them. But Wolf Gruber here. Oh, putting the pressure on Mr. Super Saturday himself, Marcel Fusi, and he's soaking it up like a sponge just now. That Mercedes, the only one in the uh, the top 15, doing a cracking, cracking job there. But just now, it, it really is the story of the Mercedes, uh, sorry, the uh, the McLaren and the Audi right now. Two of each in the top five, and uh, the little Acid Martin just hiding out there in fourth place of Patrick Naj. Oh, there we go. No, I was just pressing there. Uh, who knows? It's just, uh, it's just a Discord game. It's fine. I was going to say that uh, Michael Hamlet, Mr. Simgrid, was uh, a, a, a that of one that would draw, uh, drive with the commentary in the ear. And I'm not going to lie, I can't think of something more annoying than having a commentator yelling stuff in my ear. But I do actually think that as Harry Phillips comes into the pit lane um, from inside the top 10, so a few drivers coming in from that position, uh, that there is a part of that. I mean, even if you know 
when you're in qualifying and you know you're on a great lap and you're seeing those times coming in, you're thinking, this is a really, really good lap. And then you kind of think, what if I'm on the broadcast at the moment? And it's just sort of sat there in the back of your mind is, if I make a mistake now, not only have I made a mistake, but also everyone's watching right now. And I think that does apply something. I think that's probably where the commentator's curse and the sense comes from. But um, alas, we focus on the action and then things go wrong. It's not our fault, is it? Surely not. Surely not. It's, it's the law of averages, is it? I mean, how many times do we see incidents that we've not been watching unfold and then we cut to it? Uh, so I, I think it's just the, the, the odds that uh, we're eventually going to catch something and those are uh, sometimes going to happen just directly after we've spoken about a driver. Ooh. Oh my goodness me! Wolf Gruber absolutely cooks the brakes trying to go into the back of Marcel Fuzzi and that is going to be a warning shot not only for Wolf Gruber but for Fuzzi as well. That was terrifying. Said that we wasn't the uh, the last time we'll see it today with that instant when Olivia Curtin copped one on the uh, back from Niels van der Kelt. Someone's off the road. That's Jakob Ruoff, who's just uh, going a lap down. Uh, so he'll be passed as well, I think, by Moretti as well. At the corner that he went off at, courtesy of Moretti, a good few laps ago. Uh, yeah, we're not... We're, again, still not the last one. We're going to see at Oggies today. I am absolutely sure of it. Four-way battle still raging on for third place. Everyone desperate to go as far as possible. To get themselves as many points as possible when it comes to the interval points. Boothby, Demori, way ahead of this group. Kreuzer, Nage, Sones, and Sever all a part of it. Marcel Fusi and Wolf Gruber are very close. And as I say that, Wolf Gruber comes into the pit lane. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating watching this race develop over the next hour and a half, hour and 35 minutes, because so many drivers still to do all three pit stops right now. That's what, at 12 drivers left to pit. And it's going to be a case of who blinks first. But the race itself, I mean, look at that now. In the past 10 laps, George Boothby has taken out 10 seconds of a gap over Simone de More there. Brilliant, brilliant pace, but... Demore um, obviously was in third place, moves up into that second, 15 seconds back. But I mean, what a brilliant drive from uh, Demore to come into the championship, to take a, a decent qualifying place. Fair enough, he had that huge moment, but manages to get himself back up onto the podium where he stayed there since. To follow your point, though, uh, everyone on the grid, uh, essentially, with, with the exception of a couple of drivers, are in the 48s. Um, as there we go. Oh, Patrick Noj uh, battling it out with Sones. I thought he was letting through Sones there. Sones is going to try and leave it to the inside as they hit the apex, and they hit more than the apex. There we go. Nelson goes round, and that was second in the championship. Patrick Noj will take a look at that one again but just racing a little bit too hard in a corner that is exceptionally difficult. The entrance through Brundle into Nelson is massively complicated. To do yourself is hard enough. To do side by side is near impossible. And we just saw the conclusion of that. Well, um, again, this is one of those moments where I wish our, uh, our broadcast director had some sound effects queued up, ready to go. And you just want that sad trombone to be playing that. It's the only thing that's appropriate right now. What did they think was going to happen? You can't have two cars going side by side into that section of the course without some sort of shenanigans. Silly, silly manoeuvre. And they've all paid the price for it. Final 10 minutes of the race, I am all over that move. You know, like, yes, it didn't work, but I'd be all over trying it in the final 10 minutes. Give it a go, because you're racing for position, you're racing hard, why not? An hour and 34 minutes to go? No, no less so, let's, that's, that's not ideal. Let's take a look then with Patrick Noj riding through the corner, and there's Sones to the inside, just makes that contact quite hard to tell from that angle as to who would be the fortune as to whether it was uh, Noj coming across the first angle that we saw when we were watching it live. It was the best angle. Uh, yeah, alas, it doesn't really matter either way. It has happened. And uh, yeah, for Patrick Noj, that uh, is effectively lighting fire to any hopes he had of the, the championship because I'm pretty sure with that, they have set sail. Yeah, I'll be interested to see. This is on board. Is this the Audi up inside? Oh, well, that looks kind of cut and dry, but I'd be very interested to see from the uh, the, the Aston uh, of Naj 
because it it did almost look like the the car on the inside uh, didn't have any any room to to go, but that one yeah that that was kind of shut the book and and closed the case on that one because the car just didn't turn around that right hander. Here we go another replay. Then this is with the uh, the Aston pulls over to the left hand side. Uh, that's mm. that's yeah I. I can't call that for the Aston at all. I, I've got to be honest. I think that uh, he's just been a passenger in that accident from the looks of things. But again, that's why we are in the uh, the commentary booth. Race control can look at that back and forward, and from every conceivable angle, they'll be the ones to to make the decision on that. But for me, looking at that, yeah, that's uh, that Aston Martin looks like the innocent party in that one. Yeah, it's kind of from if if I'm driving, if I'm Soames, I almost it almost looked like he wasn't giving enough room was was Nodge. But then you look at it from Nodge's angle, 100%. There is enough room there, surely. Let's take a look at it from this as we go into drone cam to see. Yeah, see, even then, it's not yeah, cut, see, I cha it's not I, that changes it again. Tonight. Yeah, that changed it again for me because Aston comes across to that right hand side when he knows there's a car there he knows that he can't take his normal racing line and that's what it looked like he was trying to cut across and get the whole shot out of that corner i i think maybe maybe the fairest thing to do on that is is that it's a, a, a racing instant but then that might leave the other car feeling quite aggrieved if he feels like he was turned in on yeah i'd almost argue it in the same time. I mean, to be fair, if you look at them, uh, Patrick Norris and Jordan Stones are pretty close on track right now. So obviously they've both come out of it and they've both come out in roughly the same place. I would almost say, because in a sense, I think that Norris was, was giving enough room and it almost looked like Stones just jumped just a little bit. But he was, he did seem to hook the apex fairly nicely in a sense that it seemed fairly 50-50. And it's just kind of one of those things where you have contact in that sense where it's just so light between the two because it wasn't a heavy bit of contact between the two it was just enough to send them round um, a, a massive shame for the pair of them regardless and uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll get an answer from race control but that one is going to take a, a good looking at and i have no idea which way i would call it because it's a pretty tough one um on that i wouldn't be surprised to see it go for a, a penalty of some description either way or just calls as a racing incident. What it has done, dropped them to fifth and sixth. Marcel Fusi, Mr. Super Saturday, is closing in in the background, 1.3 seconds back from Jordan Stones. I don't think either of these two, though, and this is the important thing that I would take from it, don't think they're going to have much damage from it because it was a very light bit of contact. Yeah, it, it, I don't think there'll be anything wrong with the cars whatsoever, although uh, we see the Audi there of Sones looking a bit battered. I think that was from previously in the uh, the, the race anyway. Yeah, I, they'll get on with it. They'll, they'll clean their wounds and just get on with things. But Harry Phillips had a cracking little battle here of the inside Ooh. into turn one then. That was uh, Callum Bridport that just got the position taken off him rather forcefully from that Bentley. Great move. And... Uh, Oh my goodness me, Callum Bridport, where are you going, Sunshine? The corner goes to the right, late on the brakes, and let's uh, let's give him a little bit of airtime here. Let's see that uh, stunning artistic <laughs> livery that is on that machine. Good man, now you're on board. He was off to take the motorbike penalty lap uh, there that's around the exit of the uh, Montreal <laughs> Agostini, uh, or the Montreal uh, Wilson Hairpin. Uh, interesting one, uh, not, not an ideal line, but got to say, uh, a said it time and time again this season if there's a car you don't want to bully it would be that of the bentley uh and if you do want to bully people you'd be in the bentley and it seemed very much the case of what harry phillips was was doing there because he was really assertive with his positioning on circuit and it was a brave move around the outside of riches like that but i mean he was committed i respect that a lot and that was uh that that that's brave going around the outside there and uh yeah made it stick we're um I mean, again, I, I'm, I'm sad that it's the final race this season because what if we never get to see that livery again? It's very disappointing. It's an, uh, one of these days I might even get to pronounce his name right because, of course, it's Cameron Bridport, not Callum Bridport. So, yeah, my apologies on that. It was the glare from the uh, Comic Sans MS that uh, completely distracted me. I'm actually on board with that livery so much so now uh, that we actually have to have for an entire broadcast the entire broadcast overlay package replaced with Comic Sans MS. Ooh. 
I don't. I don't. Oh, I don't. Oh, I mean, like, could you I imagine like, that? That's like, it's like, it's the same sort of sadism. Like people that have Samsung phones with that that horrible Comic Sans style font on it. It's just you see them with the screenshots. You're like, what sort of a monster are you? I mean, look, I'm all for that livery. Uh, if this whole overlay turned to Comic Sans mid broadcast, which I'm sure Mike Yao will now try and figure a way of doing, uh, I'd leave. I just I just unplug my internet and 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 walk away. Just, oh, yeah, so I'm I'm, no I'm hearing the rumblings in our in our ear from the production team. Uh, there's now going to be emails sent to Kinos to to make this happen. And uh, for everyone that's watching the broadcast, I wholeheartedly apologise if anything actually does come out of this because that is a a fate worse than death. But uh, back to the race and uh, have a look at this. Chris Severe having a, a decent run now, trying to catch up to the back of uh, is that Lucas Groyd in front. Uh, the 96, it look, in fact, no, sorry, he's just got Naj uh, just very shortly behind him. But, uh, yeah, Severe doing a cracking job up into fourth place again. Uh, now we're down to about 10 cars that haven't done the uh, the pit stop so far just now. Yeah, Paul Batiste worked his way up the order after the uh, the pit stop did not qualify particularly great. Um, I think he qualified down to like 20th place. Um, or, or somewhat has worked his way out. The order is now running in 12th position after the pit stops. Obviously, he was one of the first drivers to take it as we focus on this battle for the podium position at present. Lucas Kreutzer and Chris Severe. Uh, Patrick Nage behind, by the way, uh, was closing back in a little bit. Uh, Kreutzer's last lap, a 48.5. And then uh, Severe's lap, 47.7. So obviously, he closed that gap back in. Uh, Patrick Nage did a 47.6 in the previous lap. Got to give another shout out to him, race leader. You know it. You know what he's lapping. It is fast. It is a 47-0, which is 1.5 seconds faster on the previous lap of the circuit than Demori and Kreutzer behind. Mad speed from the 666 car, and absolutely no one is shocked. Yeah, it's, it's difficult, is it? It's 30 laps in, and we're just like, it's a foregone conclusion. He's just, he's just absolutely nailing it left, right, and center, and... What is great as well is, look, even if you're not as on the same sort of pace as George Boothby and, quite frankly, nobody else is right now, I mean, what a masterclass to be on the same track and just seeing the, the, the performance that he's putting in. If you're into sim racing at all yourself and you're watching this and you see the lap times that he's putting in time and time again, you're then starting to pay attention to how he's able to do that. You're watching the lines that he's taking. You're watching the way that he's driving the car, the, the strategy that he's doing with the fuel and things like that. I mean, there's so much to learn from performances like this. Obviously, for, for folk watching a race and they see a car out in front, um, it can look pretty boring if the car's out by 20, 30, 40 seconds. But for racers, instead, they're looking at this thinking, hey, this is free education for me. What's he doing so differently that I'm not? What can I learn from this? There's always something going on uh, when, you're, when you're watching guys. Always focus on not just the guys that are leading, but just everyone. Because if there's someone running a different strategy, why are they running a different strategy? Speak of Paul Batty, who's been into the pit lane for the second time. So he's going to come down and just get it to one pit stop to go uh, as Batty decides to come down pit lane. Has done all right uh, previously in the season. Uh, obviously, last time out, got himself a podium uh, for good measure and a pole position as well. Being told that there was a, an issue back here, and you can see that Morant is now ahead of Ilka Rantanen. Uh, uh, allegedly, what we're hearing is that he has absolutely launched it down the inside at Montreal. And to be fair, I'm going to believe it because we've seen Morant do the same kind of thing um, earlier in the race to Christian Kelly down at Agostini and seems to be a driver that does love a good send. Elko Bussink as well as a part of this for Rookie Monsters as he's on the back of Il Karantanen as well. Yeah, it's been a, a fantastic race for Moran. He's really, uh, he, he's just not taking any nonsense whatsoever. And since this is the last race of Best of British for this season, we can kind of do what we like with things. So I think we have to make a, an, a, an award for him, uh, the inaugural yeet of the afternoon. And I think that has to go to, obviously, Thomas Moran just for that. The fact that it's not going to be the last we see. It, it, you don't just do that and then 
an hour and 25 minutes goes by and we're never going to see that again. That is obviously his style. He likes to, to take opportunities uh, where other people are maybe backing out or just taking things a little bit calmer. And uh, yeah, I, I've got no doubt though that that is going to get him into trouble. Sever to the inside, gets the move done on Kreutzer. That has been a move waiting for half an hour. And finally, Sever has got himself up into third position. That is bad for Kreutzer uh, in any sense when you consider it not only to his position as the uh, as present in the race, but also to the championship. We're only 10 minutes away from points being dished out at the interval, and that will cost him a couple, obviously moving from third to fourth, so not ideal. Lucas Kreutzer. Great stuff from Chris Sever. Let's take a look at this instant. There's Ilka Rantanen who's run wide coming through Riches. There's the dive down the inside. Oh, misses the apex. No contact between the two. Again, in my opinion, very, very similar to the Agostini uh, uh, move is that it's aggressive, it's bold, it's maybe a little bit too much, but for me, that is just racing, and he was trying to absolutely send it in there. I want to ask, though, if you can think of a better name for it than Yeet of the Afternoon. Uh, I will unofficially, and probably even, to be fair, uh, Mike Yao and Michael Hamlet might even make it officially, uh, surely, a, a thing. Just think of a better name, because Yeet of the Afternoon, it, I mean, like, it's just, it's not, it's not ideal. Well, I'll, I'll have to get my uh, my brain thinking. Uh, the, the ability for me to multitask has never been something I've been known for. And there goes Nash up the inside of Kreuzer. What a move. Kreuzer makes a mistake at turn one. And that is going to be Nash every single day of the week there. Sones as well. Sones as well is close. He is moving his way back up the order. Is Patrick Nash? He needed that position. He really needs the one on Chris Severe as well. Uh, and he needs it in the next 10 minutes' time. We'll see what he can do because he is closing in as things stand, has marched his way back up a part of this group and is now fighting it. Sones is going to try and make it stick as they come out of Agostini towards Hamilton. A little bit of a mistake once again from Lucas Kreutzer. It's been a costly couple of laps from Kreutzer and the Germans dropping backwards. There's another mistake on the exit of Hamilton. And Sones once again back part of it. No way through at Oggies, though. And there is no yeet of the evening from him. Well, that's a bit of a stretch. We'll give it a go. Um, yeah, it, not good for Kreuzer. Difficult, difficult to David's poor hashtag. Come on, guys. Really? Is that, is that where we're going with this? And there we go. Sones up the inside there. And uh, Kreuzer, yeah, Kreuzer's a bit of a sitting duck right now. It's backwards, backwards, backwards for him. Where's Moretti come from in all of that? He was right behind him. He just decided that, nah, I don't really fancy uh, Brundle or Nelson the lap. I'm just going to do myself a little bit of lawn mowing and just carve a cross. Uh, I don't think David's poor hashtag makes a particularly good uh, award for move of the evening. But, you know, if, if that's what it's going to be called, we'll call it David's uh, poor hashtag. Yeet. There we go. So, either way, switching of positions and Kreutzer's struggles seem to continue. Let's see what they've done on the previous lap. As uh, Sever did a 48.3 Noj with that move, today 48.7. It is now or never for the Hungarian as he needs to close that gap. But not only close it, he needs to get through. If he has any hopes, any aspirations of winning this championship, now is the time to make it so. Over an hour through the race, hour and 20 minutes left to go and eight minutes away from our interval point being dished out. It's surely got to feel, Lewis, at this point in the race, no matter what you do, it's got to feel so disconcerting because the pace, the unrelenting consistency that George Boothby has had in the lead of this race, 147. In fact, actually, let's go and have a little look at this because just to, just to prove a point, the past what's that, uh, one, two, three, four, will exclude lap 33 where he was in the 148, but for the last, yeah, for the last 32 laps, he's been in the 147s. I mean, that is just absurd. I, uh, It's crazy, crazy pace from George Boothby, and he only has an hour 20 to, to hold on to this, and it's almost like it doesn't matter what Naj or Kreuzer do, they can throw everything they can throw missiles at Boothby and nothing is going to stick right now all that matters is Boothby getting across the line ahead of them it, as I say it's the, to, to put in reference so we're not just throwing numbers at you when it comes to 47s and what does that mean you're just on a 47.3 
What does that mean? Let's compare it to everyone else. I mean, Lucas Kreutzer is a bad example. Uh, just at a 51.4, obviously, he is dropping backwards like a stone. Uh, that lap time's not super duper representative, but regardless, it is out there. Um, Damori behind, 47.5. Sever, a 48.2. Naj, a 47.8, as we focus on him, because he is closing back in on Sever at a very important time for him. Uh, 47.8, 48.0 for the next car, 48.6, 49.5, 49.4, 48.3. So these drivers are all basically in the either very high 47s or they're in the 48s, maybe even a little bit slower than that. And every single lap of this race, with the exception of one or two, Boothby has been laying down 47s and not only 47s, but good 47s as well. When a driver is on top of it, when they're, when they're driving fast, when they are driving consistent the way that he is, they are almost unbeatable. The only thing that can really defeat him in this sense is a lapse in judgment, which yes, does happen, but it is exceptionally rare and based on his Donington performance, I'm not 100% sure. The second thing though is traffic, which can be a problem, especially around here. Because if you catch traffic at the wrong point, if you catch it running down um, into sort of like on the Bentley straight, if you catch it before you get to Brundle, or, or just, sorry, if, if you get it after Brundle, you're basically sat behind it around this section. Whilst you can get out of the way, it can be very, very easy to wrong foot someone when you're a lap traffic, just trying to get out of the way around this section of the circuit because it's such a high commitment part. It certainly is. And uh, it, again, I think that the, the talent that Boothby has got he, he just seems to take that in a stride because that is something that we, we have seen and will see uh, throughout the course of the next hour and 20 minutes. I mean, if you just look at where he is on the uh, the track map just now, he's already got the uh, the number 15 and number 91 of uh, Wolf Gruber and Andre Mesa. Can you believe Andre Mesa is about to get put a lap down? Albeit very, very briefly because the, uh, the cars have got to make their uh, first of three pit stops. But, I mean, what a fall from grace from, uh, for, for Andre Mesa, because he's only done one pit stop, so he's, he's not, like, massively, uh, you know, lost out. It's just been a, a, a horrible, horrible turn of events for him. Here's uh, Sheldon Muscat. Uh, it's amazing that uh, we choose to go with him when we say the word terrible turn of events because that's exactly what has happened to Sheldon Muscat here in the Bentley. Uh, again, two pit stops done, so making a decent recovery drive actually up in the 14th place and uh, given that the top placing uh, car that's already pitted is Olivier Curtin in the 7 Porsche, that's not a bad little comeback drive for uh, Sheldon Muscat. He's working his way back up the order. We saw Il Karantanen come into the pit lane for his second stop. So he'll be in. Only a few drivers have completed it. Il Karantanen will be one of them. Uh, Bussink and Paul Batty are the other drivers that have completed two pit stops. Uh, they'll be their way a little bit further down the order. So Sheldon Muscat with just the one has Christian Kelly closing in. So it's been a decent recovery, but it's just, yeah, just a massive, massive shame for him. Uh, obviously with that incident that Herbenau was uh, involved in on the early stages of the race. Uh, seeing pit stops coming at this stage of the race is a little bit odd, naturally, because um, we're closing in on points scoring time as Alexander Dorokot is trying to get that position done fairly easily on Schwaber, whose pace has really not been good. And the Bentley straight, Weirdly enough, uh, in a shocking turn of events, favours a Bentley as he passes the Ferrari, swoops down, completes the move into Brundle, and you won't see many easier than that. David Kiefer closing in on Daniel Kiefer would be really handy if one of them was just called, like, Bobby or something, but we'll roll with it. Um, maybe, we can, maybe we can have a vote to just pick one of them, and they're Bobby. For in, in future SimGrid uh, events. But either way, the two of them are battling it out, closing in. This is probably, as much as I say that they've all been quite close in the season, um, they haven't actually, I don't think we've seen them battle this season. We haven't, not uh, not that much on the track. And uh, it's actually a turn of events because it's actually David Kiefer that's behind Daniel right now. And David's actually ahead in the championship by a considerable margin, uh, by 23 points right now. So this is a, a fair scoop for Daniel in that Porsche right now to take uh, eighth position just now. I don't think it's going to be enough to turn the, the, uh, the positions on their head, but... Uh, David's not going to be enjoying this one being behind to uh, to Daniel for sure. Obviously, it's not quite as complicated. Being reminded as well, uh, it's not quite as complicated as the um, the driver Lucas Miller 
and the other completely different driver. However, not only a different driver, also driving for the same team, Lucas Muller, really threw us off um, for the Hap Racing team at the uh, VCO World Cup just a couple of weeks ago. Next round of that coming up in four weeks' time, the Thrustmaster, 24 hours of Spa. Uh, be there or be square. Broadcast will be on, and trust me, it'll be an absolute thriller. 24 hours of lovely racing in the Ardennes. Paul Batty currently on the screen. The say driver that has completed two pit stops. Pole position last time out at uh, Brands Hatch. Not converted in that sense this time out. He's behind Elko Bussink, but not for long as the run into Agostini favours the Aston Martin, and Bussink is dropped down to 21st position. But Bussink's pace around this circuit has been fairly favourable. Just a shame again for the early lap carnage that uh, basically just sent him down the order. He is running in the 48th at the moment, which, to be fair, for drivers around this point in the race, is not bad. It certainly isn't. It's a it's a reasonable uh, reasonable result and definitely not one to be to be scoffed at. But Christian Kelly. Uh, all over the back of Muscat right now and uh, as they start another lap of this 2.9 mile circuit here at Snetterton it's always about this run down to uh, to turn one but Muscat I mean I, I, we've we've obviously mentioned how unlucky he's been this season and it, what makes it frustrating is because he's a fast driver it's, oh my goodness me Christian Kelly up the inside of turn two there oh that could have been that could have been so much worse than it did Thankfully pulls out of it at the last possible moment there and Sheldon Muscat must be looking at his rear view mirrors thinking, oh God, not again. Yeah, that was uh, looking like it was going to turn into a fairly calamitous affair. Uh, um, fortunately for everyone, not so much. Back to the Kiefer battle for eighth place as Daniel continues to lead David. And we have just ticked over one hour and 12 minutes complete. And that means that the interval points are being dished out. Half points at the halfway point of the race. So in that sense, George Boothby has just netted himself 35 points uh, for his current position. Uh, I was watching that see first rival was going to try and make a move down on Doricot. As soon as that halfway point has passed, Jordan Soames is like, right, I've got my points. Uh, he's, he's got 24 for, for good measure, by the way. And I thought, right, I'm out of here, lads. I'm in the pit lane. I'm getting myself some fresh stuff and we're going to carry on with the second half of this race. Smart move. Get those points. Get in pit lane. Get on with the race. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, championship-wise then, 35 points for Boothby. It's going to be for Patrick Nage in fourth place. That's going to be 26 points. And then for Lucas Kreuzer, that's going to be uh, 25 points. So, uh, not massive inroads made. But again, that is the... I, I believe that takes it to within one or two points now within the championship for Boothby. And anything else now is just going to be the absolute icing on the cake. So really now this is it. This is the race for the championship in this final hour and 10 minutes. If for whatever reason something does happen to Boothby, it all goes wrong for him. Still no move from the Aston Martin of David Kiefer on Daniel. Uh, no way through at present. The car behind is Herber now, who's a couple of laps down after the early incident. Drive through penalty disqualification, return to the race, and now just driving around trying to get himself to the chequered flag. Again, I said I'd, I'd give him some respect if he gets his way to the chequered flag, and he seems to be fulfilling that prophecy. Uh, the, the question is, though, if you're Patrick Nodge, who didn't get by, Chris Severe, by the way, so he obviously lost out a couple of points in that sense. If you're Chris, uh, if you're Patrick Nage, if you're Lucas Kreutzer, what do you do? How do you try and claw this back as Demori comes into the pit lane? Attack, 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 attack. As uh, that's all you can do. I mean, uh, as it stands, Patrick Nage still in the lead of the championship. I think, from my very rough calculations, by only two points. I think Nage is on 212, and uh, uh, it's going to be Boothby on 210. But, I mean, it, it, it's all still very, very close. You've now, that means that uh, Naj, Kreuzer and Boothby are now separated by, what, four points in the championship? I mean, that's absurd. Let's, let's let that sink in. We've got an hour of racing to go and your top three championship contenders are now split by a, a, a handful, a handful of points as Patrick Schwab comes into uh, pit lane. I'll get the calculator out and I'll confirm that in just a second. I was uh, wisely informed after I did the last time I did it I was going to do a spreadsheet and like pull together some numbers and be like this is how it would work and blah 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 uh, but I was wisely told one of the last time I did it and I got it completely wrong uh, to never ever ever trust a commentator's maths because um, 
we're not good at it really because we hype everything up and we're just like oh it's close it's it's oh no it's, it's, it's the, the championship finished like three weeks ago um <laughs> alas i think it is fairly close but all things considered boothby if the if the race was reset at this point we would be looking at something fairly incredible here with boothby's position on the road uh, yeah sure he may not be the championship leader yet but he is in every position and right mind to be clinching that at some point he effectively near as makes no difference at this point has one hand on the trophy but again all things change very very quickly when it comes to sim racing and motorsport so uh, never rule anything out bridport into the pit lane everyone darting their way into pit lane as things unfold chris severe just came into the pit lane from second position with patrick Noj, our current focus the hungarian still out on circuit and george boothby doing exactly as he did when he won at Donington Park, which is stay out as far as possible. He'll come in, he'll take tyres, he'll take fuel, and then he'll leave those final two pit stops until the last sort of 10 minutes of the race, and then we'll deal with them then, and we'll try and get himself his third victory of the season. It's, um, as someone that's not very fast in sim racing, performance like, performances like this are really upsetting for me to watch because, you know, you see somebody drive like that and you're like, God, damn i wish i was that fast and it, it's just not the case it's it's been an, a master class it's been an absolute exhibition from george boothby right now and uh it, it's pretty interesting that barring a mistake or barring something happening that uh it's in the bag for him that's how consistent he is right now I want, when I started in uh, commentary, as uh, you know, talking about these drivers and stuff, and before I'd even really started driving in any sense, uh, I was commentating uh, sort of around drivers like um, on, on the R Factor scene, uh, drivers like Brenner House, drivers like Morgan Moran, drivers like this, who, uh, in open wheeled sense, you could give them a target and they would hit it every single lap of a 70 lap race without a single mistake in a tricky car at high speed against the best and uh, it is it is daunting because when you're sat there and you see it and you just think oh God, i can't ever do that it's ridiculous but the fact is that someone's doing it why not you if you put the time if you put the practice in if you if you make the effort as a as a driver all of these kind of things are possible so uh you never know especially if you find a car and a track that just really favors you heavily you never know what it is until you drive it uh i used to hate front wheel drives until one day i was like Ugh, i could take a Renault laguna i could slap a police car livery on it and uh, have a have a laugh in this championship and then ended up doing all right actually uh boothby leads the way as patrick Norge, marcel fuzzi and Daniel Kiefer come into the pit lane, nearly messed that one up. David Kiefer's already been into the pit lane. I focus now on Patrick Schwabe, who's behind Olivier Kerton, who's made his second pit stop. Wow, wow, wow. An hour, just over an hour left to go in the race. And um, it, it, again, it's, it's such a difficult one because our job is to make it as exciting and as interesting as possible. The problem is, is that George Boothby is, is doing such a way that it, it makes it very difficult to talk about anything other than the 84 second gap that he has got over uh, the likes of uh, Simone Tomori with the fact that they've all done, uh, they've done pit stops. But I mean, what a performance. In fact, there we go. Uh, he's into the, uh, into the pits just now, goes the, uh, the number 666 for the first of his three uh, pit stops right now. But I mean, what a, what a race nonetheless from the likes of Simone de More. Uh, you've got the third place of Patrick Naj and Christian Kelly getting up into fourth place. That is a, a turn up for the books. But um, yeah, Jordan Tones for me, that is one of the standout drives this evening. Just remember though with Christian Kelly, not to burst his bubble, because um, he is driving very, very well. But obviously he made his pit stop quite a bit earlier, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and so obviously wouldn't have taken as much fuel on that stop so not only has he been running in well it's not so much a clean exit he's been battling out but has been driving around with a a slightly lighter car all things considered and and whatnot and a, a short pit stop so he's jumped his way up the order courtesy of that not to say that he's not going to finish in fourth place it'd be a very unwise man to su suggest in such a sense but um i think 
I think Chris Kelly's on for a good drive. I don't quite think it'll be a podium, as I think the battle for the podium is potentially the one that we have on screen at the moment between Severe and uh, Nodge, because Severe is looking very, very impressive today. The McLarens are looking very, very good. Uh, Patrick Nodge, of course, who's desperate to do anything when it comes to this championship, is throwing everything that he's possibly got at it in this Aston Martin that, to be honest, from what I'm seeing in the standings and stuff, doesn't necessarily seem to favour uh, this location. Uh, Paul Batty, again, a reminder, last time out had that pole position. Where did he qualify this time? I think it was somewhere down around 20th place. Currently running in 14th, yes, with two pit stops completed. But the Aston Martin doesn't seem super duper strong around here. Meanwhile, he's going up against McLarens and, and Audis and stuff that seem to be a little bit more favoured towards this Snetterton circuit. Harry Phillips closing in behind as well, as is Jordan Soans once again. He's not done with this battle, is he? He certainly isn't, and uh, the, you can tell that the cars have all done their pit stops because uh, the time's straight back in to the 147. So again, to give some context, uh, the majority of drivers outside of, say, the top three or four drivers had dipped down into the, uh, the they were maybe doing high 147s, but the most of them were doing 148, 149. So it's a two second spread for the pace. So these tires, it looks like they're good for about 10, 15 laps and the majority of drivers just pushing them and really struggling to manage the wear on these tires. It's not the highest tyre wear circuit known to mankind, but it is certainly one that can uh, can can trick you at certain point because it lulls you in with, oh, well, it's a slow speed corner here, it's a slow speed corner there. There's only a couple of really high speed ones. Uh, yeah, no, think twice on that one, buddy. If you're not focused on it, if you're not paying attention, you can really catch yourself out. And that's where I think someone like George Beasley's done really well in the sense that has driven to his own pace saw it at the start of the race was under a lot of pressure and we did wonder if he was just driving to his own pace obviously was and that's why he's cleared off because he's just he's got himself a number and he's just driving to it less so on feel more so on i guess in a sense more so on data even though it's more so on knowledge um and and that's hugely respectable and that's where some of the drivers maybe need to take a couple of pages out of his book um but either way we've seen some decent racing today and uh to be fair I was going to be critical because we, we, we saw quite a few incidents throughout the day. I don't think we've seen we've we've seen less than the last time we did a two point race. We'll go with that because when we did the race at Donington, it was incidents galore. Today we've had a few, but it's not been too bad. I think a lot of people have learnt from the Brown Hatch race because we saw some good uh, good racing there and it seems to be running sort of in the same way, courtesy uh, with the exception rather of a, a couple of incidents. Uh, this is what I like about championships like this as well, is the fact that these drivers get to know each other. They they get to learn to trust each other and they know what drivers they can be around in and they know the drivers that they don't want to be around in. And that's naturally lends itself to, to less incidents happening over. Um, just on back back very quickly to, to talk about the tyres as well. One other factor that I've only just thought about just now is that You've got to wonder as well how much of the, the tyre degradation and tyre scrub won't happen actually on the second and third stint now because it's not like the start of the race. They're not in the high, highly compressed bunches and fields of traffic. They're not trying to make those crazy moves, those late breaks, those, those lock-ups, trying to get positions left, right and centre. Essentially now for the majority of the field, they're in their own little bit of space and they're just hot lapping. They're, they're just throwing times in left, right and centre. So... I don't think tyre degradation on stint 2 and stint 3 is going to be anywhere near as quick and as bad as it was in stint 1. Yeah, because you're able to sort of run your own uh, your own, run your own run line. As Speaking of running your own line, that was nearly running a very completely different line and trying to make a rallycross track for uh, Lucas Kreutzer, who just kept it on the road uh, as he's behind Jordan Soans, who's coming into the pit lane, who I am going to make a wild assumption here that Jordan Soans has had an incident because he was quite close to Harry Phillips and not too far behind the battle between Severe and Noj, then dropped back behind to Kreutzer and... I don't know if my eyes have seen me because he's had that front that he's had damage on the front end for a while, but it seemed like it was more of a scrape before. That seems like quite a bump. I think that the 23 of Jordan Soans has gone into a barrier or another car at some point over the uh, last lap or two because something clearly has gone on with the Aldi. We'll see if we can catch something a part of it. Either way, he is in the pit lane for his second stop, not far after his first one. Looking at the uh, the timing screens here on uh, on pit wall, uh, 
George Bithby, 146.563. That says it all. Um, when we're excited about the majority of cars getting back down into the 147s, already takes like six tenths of a second faster and he's gone faster again 146.3 for george boothby this is qualifying pace from him that he's got on right now i mean do you think it's a case that he knows he's got this in the bag and he is just absolutely going out in style with this i think he's trying to keep himself awake uh, keep himself focused i've had this before uh not necessarily myself um uh, but i have seen it time and time again as fuzi and wolf gruber are battling it out here for ninth position at present nearly a dive to the inside free bundle for the ferrari of uh wolf gruber uh but yeah for boothby if you sat there if you're trying to just hit a number every single lap kind of be a bit boring your brain will switch off at some point that's where you make a mistake meanwhile if there's a point you've got fresh rubber you've got kind of you know uh, a decent amount of fuel in the car whatever you're feeling comfortable you're feeling confident you're feeling happy go for the fastest lap because what it will do is it will wake you up it will reset your brain you'll be focused on what's going on and you'll just get on with the task at hand and so for for boothby i think it's smart to actually try and set the fast lap of the race it's not necessarily i mean obviously there's a lot of risk involved but i think it's a good move to try and do it just to refocus the mind I can absolutely vouch for that. Um, I've had experience with I've done endurance races. Oh, oh we see the car off. That's Wolf Gruber. Off at Hi, turn mate. two. Oh, he went uh, packing. That's not, again, that's not the first time we've, we've seen it and definitely won't be the last. Uh, just completely overdid it. Maybe just unsighted. Maybe just pulled it a little bit too far over to the left hand side in the braking zone. Either way, that Ferrari is gone. Yeah, he ain't, he ain't coming back from that one for sure. But uh, yeah, look, back, back to what we were saying there. I've had experience of that uh, driving in an endurance race on another platform where I, it's like at one of those rare occasions where I'm actually good, where I'm actually, I know the track very well. I know the car I'm racing in very well and I actually do have good pace. And you're just rattling off the laps and you go into that state of flow and you're an autopilot as we see the team standings live here. George Boothby, uh, in the uh, the lead, not by as much as I thought actually, uh, at the moment, uh, 245 to 242, uh, and then it's uh, Marcel Fuzzi and 211 in third place there, so uh, yeah, we'll uh, keep our eye on that one, but uh, yeah, look, it does happen, mental fatigue ticks in, and what ends up happening is you get overconfident, or you don't think, and Bart Boothby takes two wheels on the grass there, that was a little bit un uh, unusual. I'm positive he's listening to us. He's heard your point uh, about uh, switching off and, and trying to keep himself awake. Uh, this is starting to get a little bit um, scary, actually. I think he's in control. I, I, I wouldn't be panicking if I were if I were him. He's had a little bit of a, a mistake, again, a bit of a wake up call. Either he's going to rail, like, like you know, turn it down a little bit and start setting some very consistent forty sevens, or he's going to keep trying to go for some very very quick laps. Uh, this is why though you um, don't do the standings and mathematics calculations because you leave someone else to do them. Because then if they're wrong, you've got someone to blame. Um, at the moment though, it seems like George Boothby leading the way in the triple six car two four five over Patrick Nodges two four two as things stand still plenty of time to go in this race and of course still plenty of points to dish out when we get to that checkered flag 70 points up for offer for the race victory which booth be set for but it can unfold very very quickly 47 one on the previous lap from booth b now if we keep an eye on that over the next couple of laps i am going to almost guarantee that it will be either a high 46 this lap or a low 47 i don't think he's going to try and go for the fastest lap i think he's he's had his fun and now it's about just controlling and getting on with the race at hand plenty of time to go yeah for sure and again it'll just pan out i think you're you're making a great point about it he's got nothing to worry about it's just it's two wheels on the grass it's um it's to be expected when you're pushing that hard every single lap time in time out and here's here's the really gut-wrenching thing right he did that had that moment where he put two wheels on the grass and yet and yet still did a 147.1 still went faster than he's went for about 20 to 30 laps of the the race so far and makes a, a tiny little mistake like that. It's just, what can you possibly do to counter that? 
I'm not saying it in comparison to this drive from, from Boothby because obviously it's a lot better than I would drive, but I did want to do a championship in some V8 supercars. Uh, I've done a couple of some V8 supercars, but this one was not a particularly strong championship. Um, there wasn't a particularly big grid either. Uh, but we did a race at the end of the season, at, obviously, at Bathurst on R Factor 2. Um, and uh, clearly a lot of people struggled um, on the on the cars. A, a lot of people weren't, weren't particularly comfortable with how the car drove over the top. And I was fairly confident about this. And I was setting laps that were consistently faster than, than the others. And the thing was, is that you end up you start almost like fighting, oh, all gone. what else is in the car? Oh, let's see what else we can find. Let's just try and throw it in here a little bit faster. Oh, let's just give it a go. But you're, he's, he's uh, and this is where like Boothby will be at the moment, he's so in control of the car that he can take the risks, yeah, especially around here. There's a circuit that you can, you, you know, you've got those chances to take risks out, the likes of uh, Brundle coming through Corum into the braking zone of Murray's. You can take a, a, a large amount of risk through these corners and where you're, you know, you're doing consistent 47s, 45s, 48s, 45s, uh, 47s, 48s, you're maybe not so con comfortable with the car. You're not going to be taking those risks. Whereas if you're a George Boothby, if you've been setting these lap times all day long, if you're fully in control of the car, that just lets you take those risks. And you know that you're not going to make a mistake because you're so focused, you're one with the car. And to counter my point where I said, going to be a high 46, low 47, uh, it was a 46.5. So I'll uh, roll back that one. Yeah, it's, um, he's, he's got a habit of it. But to be fair, I mean, look at Simone de Mori, 146 nines again, and uh, not to get hung up on lap times, uh, but again, it just shows that Simone really has had a cracking debut in this championship. A wonderful uh, wild card entry from Simone de Mori in the 602 Audi. And if anything, it's the only thing that's stopping us having a uh, 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 McLaren 123 at the moment. Yeah, tragic, because I really wanted one of those again, because it was really funny when you said, oh, no, the McLarens are really bad here. And then they ended up getting a 1, 2, 3. So, you know, I was, I was expecting yes. nothing again. Yes, I remember that one very, very well. Oh, sorry, did I just remind you of it again? Ugh. I've, I've nothing to add to that one at all. But you got over it, have you? I, does it sound like I've gotten over it? <laughs> no, no, not even, not even remotely. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair... I, I've said that the Aston Martins aren't particularly strong today, uh, so I'm potentially going to be proven uh, wrong on that one, depending on uh, Nodge's position. Has he just got by Christian Kelly, or is that just my eyes deceiving me? Oh, it's on... Oh, no, it's Christian Kelly. Christian Kelly's dropped down the order. That's why. I'm wondering what would happen. Christian Kelly's dropped back behind Harry Phillips. That McLaren behind is Christian Kelly. What has happened to him? Because there has clearly been an issue, because he was ahead of, uh, of Nodge. Uh, or, or was up there in that position anyway. Now he's dropped behind Mesa, Phillips as well. What has happened? Yeah, it's a strange one. We'll uh, no doubt get a, a replay of that, but there is Patrick Nash in the uh, the Aston Martin hunting down Severe in that McLaren. And oh, Severe goes very, very wide. Manages to get it back onto the track before turn two, but that is going to be extra pressure from Naj to try and take that position back and Kelly all the way down down through the order there. In fact, he's into the pits now, so I wonder if he's just decided to uh, bite the bullet and uh, make the uh, best of a bad situation. Here is the replay then for Christian Kelly, and uh, yeah, good, just goes wide oh. onto the grass. Oh man, that's such a bad, bad punishment. I mean, that's... I, it's such a simple mistake. We saw Booth be doing a similar thing, getting just two wheels onto the grass. And uh, yeah, that's punished him big time for that. I think the difference between the Boothby one and that is that when Boothby went off, I, I, I'm going to assume is that he was holding the right amount of throttle. Because when you're off, if you've got two wheels on the grass, there is a right and a wrong amount of throttle to be using. Some drivers will be like, oh, just lift off completely. Uh -uh, don't do that. Uh, and some drivers will be like, well, just flat out and just try and you know, call in the crate. And again, solid, uh -uh, don't do that either. There's a there's a point midway in the throttle, and you know you just you roll with it. You you feel one with the car, and it just seems like he was either pushing a little bit too hard, or maybe came completely out of the throttle, and the rear end just sort of came completely around on the grass. Uh, either way, bit of a shame. Came into the pit lane. We knew that um, that he was one of the earlier pitters was um, Christian Kelly, and so he worked his way up courtesy of that. 
now is down the order behind quite a few of the other drivers that have already stopped twice. So I think for Christian Kelly, this one has very much fallen apart, I'm afraid. Uh, Paul Batty, the head of the drivers that have pitted twice with Bussing and Kerton as well as there's the dive to the inside from Lucas Kreutzer. That was needed to be done at Murray's. Gets the position done, but I'm sorry, Sonny Jim, to try and out-drag a Bentley here. That is not going to happen. And Harry Phillips on the start finish straight and the run into Riches is going to hang on. Spirited attempt from the German, but no way through on the brick. Cuts it back through Riches to the inside of the Montreal hairpin. But this is going to have to be a cent and a half. And it's not going to be a yeet of the evening from uh, Kreutzer. But he's still going to try and make a stick. I don't fancy this one either. Yeah, the Bentley's going to have that all day long. And the thing is, if he's not careful and keeps trying to push the issue, he, the Bentley is going to leave him with very, very little room as well. Gets the inside line, does Kreuzer for the next corner. And take that back. He might have just done that. Blocks the apex. The Bentley's got nowhere to go. And in fact, the Bentley now has uh, Marcel Fusi just two cars back. A what a move there from Kreuzer to get that done. And I think he can now breathe a sigh of relief because that one has been coming for a couple of laps. But, yeah, it, brave boy picking on the Bentley. Not many of them are able to uh, to do that and to win. Only took him a third of a lap to complete the move. Was having to dive back down the inside and cut across and cut back and give it another go. Each corner didn't give up. And Kreutzer gets himself sixth position for good measure. We'll try and close down on Mesa, who's obviously one of the earlier pitters as well. Kreutzer pitting just after the halfway point in the race. So he's looking pretty good and tidy for a potential another top five in this season. Has finished sixth, fifth and sixth. The previous three races has Lucas Kreutzer, a driver who tends to do his races by flying under the radar. Uh, that was a little bit less so of that, as uh, making that move was pretty nice. This is Jakob Ruoff, who's between uh, Marcel Fusi and Harry Phillips in that Lamborghini. Blue flag to be out for the 297. Harry Phillips comes into the pit lane anyway to serve his second pit stop. Uh, the Lamborghini of Jakob Ruoff, I'm expecting, will make a move. You can see the flashing there on the underside of the car as Marcel Fusi was just giving them in the signal to basically be like, excuse me, pardon me, I want to hop through and try and chase down my teammate who's a little bit ahead of uh, the situation. And uh, Kreutzer will potentially see a Mercedes closing in on him. I think it's a, a certainty because Kreuzer just doesn't seem to have the pace right now that Fuzzy does. And again, this could have been so different for Fuzzy through the race. But what a brilliant, brilliant uh, strategy that Fuzzy's done to to keep himself in contention, in with the shout on this. And you know, you've you've never really looked at him as a race winner, but for the uh, for the podium, at 45 minutes to go. I think this would have to be one of the performances of his career never mind the season from Marcel Fusi but again with just what's that uh, four cards in front of him never say never podium could be on his target for it but realistically it's looking fairly solid right now the only difference could be Sever losing this place to Naj but if these two fight it out come into contact who knows what's going to happen I think the difference is, is that Marcel Fuzzi has been into the pit lane earlier um, in the race than the, those around. So that won't work out too much in his favour. Um, again, yeah, I, I agree. Never say never, but it's going to be a very tall order for the Hungarian to make anything stick in that sense. And I'm sure he'll give it his best go, but he'll probably be more so aiming for something more akin to a top 10 after a not so ideal qualifying uh, from him. The Sidemax Motorworks driver just trying to do anything that he can at present. We did see the battle that was quite close with third position as Severe and Naj are still fighting over uh, Hammer and Tongs for the final position on the podium. Three drivers completed their pit stop sequences all the way through. Paul Batty, uh, Ilko Bussink and Christian Kelly, 19th, 20th and 21st on the road. Paul Batty being the head of that. I'm just going to say that is quite impressive because um, uh, I say he did not qualify particularly well round here. Worked his way up the order. Now completed all of his stops. Things are looking pretty good for the 22. They certainly are, and when you consider where we saw Busink and Kelly as well uh, going up through the order, we thought they were definitely going to be having a top 10 finish. Uh, but it's just been a, a, a brilliant, brilliant recovery drive for Paul Batty in that Aston Martin, the number 22. And again, you definitely cannot 
you can't put it against them taking a whole handful of places especially with the uh, the top 10 all to make two more pit stops and then the 10 cars in behind them still make at least another one pit stop you've got the likes of Alexander Dorikit and uh, Schwab who still need to make two pit stops it's looking good for Paul Bottet. I mean, we know he's fast. We've seen him in numerous other uh, championships that he takes part in. But again, he's just not had the rub of the uh, the luck tonight. No, when all these drivers are coming for their final stop, I think he is going to work into a pretty healthy position. Maybe a top 10, maybe something even better than that. Bear in mind, he qualified, uh, have just had a look, he's qualified in 18th position today and has worked his way forward. We're being told that Andre Mesa has been off the road. You can actually see there, because he was quite close to Patrick Nodge. If you look on the track map on the right-hand side of your screen, the 96 is Andre Mesa. We're currently looking, uh, as we're on board with the 42, uh, Mesa is on the start-finished straight. So what has happened to Andre Mesa? Uh, so we've been told it was an instant at Bommel, which has caught a few drivers out today. Uh, a, a bit tragic there. Yeah, that's, that's unfortunate, especially with such little time to go, 45 minutes. I mean, that's pretty much knocked them out of the uh, potential at the, uh, the top 10. We'll see if he can make a recovery drive. Does the, the brilliant genius thing of just coming straight into the pits, though, um, after that. He obviously knows that the uh, the limits of the, the tyres have been reached or he's just decided, right, I need to take a little bit of a breather. That 30 seconds for the pit stop. It can can be an absolute game changer in terms of hitting the reset button on your mind into the zone and uh, getting back on with it. But we jump into a replay here just now. This is Andre Mesa, and again another unforced error. It started way yeah. back at the uh, the entrance to the bomb hole. There you can see him putting his two left hand tires onto the grass there, unsettles the car slightly, and then as soon as that car gets raised with the elevation of the curb on the right hand side, that's it. Game over. The car is already over rotating, and there's nothing you can do at that point. Tricky corner is uh, is bomb hole. It's um, obviously there's a dip in the in the middle of it, and uh, that's not ideal. But then the the curb on the inside just really undulates in the worst possible way. And yeah, with that and the compression of the the dip when you climb back up the hill, not ideal. Patrick Nodge with Harry Phillips coming out of the pit lane there. Uh, Harry Phillips a lap down, almost wrong footing the Hungarian uh, ahead, and hopefully Harry Phillips won't try and get himself a part of this battle just been uh, a bit unlucky with where he's come out in the pit lane because this is the battle for third position that he's sort of jumped in with and uh, Phillips at the moment 21st and fourth of the drivers that have made all of their pit stops these drivers ahead have not made either of their final two have only made one pit stop across the afternoon's running so I, I if I'm Naj I am thinking please just don't get involved with this yeah the whole thing of just you know, please stay out my way, and there, there's a good lad. But uh, whether or not that happens, we'll uh, we'll have to wait and see because Nash has got a Bentley all over the rear of him right now, and yeah, this is this is looking a little bit awkward right now because Naj needs to keep his uh, his sort of nose clean and, and out of trouble right now, but trouble might be on its way for him. I get it from Harry Phillips' point of view. He just wants to get on with his race. He's got a quick car right now. He's being held up by these two. He is faster than these two, and that can be argued. Um, but at the same time, you can't ruin the race of someone who's uh, a, a lap ahead. If you can get through and get by both of them pretty pretty sharpish, pretty cleanly, then power to you. Go for it. Um, alas, that's going to take quite a lot of work uh, throughout this race. Wolf Gruber into the pit lane. Saw him into the pit lane not very long ago to take his second stop and now comes in to take his third and final one as well. So ticking him off the Ferrari just to make things stick. 40 minutes left to go in the race, but not only the race, 40 minutes left to go in the season as well. Boothby leading the way at the moment in the triple six, looking like it could be potentially at the moment a fairly comfortable drive to the checkered flag reminder of how the standings are present george boothby leading the way 245 points 242 for patrick nodge who we're focused on and let's see where nodge can get to before the checkered flag because he's got a long run ahead of him 
he certainly does, and uh, it, like we've said before, right? The the thing is, is that from both of our opinions, the the performance that George Boothby has given tonight, it's a sealed deal. He's got the race win in his hands now. Whether or not he can convert that into a race win is up to the racing gods. It's, it always is. It's up to the, to the sim racing gods, but. The performance that he has put in tonight has just been outstanding. This is one of the best races that we've seen from him through the season. Um, to be, what, 37 seconds ahead with two pit stops left to go. I mean, it's getting to the point now. He could he could take a drive-through penalty and still take this championship right now. That's that's how crazy the, uh, the, the pace has been from him. The only person he has to worry about in the championship is Patrick Natch, who is uh, what looks like what's that, 40, 54 seconds behind him uh, on the uh, the on the race itself. So again, barring anything crazy or unfortunate or terrible happening, George Boothby has, and, and you've got to say rightly, taking this championship by the scruff of the neck and is looking so, so good. Yeah, considering he's missed half the season so far, it's uh, been a very impressive run from him. Uh, alas, things can fall apart very, very quickly for any uh, Scott McLaughlin fans. You'll know that from 2017, uh, when the Kiwi was got on to win the championship, all things considered, and then had a horrible final race and ended up not winning the title that season. Uh, from motorbikes' point of view, like even, even fairly recent past 2019, uh, I think it was in World Superbikes. Alvaro Bautista won the first 11 races of a season and still didn't win the championship. Um, my, my point from all of this is, like I say, if it falls apart, it falls apart very, very quickly. And it's easy to go from one mistake to another to another. You know, mistakes tend to come in threes, uh, in a sense. And if you've made one, then you're, you've got a heightened sense for when the next mistake is. And that's when you make your other big one. Uh, for Boothby, it doesn't seem like he's in that sense because he's made a couple of mistakes today. Um, noted in the first part of the race that they were missing apexes like it was going out of fashion. And then he obviously had that run on the exit of Hamilton where uh, ran out, got a little bit of grass, could have ended badly there. Alas, kept his nose clean for the entirety of it. It just takes a second, a misjudgment, uh, even something on someone else's side of things. Um... <laughs> It can fall apart for Boothby, but at the moment, let's be real, it doesn't look like it's going to. It doesn't, and again, it's it's just a, an example of just how strong he's been tonight. But again, I mean, what a performance this season from this man here, Patrick Nage in the BL race in 42, Aston Martin. I mean, he's, he's done everything he possibly could. Uh, it must make it even more frustrating when when you've got a guy that that comes in for three of the five races and just absolutely destroys it. I mean, let's face it, George Boothby he he hasn't just won by like two seconds. He's just blown the field apart with the the pace that he's got. Um, and and what a championship it's been. It's been so much fun to to be part of this and. Uh, yeah, watching this final stage just now, my heart is in my mouth right now for Patrick Nash because at the, as it stands, I mean, with George Boothby winning it, he's got nothing to lose right now. Just get get the car sent up the inside at every possible opportunity and, uh, you know, get the, as best a finish as you possibly can. Go out on a high and, uh, yeah, have a bit of fun. Obviously trying to be a, uh, a driver to get onto the podium for the second time in the season again to remind from earlier in the race there is only one driver who has been on the podium twice this season that's George Boothby with two wins back to back from Brands and Snetton don't know quite what happened to Doricott there uh, running through Riches but either way Thomas Morant doesn't really uh, care to be honest as he's made that move and moved himself up into 10th position a uh, little shout out to uh, Thomas Morant by the way who had the fastest first sector in qualifying I only noticed that um, when, when looking back at the results of qualifying. But yeah, fastest first sector, obviously the fastest second and fastest third goes to one man and one man only, and that is George Boothby. But clearly showing that there is pace in this Ferrari, another one of the drivers joining us for the final round of the season. Alexander Herbenau continuing to uh, just tick off the laps in that blue Mercedes behind after his issues today. A tumultuous run at the final round of the season for Herbenau. But yeah, Morant is marching forward. Currently second of the drivers that have completed two pit stops. Olivier Curtin, the driver ahead, also in that boat. For sure, for sure. And Curtin doing a, a, a decent job. 
um, to to get himself up at the the top ten in that uh, in that Porsche. But the battle with the Kiefers as well, David and Daniel, it's been a cracking little fight that they've had as uh, going very, very wide, just keeping himself out of the issue whatsoever as Bridport in the uh, the McLaren there, job there. But uh, Naj still trying to hunt down this uh, McLaren of uh, Sever. But Harry Phillips, I mean, he's looking so medicine. He's, you remember the old Scrappy-Doo cartoon? That is exactly what Harry Phillips is right now. He is... Uh, He's going to rough him, he's going to tough him, he's going to uh, knock him out if he gets the chance. But uh, I've got to be honest, I, I don't think that Bentley's going to be able to do anything other than annoy the mirrors of Patrick Nash right now. And if I'm not, I'm almost tempted. I, I, the only question would be if you came in and then where would you come out and you know, you're just going to drop yourself into another problem. But I'm concerned about that Bentley and see if Harry Phillips might do something a little bit you know, elbows out, maybe try something a little bit brave to basically not get a position uh, in a sense. But if I'm not, I, I, I want to remove myself from that scenario. I want to get out of it. I'm just going to come in, put a litre in the tank, tick off a pit stop, and then try and circulate around to check the flag and get by Chris Severe that way and get onto the podium. Because, um, yeah, that, that Bentley is pretty ominous at the moment. And... If I am the Hungarian, I am concerned. Sever is as comfortable as can be. I know he's got pressure from Naj behind, but he can see that Naj is having issues. And so he's just sat there doing his laps thinking, look, if I don't make a mistake, you can't pass because the Aston's not particularly sharp in a straight line. So we're all good here. Yeah, and they are all good there. That's the, that's the thing. They can, uh, they can choose to do that. But I, I've got to be honest, I think uh, Naj has got the pace right now just to, to keep going. He's dropped just into the, the 148 flats there, so he's had a little bit of a poorer lap, but the Bentley now coming under uh, under pressure, I I think that Naj is, he's kind of damned if he does and damned if he doesn't in one way, because he could pit, as you said, and uh, just bring himself out, but there's no guarantee that he's not going to put himself out into the, uh, the, the huge battle that's uh, even further down behind him, so for the likes of the, uh, the 137. Obviously, it's very easy for us to say from this point of view, uh, but I think if he does come into the pit lane, he'll probably come out around the uh, around the seven of Olivier Kerton, probably a little bit ahead, which means it would be oodles of clean air. I can't guarantee that, but if he's coming in and only sticking a litre into the tank, kind of seems a sort of position where he would come out. Um, so, for me, if if he can if he can see the map, I'd be all over it as the meme machine goes off in the background at Williams and uh, takes a trip over the grass. Was trying to do something about Harry Phillips and only did something about himself. Not the greatest round for Bridport. He's had a couple of good ones this season as Harry Phillips departs the apex of Nelson and doesn't fancy any part of it. Uh, a few drivers ticking off their pit stop. One of them being Sheldon Muscat to come in for his final one, and he is down in fifteenth at the moment. Interesting to see Thomas Morant as well, Mr. Send It himself up into uh, P10 in that Ferrari with uh, what's that, just one pit stop left to go. So uh, both him and Olivier Curtin, they're looking, they're, they're looking like dark horses right now. If they can time that properly and squeeze that out as far as they can, yeah, they could be, uh, they could be ones to watch. In fact, there we go. We see uh, Morant and uh, Curtin into the uh, the top 10 then as uh, Dorica and uh, Mesa falls even further behind and uh, yeah Harry Phillips that is uh, that goes any chance that he's got of challenging Patrick Nage uh, out of the window just now 30 minutes final 30 minutes of the season here at Best of British and uh, yeah, it Lewis, I mean, what a season. I'm just trying to think back earlier on through the, uh, the the championship. We started, obviously, at Ulton Park, that incredible win for Chris Jean-Zemis, who didn't take part tonight because of uh, technical issues that he had. Donington Park and Silverstone dominated from start to finish by George Boothby. And then we had Brands Hatch, which could have been something completely different. The uh, the man himself, Alexander Herbenio, who uh, yeah had a, a horrible, horrible race tonight. And uh, apart from uh, George Boothby, we've just not seen any of the other race winners since. 
But yeah, the, the, it's the the thing that Boothby's had in this championship when he's done the rounds is just consistency and form factor. Said before, again, drivers being on the podium, we've had 11 different drivers on the podium. It's a, a large amount to be on the rostrum at some point in the season. And to be fair, we could be seeing two more today. Severe's not had one. Demori obviously has not had one. It's his first round of the season as Olivier Curtin. Bye, 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 bye. Away he goes and into the barrier as well for good measure. Just overdid it at Hamilton and away he goes. Uh, to be fair, oh. the last time that I commentated on a race around here, which was with you, um, there was a Porsche. can't remember who it was, uh, but there was a Porsche who every time we cut to was in a barrier and so seems to just be following on in that trend i i don't remember that but <laughs> i mean it's it's a horrible horrible fate to uh, to befall them and again i guess that's the uh, the old commentator's curse jumping out there after all the praise and that straight into the, uh, the the barrier they go so yeah not not so great for the porch but still half an hour still chance to to salvage some sort of pride maybe ish perhaps but not if uh, Rantanen can have anything to do with it right now I tell you what I think that Porsche's tires are shot he's going to be jumping into the pits for sure is Olivier Curtin surely uh and indeed he does yep that's the the wise move to do I think the tires are gone on that one you could see him struggling around the bomb hole and uh yeah it's a disaster recovery here for Olivier Curtin potentially had a fair amount of damage as well with the barrier hit that he got on the exit of Hamilton. Um, I don't believe in the commentators, because I'm still going to say it. Uh, you know, it's, it's just how it is. Um, but yeah, either way, mistakes made. It's happened. Grin and bear it. Get on with it. Focus on, uh, on the next half an hour of the race as we're focused once again on this battle for third place. Severe still ahead of the Aston Martin of Patrick Nodge. The Aston just not strong enough to, uh, to pull past the McLaren on a straight. Uh, McLaren's no uh, no slouch itself, so you know, it kind of makes sense. Uh, Sheldon Muscat, though, got to say, because I was I was giving the the up and all to Paul Batty, 18th position, obviously raised up the order and already completed all of his stops. Sheldon Muscat, after the incident um, down at the Montreal Wilson hairpin, the one that we're just coming up to now, turn two, uh, on lap one, has marked himself up. He's ahead of everyone else that has made all of the pit stops. I'm not ruling a top 10 out from Sheldon Muscat, which after a season, this is, uh, uh, let's... And given the disastrous start that he's had to this race, I mean, he will, he will absolutely be taking that for sure. I think, uh... I think the, the, the thing with um, Sheldon Muscat though is, I say, touching wood uh, and, and hoping for the best, that we're not commentating cursing uh, 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 Sheldon Muscat here, but he, I say, really, really good drive so far. There is potential for a, a, a top 10. Obviously, so much time to see how it unfolds and uh, plenty more can happen over the final 27 minutes of the race. It is not the only battle on circuit what we're currently focused on because Paul Batty, speaking of Sheldon Muscat, has closed right in. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, again, we, we try and add the air of surprise and mystery and things like that. 25 minutes left to go. We kind of know what it's looking like, but there's still a huge race unfolding further down the field. Simone de Mori, for example, holding on t on top of uh, Severe, but I I've got to be honest, I think that, uh, Patrick Nash is going to take this place from Severe. I know he is looking difficult for him, but he is just inching closer and closer every lap by lap. He's desperately trying. He is throwing everything that he possibly can at to try and get the final podium of the season. If there's a podium you want to get on this season, uh, regardless of how the championship's gone, it's always the final one. Final or first? A champion, a, a podium in the midway of the season? Ah, fair enough. Uh, all well and good. But everyone kind of remembers the, the, the final podium of a season, the first podium of the season, because the first podium, you kick off the season in the best way possible. Final season, you give yourself hope for the next one that's coming round. And so for these drivers, this could be a fairly important one for them between Severe and Noj. Uh, Severe, we've not seen up the top end of the, the championship. Seen some good drives, uh, mind, but never one that sort of ended up... Uh, uh, basically giving anything of any major concern. Got a sixth place at Silverstone in the wet, but then outside of that, uh, a 15th, a 17th and a 14th, which is pretty average. Today though, 
definitely has the pace in that McLaren. Yeah, he certainly does. Uh, Paul Petit here, currently 12th in the championship. It's been a, a reasonable season for himself. Uh, 16 race starts over the uh, the sim grid. Uh, one race win and four podium finishes. So again, Paul Petit, not a slouch, knows his way to the top of the uh, the podium, but it's just not been his race tonight. And uh, it's just unfortunate because we have seen him doing very, very well, getting second place, for example, last time out at Brands Hatch. But other than that, it's been a season to forget for him because 12th place in round two was his best result at Donington Park. It's just not good enough, but it shows with the fact that he's down there in uh, uh, 12th place. It's a season of inconsistency, uh, a season where a lot of drivers have struggled to uh, uh, back up results with a, an equally challenging drive. Of course, one driver that has done that is George Boothby, who's currently on screen. A couple of others that have done it. Um, Earlier in the season, Marcel Fusi, back-to-back -back top fives, fourth and fifth at the start of the season. The driver that I think has been exceptionally consistent this season, with the exception of the first round, is Lucas Kreutzer. Who, as I said, sixth, fifth and sixth coming into the day, the last three races. Started out the season with a 24th place. Today running in fifth as well. The most consistent run of any driver over the last few rounds has just been scoring points, ticking them off. Um, other drivers that were in the same boat consistency-wise, Yiga Rog Rognikov, um, who only had one position outside of the top 10, uh, that was at Donington Park. But this is the thing, is that a lot of drivers, they have uh, a random podium, a random top 10, a random top 5, and maybe even a random win, uh, if you could think about it that way. No one's been able to sort of consistently remain at the top. Well, that's why the drives of Kreutzer, that's why the drives of Boothby uh, are as impressive as they are. Yeah, and uh, also one thing that we really haven't spoken about lately, and we spoke about just briefly at the beginning, Yigar Ogoronikov. I mean, I had so much material prepared to chat about his potential tonight for just walking away with the season, and I'd spoken about him all the way through the season, saying that he has the potential, he has the pace to be right at the top, and it was just unfortunate, and this was his chance to prove it. And I'm, I've got to be honest, I'm absolutely gutted that he's not been able to uh, to, to make it tonight. Obviously, it must be some sort of technical issue, or or he's just literally unable to, uh, to make it tonight, but of all the rounds to to you know DNF to, to DNS even I mean this this is an absolute kicker for him uh, leading the championship as it came into tonight and having it snatched away before he can even turn a wheel yeah that that is pretty rough yeah uh, follow my logic here I kind of hope it's uh, uh, like a conflict of um, schedule that he's had to run off and do something else uh, because the last thing that you want in this scenario is Oh, I didn't win the championship because my internet didn't work or I didn't win the championship because of this. Um, I was leading a championship last year in some sim race thing and I had to miss the final round of the season. Um, but I kind of knew that I had to miss the final round. I knew from like round four, it was a seven round championship. I knew from about round four that I couldn't make the final round of the season because I had to um, go and do something else. And it was a bit bitter, but I was leading the championship going into the final round of the season by just six points. So I probably would have lost it anyway, but... Um, it, it, it's pretty heartbreaking but at the same time because I like look do you know what it's fine I had to leave I had to go and do something else meanwhile if I was in that position and my computer wouldn't turn on or my internet wasn't working or something that is pain that is actual pain it certainly is, and the reason for that, obviously, is because you've done everything you possibly can. You can't change the fact that you can't make it to that uh, that final round. You've always known that, but you've done everything else but that. Um, whereas if that situation is kind of thrust upon you and you have no control over it, that's a whole different kettle of fish because you feel you feel bitter. You feel like the cha your position, your hard work has been snatched away for you or it's all in vain or, or whatever, but you feel out of control. So that's why it upsets you more than it does uh, than if it's something that you, uh, that you know about and you can mentally prepare in advance for. And, to be honest, uh, hopefully uh, Yeager's been, been able to prepare for that. And, and he's still not going to leave the championship in too shabby a position. I, get, I think he needs to focus on the positives of the season, whilst, yes, there's been a, a couple of negatives at some rounds. Um, for the most part, he's driven very well this season, obviously very consistently. A third, a 15th, the Donington Park one was not so ideal. Uh, a fourth and a seventh. He's done some, some great driving, controlled the aggression, which we know he needs to do. 
uh, on various occasions and kept his nose clean when it needed to be. Got involved in an incident last time out, but it wasn't the most heinous of crimes. Um, and like I say, he's been driving like the driver that maybe he needs to be and this will carry his confidence elsewhere into sim racing so at least take those kind of positivities in the uh, in the championship and that's what this is kind of all about like he, considering how inconsistent the season's been and he came into it leading the race into the final round maybe if you look at it from a logical sense let's be real Boothby at this stage probably was going to win it anyway and so you know fair enough at least you kind of want to have the chance to dish it out yourself but uh, alas, there's been so many positives from this season. I think there's enough to garner um, further success in future as we're looking at Olivia Kert in the Battle of Yellow, uh, Bussink behind. Don't count out Christian Kelly, who is not far off the back of it, running uh, a couple of tenths uh, faster over the last couple of laps, I think, than the two ahead. So potentially the McLaren is closing in on the Porsche and the Audi ahead. Final pit stops coming in. Thomas Morant has been into the pit lane, exited, and is the lead of the drivers that have completed all three pit stops. Yep, top 12 still to take a number of pit stops, just three drivers with one pit stop left to go. The rest need to do two pit stops. A great update there from Epic Sim Racing on YouTube chat about Yigor Ogorondikov, uh, who seems to know a little bit more about the situation that uh, yeah, apparently Yeager's uh, burned himself out and wants to take a little break until the, uh, the Spa 24-hour race. And, you know, again, that brings up a very, very interesting conversation because we're in this unusual position where you know people people on the outside that watch sim racing or they've heard a little bit about it and they'll they'll dip their toe in to have a look and they think that it's potentially still the mindset that it's still just a game and, and all that sort of stuff but for for people like Yeager and for almost every other driver that's in this race here that does multiple championships on multiple platforms time in day in day out multiple times a week i mean it does get to that point doesn't it, it, it they do reach that breaking point where you think I, I i'm physically and mentally so drained that i can't actually do any more and it's uh it's an amazing place to be where real life drivers very likely wouldn't ever come close to that well, I think of it this way. He's raced every Saturday, at least every Saturday, um, for the last five weeks, considering the four rounds of Best of British and, of course, racing in the VCO World Cup 12 Hours of Bathurst that was um, between uh, rounds three and four of the championship. He, he's done his fair share of racing, even in that sense. And I've spoken about this time and time again with some drivers, and I've seen some drivers, Andre Mace has come in for his final stop, where they will race three or four times properly in a week. And I don't mean loading up a casual race and having a bit of fun. I mean, they've been actually racing in proper leagues three or four times in a single week. And for me, that's just a little bit too harsh. We see Ilko Bussing trying to make it stick around the outside of Olivier Kerton going through Riches. He's got to make it stick into the Montreal hairpin. And I don't think that one's going to work. He might be able to pick up the inside, though, uh, and try and chop back. But no way through and the Porsche is going to hang on. Uh, yeah, some drivers are raced three or four times a week. For me, and for a lot of drivers that I know, when it comes to applying yourself properly to something extreme, that is not ideal. You need to be focusing, because most sim racing works on a, on a bi-weekly schedule, so uh, you know, fortnightly, running yourself over uh, uh, on, on that kind of um, schedule. You kind of want to race twice or three times in a two-week period and properly focus yourself and apply yourself into those races. So I kind of respect that um, idea that he's like, look, I've, I'm pushing it a little bit too far. Something needs to be sacrificed here. And let's be real, it's not going to be the Thrustmaster 24 hours of Spa. I, I think it's a smart move. Prepare for the future. It's a, it's a very mature and a very, very well thought out move um, to, to look at yourself that much and say, look, I just don't have enough in the tank to, to keep this going on and then focus on your priorities. I mean, yeah, uh, like yourself, I mean, massive respect for that. That is that is like such a difficult position because, you, again, from the, the incidents that we see with uh, Yigor Ogonondikov, you can tell that it's, it's not a deliberate thing. He's not a dirty driver. He is a passionate and a competitive driver and he will fight to the absolute death to get every single position that he can so that's the type of guy he is he's obviously got his eyes on the prize and you know fair play we've seen what he can do wasn't to be here on best of british 
but um, it won't be the last time we see him in a championship winning position for sure here at the same grid but back to the race here at hand uh, Lewis, 15 minutes left to go it's been an exhibition run for George Boothby it's, it's looking like we're now just you know, signing the paperwork we're doing all the formalities here it's a case of everybody else taking part in the race as well as George Boothby Dying of eyes, crossing of T's as Lucas Kreuzer comes into the pit lane. Marcel Fusi and Daniel Kiefer, who's really marched up to that battle. Uh, Fusi had closed the gap down to his teammate of Kreuzer, but Kiefer's the one that's been trying to fire in some decent lap times. He was four tenths a lap faster on the previous lap than the car ahead that we are focused on of Marcel Fusi. Drive through penalty for Patrick Schwaber. That did not come from race control, i.e. there is only one thing that it could be. It is track limits is our assumption. Uh, so obviously just pushed it a little bit too far. And a few drivers I would expect would be in that kind of boat. Although this isn't typically a circuit we see it too much on. Uh, it's a circuit that's realistically a self-policing one. The, the curbs are, are high enough and the grass is close to any mistake you make well you're, you're paying a price for it anyway rather than a uh, a warning or a, a drive-through penalty so it just pushed a little bit too far potentially on the exit of a couple of a couple of corners and basically signed sealed and delivered a drive through penalty and the focus for this still remains fuzi ahead of the fast charging porsche behind certainly is and uh, three tenths of a second splitting up uh, daniel kiefer in the uh, the 97 porsche I, I'm really starting to worry if I'm Fuzzy right now because the Mercedes, I, I don't think, has the pace to do that, especially oh. when you go very deep into the corner like that and almost hands the place on a plate to Daniel Kiefer. It now makes the job very, very much easier for Kiefer and it's going to be a case of the run down to turn one and turn two now. How many times have we seen that mistake today? Just uh, carrying a little bit too much speed through Brundle and uh, maybe the ABS kicking in and just throwing you down the uh, down the escape or to, to the exit of the corner. Anyway, uh, Marcel Fuzzi into the pit lane then to uh, to serve his penultimate pit stop of the day. Chris Severe has been into the pit lane to serve his penultimate pit stop of the day. He's come out in fourth place. Uh, towards the front as we're riding on board with Christian Kelly, a driver that's completed all three of his stops with Olivier Kerton, who had an incident at Hamilton not too long ago. Uh, the driver directly ahead, not the best day for Olivier Kerton. Seemed to have some decent pace, obviously had that incident at Oggies with uh, Niels van der Kelt, and then the incident at Hamilton by himself. Uh, Christian Kelly's not had the greatest day either, um, has had some decent pace, but then a, a couple of issues and a couple of incidents and while he's back here in 17th trying to get by the Porsche. For sure, for sure. And what an awesome way to end the season. It's been a brilliant new championship here at the SimGrids. Uh, it's been fantastic to be part of it uh, with Best of British and really, really looking forward to seeing uh, some more championships like this. And it, on top of that as well, as uh, slightly distracted by Christian Kelly trying to uh, be an absolute nuisance to Olivier Curtin right now, but Curtin seems smooth, cool, calm and collected. We'll keep an eye on that one. But not only best of British, but how fantastic has uh, you know the Super Saturday been as a, a race format with the support races really bringing some you know a, a different names into the forefront into the limelight here with oh. split one and split two and christian kelly tries to fire up the inside at turn two never going to work and uh, it, what i love is compared to the likes of thomas moran early on through the race that was so civilized wasn't it it was like after you no oh oh no actually on you go i'll uh, i'll think better of that yeah that was all olivia Curtin who saw the uh, the McLaren of Christian Kelly. If you if you watch Curtin through that bit, if uh, you know, go back on YouTube and maybe look at a little bit of the replay of it and uh, just rewind a touch, you'll see as uh, Curtin had sort of committed to his point in the braking zone, kept his eye on the mirror uh, as Wolf Gruber has been off the road at the hairpin. Uh, yeah, saw that coming and basically turned out of it, just went to the left, just gave him all the room that he needed because he knew there was absolutely no way that Christian Kelly was making the apex of the corner, then just waited for him to overrun it, then turned in, 
got the position back again. Very, very mature and very aware uh, driving. Said Wolf Gruber, who has been for a bit of a, an incident. Uh, so he's dropped down now to 21st position behind Cameron Bridport. We're now focused uh, on uh, Ilko Bussink, who's behind Andre Mesa, who's not had the best day himself after showing some decent pace in the early stages. Now we're getting to a very interesting point because with lap times being nearly two minutes, the 146s, 147s, you're going to start to look at the final eight minutes and start seeing drivers coming into the pits because they need to make it happen now. They need to pull the trigger, get it out of the way and just uh, make it happen. Uh, we get a replay here. This is going to be the, uh, the number 15. And this is what happens at Hairpin. What? Takes a chunk of the apex there. And that was a bit strange, wasn't it? That rear suspension took an absolute hammering from the curb there. I, I'm almost speechless. I've played Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. And there's a bit where you can do the whole hopply, skippity, jumbly hydraulic in your car. Looks very much akin to that. Uh, not seen that before. And I'm pretty sure he would have been very much surprised in that car with a couple of swears as Andre Maester's gone wide at Hamilton and opened the door for Ilko Bussing to come through. Nice stuff from him. Very much taking advantage of the opportunity. And he has made it stick on the McLaren. Costly mistake from Andre Maester. Just pushing a little bit too hard with pressure applied behind. Final pit stops coming in then. Chris Severa has been in for his final stop. Comes out behind Marcel Fusi. And he'll be hoping that Fusi comes into the pit lane fairly sharpish. Because, well, he wants that one sorted. He wants that position. He wants to focus on what is ahead of him. Eight minutes and 40 seconds left to go in the race. Two pit stops for the top four to come in. And a couple of pit stops for those behind as well at the moment I would want to be getting my pit stops out the way ASAP all things considered yeah that's exactly what I was saying just uh, a couple of minutes ago just purely because you don't know what is uh, what is happening or what's going to be happening with the drivers all around you so a uh, good chunk of the drivers now having gotten all of their pit stops out of the way we've just got the top uh, top five cars still to do uh, pit stops Marcel Fusi the, the leading driver that's still to do one pit stop but he'll obviously lose that place too severe uh, so it looks like Sever is going to take that fifth position. But, I mean, what a race this has been. It's just been so unsure in terms of how this is going to end for the rest of the field, I have to add. Um, but again, with seven and a half minutes left to go, I think there might be some shenanigans about to happen. I think, I mean, look at Kiefer up into fourth place with two pit stops left to go. I wonder if uh, Naj is going to try and pull some hijinks out to, to secure that third position. He's going to try and set some decent lap times to keep Chris Severe at bay because he certainly needs to do so. Uh, whilst uh, the battle for the race winner, maybe even for the runner-up position, might be sorted, the rest of the positions are a wide open. Jordan Stones are on board with who had so much pace early on. It just hasn't really worked out for him. A couple of issues for him. Uh, uh, and alas, he's down now in 10th place and with a pit stop to go, he's going to be outside of the top 10, which would be a shame for him. Could get a fresh position though on Ilka Rantanen and nearly was close to making it stick down into Murray's. Now has run completely wide. Ilka Rantanen will come into the pit lane and Jordan Sones will stay out to try and set a decent lap time. Daniel Kiefer, or sorry, David Kiefer, there you go, getting them wrong way around. One last time in the season, might as well. Uh, David Kiefer comes into the pit lane as well. So Kiefer and Rantanen into that pit lane for their penultimate stop for Kiefer and final stop for Rantanen. Uh, also, it's final stop for both of them. Never mind, cancel that one. Uh, and yeah, the, the top four were holding steady until this time Sima Damori came into the pit lane. Now, one thing we mentioned after the, the, uh, the first pit stop was tyre degradation. Was it going to be an issue? And George Boothby actually uh, settling that argument, actually, because he's still doing very low 147s where we saw him creeping up at the end of his tyre life to the 148. So again, the second stint for these cars has not been as aggressive. It's not been as damaging. It's not been as uh, abrasive to the tyres as we saw on that, uh, that first start. So a lot of life left in these tyres, you've got to say, but five minutes left to go. It, especially for the likes of Daniel Kiefer, it's time now. You need to come in right now. Yeah, it's time to set your best in lap and fire it as fast as possible. But let's be honest, do not, under 
any circumstances, speed in the pit lane, not now. It has been a long race for these drivers. We've nearly completed two hours and 20 minutes of running here at Snetterton. Still five minutes left to go on the clock. And if you get a drive through penalty now, uh, just sign the race off. I'd almost, oh, F4, uh, the prospect of that one. Because uh, that would just be so cruel to have at this stage of the race. But we were reminded earlier in the broadcast uh, that George Boothby, the last time we raced here, uh, George Boothby being a part of it, racing at Snetterton, uh, well, he got a drive through penalty. And what was it for? Speeding in the pit lane. So he definitely doesn't want one. And he's leaving it to the point where if he gets it, uh, he's not leaving much time on the table to serve it, which is the real problem, because there's only five minutes left to go. So only, realistically, three laps. And there's a handful of drivers still have to complete two pit stops. You've got uh, George Boothby, Patrick Nash and uh, Daniel Kiefer all still to serve both their pit stops. So this is fascinating how this is uh, all going to pan out, given that a lap is nearly two minutes and we've got four minutes 20 left to go. And uh, just looking at uh, Boothby just now, he's going to be the, uh, the first one to potentially get into pit lane just now. In fact, Kiefer might jump in as well because he's just coming out of the final corner. Here we go then. Final stops coming in for the drivers. Demori's done back-to-back -back stops. Kiefer in. Boothby still with both of them to do. He's going to serve the first of his now. And the pit lane is about to be very, very busy. Daniel Kiefer on the right-hand lower side of your screen. Uh, into the pit lane, the top right of your screen being Chris Severa, and the central section is Lucas Kreutzer, who's trying to close down on uh, the drivers ahead. He's going to be into the pit lane now for his final stop, just to tick that one off. Does Kreutzer, as does Marcel Fusi, uh, said that Kreutzer was super, super consistent with a sixth, fifth, and a sixth. He's not going to be getting himself a top six today, all things considered, but still a decent points paying result. Severe, way, way wide. He's trying to get by. Uh, Daniel Kiefer directly ahead of him because every every lap every corner he has held behind he's already completed all of his stops Patrick Nage will be laughing his way to the bank for sure for sure and this is now crunch time because Boothby's already pitted as well Patrick Nage now has got clear air in front of him there is nobody within 15 to 20 seconds in front of Patrick Nash right now so he is loving this and the fact is that he is very likely now to get that jump done but there's George Boothby picture in picture 2 minutes 45 seconds left to go in this final round of best of British George Boothby putting on an absolutely exemplary drive he's been shown how it's done left right and centre so we keep our eyes open because we now only have four drivers left to pit is George Boothby Patrick Nash Daniel Kiefer and Jordan Sones and we have to say this again we said this numerous times what an amazing recovery drive from Jordan Sones to get himself potentially back up into the top 10 we'll see how that goes here's Patrick Nash for his final pit stop yeah, no surprise he's serving it now. There's just not very long left in the race. We'll be coming round to start the penultimate lap of the race, and it will start in what would normally be considered quite bizarre circumstances, as George Boothby will be into the pit lane this time by to serve his final stop on the penultimate lap of the race, as will Kiefer, as will Soames, the next time they go past the pit lane. And now is the time. It's been a, a great drive from from Sone, said it time and time uh, from from Sone, from Boothby, from Demori, from Nage as well. There's Nage. Where is Chris Severe in comparison? He's ahead. Chris Severe is ahead. Oh, as Bridport is way off the road, but Chris Severe has come out ahead of Patrick Nage, which means he's going to be on the podium. Which does mean that we're going to have 13 different podium sitters across the season. Pretty impressive. It is, and Boothby looking firmly to be champion. He comes back out still about 35 seconds, at least 40 seconds ahead of Simone de Mori in that second place. It's going to be Christopher taking the third place. He's out, coming down in towards turn two just now. This is going to be the last lap, and Lewis, what a thrilling race this has been. We couldn't have asked for any more. George Boothby has been the drive of a champion so far and he's made it look the part. 
Certainly has. The two side Max Motorworks drivers are pretty close as well as Marcel Fusi and Lucas Kreutzer battling it out for sixth position. Uh, Daniel Kiefer's jumped them both. Uh, he closed up to the back and was saying that his pace was looking pretty phenomenal. Jumped the pair of them and now runs in fifth place. Fantastic stuff. The McLaren that was running in fifth for most of the race drops down to seventh. Kiefer, amazing stuff. In a brilliant, brilliant drive, and it's certainly some bragging rights. We were joking about that early on with uh, David Kiefer, but uh, yeah, Daniel's done a brilliant job in that Porsche. But this is heart and mouth moment stuff for me time just now. If I'm George Boothby, I'm just taking my foot off the gas. I don't want any part of this whatsoever in front. Sheldon Muscat trying his best to uh, to fight off the uh, the Ferrari that's just in front of him. Like I say, I'm just concentrating on bringing it home right now. Stunning drive for George Boothby does mean there'll be a final lap for those drivers that are ahead as Sheldon Muscat who was sent packing down at turn two on lap one uh, recovers himself inside the top ten and it will be at least a guaranteed ninth place as things stand because the driver that we are focusing on now coming through Murray's for the final time has done three races this season and has taken a hundred percent of the race points for it 280 to his name and George Boothby is on top here at Snetterton as he was back at Donington as he was at Silverstone and with all of that he is set to become the inaugural series champion of the best of British championship here at the SimGrid. So, uh, Simon Demori, who's just coming around the final section of the circuit, now he's currently in second position, looks set for a, a very good drive to a runner-up position in the 602 Audi. All things considered, he has run under the radar and just out of the spotlight through most of the race, outside of the early sort of 20, 30 minutes, a fantastic drive from him. And let's just give a round of applause to Chris Sever to fend off Patrick Noj in a, 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 a tense tussle over basically the last two hours of the race i.e all of it it has been hard work for him and uh, daniel kiefer marcel fusi lucas kreuzer look to be rounding out the top seven where morant and muscat will be when it comes to the checkered flag i'm not so sure because muscat was pretty close to the ferrari and we know that morant has been very very aggressive as well I don't think he's going to be close enough to uh, to get past uh, Moran. Really did a great job in fending off Sheldon Muscat there for that position. But across the line comes Chris Sever. It's going to be fourth place for uh, Patrick Naj. Look, it, Naj is going to be absolutely furious with himself. That race was lost in the pit stops. It was lost on strategy. And Naj could have had that third place but uh, still a, a decent result I mean you're, you're never going to be unhappy at getting a fourth place finish here at the uh, the best of British but it's going to be across the line for Thomas Moran all so close for Sheldon Muscat can't get it done what a race and uh, Lewis I can't believe that's an entire season done Yep, wrapped up. Happened very, very quickly, of course. The five-round season happening over a very short period of time. We did three races back-to-back -back at the start of the season. Did a couple of a week break before we'd returned for the penultimate round of the season at Brands. And then we wrapped up the season here today. It's been a thrilling run through the five-round championship. And there is plenty more to come in the SimGrid. We'll try and grab uh, an interview from the drivers. We know that George Boothby will be uh, jumping in the Commodore. Oh, I say no. Well, I I'm sure he will because, let's be honest, we need to give him a very big round of applause. We do. And, uh, he's never been one to uh, to shy away from coming, having uh, a chat to us. But uh, it's it's been a season of ups and downs. And that's one of the fantastic things, Lewis, that uh, I, an inconsistent season uh, leads to, as we see the... Uh, the reminder of what was uh, Herbino's fateful start at T2 to hip check one of the cars round and cause absolute chaos. But yeah, look, that's what an inconsistent season adds for it. It means that we're left in the final race. We just don't have a clue. We came in tonight thinking Igor Ogorodnikov was strong favourite to, uh, to take the championship tonight. And George Boothby tells us otherwise. He does indeed. And do you know what it means? It means that it's time for us to interview him once again. And for the third time this season, George Boothby in the interview room as a race winner. What a drive. You were absolutely dominant today. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, yeah, that was a really, really good drive. Uh, I, I did like the, you know, the long strategy again, and it just, it just worked really well. It worked really well. I mean, I could get you know, the 50% points 
and then at the end just a few quick splashing dashes so yeah it worked out really well for me today literally an identical strategy to what you ran at uh, at donnington where you took uh, victory in that 2.4 hour race was it basically just copy and paste from from that day yeah pretty much just like the same sort of strategy uh, I, was, I was a little bit concerned that a few other people might copy what i did um so all the people around me at the start uh had a little bit more pace than me and i thought if they're going all the way past the halfway point this could be a bit of a struggle but a few people got caught up in incidents and then uh, a, a lot of them pitted quite early so after about the 40 minute mark i was like okay i can just not push as hard now and a uh, final question, obviously uh, you, you came out, you won three races, the only driver to be on the podium more than once, uh, a bit of a, a, a shout out to you in that sense. Um, you, as I say, came along, won three races, and at least provisionally as far as our ma mathematics are, and don't, don't quote us on this, uh, look to be the series champion. What's next? Uh, I don't know, anything really, whatever the next sort of sim grid championship is put up you know i'll, I'll probably be entering it so yeah I'm, I'm just really happy with this one because like i say I'm, unfortunately i had to miss a few rounds here um just through no like fault of my own just stuff came up but uh yeah i'm just i'm just so surprised that you know getting three wins was enough to take the championship so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really really happy definitely gonna have a beer or two after this <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did uh, incredible stuff and as I say, scored 100% of the race points as well because you scored both of the interval points at the 2.4 hour races that you could fantastic drive and hopefully we'll see you again in the future. Oh, oh, definitely, I'll be here again. Thank you so much guys. Cheers, thank you. Thank you to George Boothby, uh, at least all things provisionally, our series champion, three-time race winner in the Best of British Championship. Let's throw in Chris Severe, who got himself a podium today, a fantastic drive it was, uh, after starting fairly far down the order, 13th position on the grid at the start of the race, worked up to the podium in a thrilling fight with Patrick Nodge. How was that one for you? Oh, hi. Uh... Yeah, that was uh, that was really fun. I uh, I honestly did not expect to get the podium. I was like, I was in a mindset similar to uh, 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 last last week, where uh, at Brands Hatch, where uh, I was like, you know, I qualified really. I thought I was going to qualify much further down. Uh, I my initial thought was maybe I would just like like pit lap one, like I did the last couple times I qualified that low. And then just kind of try to stay out of traffic, drive my own race, and then kind of pop up at the front again. But that, that, <laughs> that lap one proved to, that was maybe not the best way to go because I was already in the top 10 by then and traffic was pre pretty clear. So I just, I don't know, I just got down, drove just lap by lap as fast as I could. And uh, it just the, the number, the, the position numbers just kept ticking down and down and down. When you were battling in the latter stages with uh, Patrick Nodge and you know the the last pit stops, you kind of went one way, he went the other uh, uh, towards that final pit stop. Did you know you were going to have him beat, or was it sort of just focus on your own drive and just see where you get at the end of it? Okay, so uh, my battle at the end, uh, I thought process was he was almost exactly the same pace as me. If he he was probably like maybe like a tenth, two tenths, some laps faster. So I, all I knew was that I had to stay, just, I don't know, stay ahead of him, and that was, he wouldn't really be able to make a pass efficiently. The reason I pit at like about the, I don't know, 14 minute mark is because is because he made a little bit of a mistake into, uh, what was it, turn two, three, turn four, five, turn five, kind of in the mid infield section there, and that put him like an extra like second behind me. So I thought that if I could get into the pits now, he wouldn't have the slipstream, and I would potentially uh, keep the spot when he came back out. So I was a little bit surprised when he was a whole like, you know, five seconds behind me after after his last pit stop. Well, I mean, a massive congrats. Fantastic drive to get a podium from that kind of position. Did really, really well today and great strategy as well. Thank you.
No worries. We've got one final interview uh, today. This one coming courtesy of Ilko Bussink, who, uh, whilst not had the greatest race, courtesy of the early uh, race incident, we'll focus on that one in just a second. Let's let's talk about the positives because that qualifying lap was fantastic to get up to the top end of the order. Thank you. Um, yeah, I didn't expect it at all. Uh, usually, I'm in somewhere between. Uh, uh, P20 and P30 but that qualifying was yeah it felt really great so yeah did the track seem to like favor the Audis or was that just all you oh no actually um, I tweaked the setup a bit um, and I feel felt really comfortable um, I don't know if it's Audi favorite um, I guess it is a bit but I don't think it's that bad I mean, it was a, a brilliant lap regardless, whether it's the best car or not. So uh, fantastic work in qualifying. We'll focus on the race. Obviously, there was that lap one incident. Uh, Herb now very aggressive down the inside, um, uh, uh, causing a crash at T2. How did you kind of view that one yourself? Yeah, um, I saw everybody bunch up already and I was quite cautious trying to just stay in line. Um, and I saw something in the mirror, but it was a bit too late. So yeah, I couldn't got out of it and I got hit. Uh, after that, it's just um, head down and keep on going. Well, I mean, I say fantastic qualifying. So uh, give yourself a pat on the back and hopefully it gives you confidence in future to repeat the results. Thank you. No worries. We'll grab a couple of interviews as well because we've just seen a couple jump into the booth. We've got uh, very quickly Seaman de Mori here, who obviously. Uh, for one, qualified really well on the front row of the grid. And then, whilst being involved in that early battle, after that point, you just flew under the radar, set in good laps, and grabbed yourself the runner-up spot in your first race of the season. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I had a, a little uh, spin in the first part of the race, but I think afterwards I settled really nicely and had a pretty good pace. And um, yeah, I could profit from the mistake of Andres and yeah, just did my laps and came home in P2 and I'm really happy about that. And congrats to George Booth as well. It was an amazing race by him, amazing pace and yeah, just couldn't give up with him. When it comes to uh, the, the race that you had there, I say, do you think you had the, the the pace to potentially keep up with Booth Beats? We did catch that instant through through Bombhole and then the, the spin across the inside of the grass. Do you think, though, without that mistake, you might have been able to keep it there? I think my best chance would have been to overtake Booth B in the beginning of the race as he was uh, holding up a bit uh, the first couple of laps. And yeah, then... I think when I had my spin, he already was pulling away from me and I uh, struggled quite a bit to keep up with him there. And yeah, I think, as I said, my only chance would have been straight in the beginning to overtake him. Do you think the spin across the, the, the grass there, do you think it knocked your confidence a little bit or were you quite quick to get back up to speed straight afterwards? Yeah, to be honest, in the laps after the spin, I was going a bit more careful through that uh, fast right-hander. And yeah, I think it knocked my confidence a bit, but um, not significantly. Either way, it was a fantastic drive and a very well-deserved uh, podium position. Congratulations to you. Thank you. No worries. Well, that wraps us up then for the season. And we'll head back to an interview with David Christie. Less so an interview, more so uh, a, a, a talk of the season. It was a great season, a, a fantastic one across the run. Five very individual races and a well-deserved provisional champion in George Boothby. It certainly was. And George Boothby, again, showing his class in Donington Park in Silverstone. We got those brief glimpses of him halfway through the season where everything was turned on its head. Early on, you know, we had five amazing rounds, Oaten Park, Donington, Silverstone, Brands Hatch, and tonight at Snetterton. But 
early early in the season it looked like it was Chris Jones-Emmis who had the, the great start taking the win at Ulton then it was George Boothby taking back to back wins at Donington and Silverstone and then when he dropped out at Brands Hatch we were left scratching our head thinking well hang on what's going to happen here because everything's up in the air and then it was uh, Herbin Newell that took the win at the, uh, the last, round out, last round out at Brands Hatch but Boothby came in tonight to show exactly who's the boss right now uh, a well deserved win but if I'm honest it, it was a fantastic performance from everyone throughout the park um, they left us with plenty to watch plenty to talk about throughout the season and looking forward to the next time we see them out on track and I won't have to wait long. Of course, massive thanks to our sponsors, Coach Dave Academy and Thrustmaster. We couldn't be doing much without them, their support throughout all of the seasons. And of course, to Mike Yao, uh, who is running the broadcast, Michael Hamlet, who's been in our ear, giving us so much data across the season. And here at the Sim Grid, racing is not done. There is so much coming up over the next few weeks. Sprint Cup Season 3, back in, uh, in a week's time, March 25th, that one returns. Uh, more female races by Thrustmaster Rockets, Endurance Cup Season 3, plenty more. And of course, please do not forget the SimGrid VCO World Cup. We'll be back in four weeks' time for the Thrustmaster 24 Hours of Spa. I've been Lewis McLeod. David Christie's been alongside me all day long. Thank you all for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye.